Greetings, ladies and mendigents, and welcome to the science fiction audiobook version of the fourth wave taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 21, written by Sebi Loki. When I came to, I was back in my cabin lying on an enormous bed. I was sweaty, and my body was in the deep ache that comes from an extensive exertion. Not unpleasant, but I felt spent. I reached over and touched the spot on the wall next to the bed and brought up the lights. There was a moan of protest next to me. Turn the lights off, baby, had the moan steeply. I'm still recovering. I looked in her direction and felt my eyes trying to jump from their sockets. Her bare shoulders and arm lay exposed above the blanket. Sweat glistened across her flushed skin. Her face was partially obscured in her trousled hair. Still, I could see her lips. She was still smiling. This has got to be a dream, I muttered under my breath. Yeah, a new voice spoke up from the other side of Heather. Kill the light. Some of us are trying to get our other footy winks. I looked past her to see Lee bare-chested and yawning. This had better be a dream, I said. The blanket squirmed near my feet, and I looked in the direction and saw Valson's head sticking out from the far end. She yawned and stretched her arms steeply. I'm still fatigued, she said. My oral cavity is yet to recover. Please let this be a dream, I was shouting now. Lee! A familiar voice called from somewhere deep in the forest of silken veils that compartmentalized my room. Could you come here and help me out? The lube is just making the sheep all slippery, and I can't get the gimp mask on. Coming, Mrs. Reese, Lee answered as he tossed the covers off with the yawn. My mother was on the ship. Please, I said, let this be a dream. When I forget, when I wake up, make it stop. Please make it stop. Ma was the response I got from the other side of the veils. Captain, Dyer's voice sounded. I had finished manufacturing the object you requested, and the dimensions specified. However, for medical reasons, I must recommend once more that you have the spikes should face the other direction before you attempt such a thing. Heather poked up. It's here, she asked. That's great, the professor should be back with the ropes in a moment. Dear, can we tie you down then? I inhaled deeply and prepared for another shout. Relax, it's a dream. No name was back. I tried to force myself to relax, but the pitiful bleats in the sheep made it difficult. What's going on? I asked. Short version, you've blown a fuse or two. The euphoria cocktail that Dias supplied you hadn't quite left your system when your armor malfunctioned and hit you with a berserker drug. Well, at least it was a berserker drug about 20,000 years ago. Probably gonna be a bit off since then. Anyways, between the two of them, your eggs are scrambled inside the shell. Is it permanent? Depends, I guess. I guess that you just have to ride it out for now. Can you hurry it up? Jack asked as he entered the room. She changed from her normal ship whites into a tightly fitting micro bikini that left very little to the imagination. Of course, on her that just seemed to emphasize her prepubescent androgynous physique. I just swallowed a whole box of laxatives, and if we don't start soon, then the Sanchez will show up too soon, she explained. Handcuffs or noose, Lee called out from where the sheep had been bleating in panic. Both, the professor said, but not the candle this time. I've still got first degree burns on my ass. Can we make this stop? I asked desperately. Um, not sure. Your brain is sort of free-weeding at the moment, just grabbing random bits of stuff and trying to make sense of it. Then why is everything coming up with the depraved? I asked. Sure you want the answer to that? We can bring up your browsing history, if you like. Forget it. Just, uh, make it stop. Drop me back in the middle of the battlefield or the empty void. Any place is better than this. The room flickered, and I was now in a dungeon, complete with damp walls and iron chains binding my arms and legs to the wall. A bare-chested man wearing an executioner's hood stood nearby, pushing iron rods into the fire pit. On the other side of the fire pit was a man who looked like he was going to a costume party for Cardinal Richelieu. If the heathens does not repent, the cardinal sneered at the dungeon keeper, flay his flesh from his bones. I sighed in relief. Thanks, I said. This is much better. 
Hopefully the drugs will wear off a bit better with control of the situation. So, I said, drawing out the word, you're back. When I tried to talk to you earlier, you weren't there, but now you're back. There's more to it than getting wasted, the voice chided. If that's all it took, then the Berkeley in the 60s would have been scholars. Okay, bad example. So what more does it take, I asked. Instead of the mystery voice answering me, the dungeon keeper stepped forward with an iron rod held between him and a pair of metal tongs. The tip glowed white hot. Do you repent, heathen? He hobbled man asked. Absolutely, I said cheerfully. I am happy to renounce anything that you tell me to. And the cardinal asked, his voice clearly cracking from the strange, You accept ours as a true path of salvation? Yes, indeedy, I said with a smile. Fine, the dungeon keeper breathed. Then shall I sign you up for the initial purchase of 10,000 units? Beg your pardon, I asked. Standard startup, he assured me. Remember the profits really only come from when you network. Your commission for everyone you bring in adds up. Excuse me, I said, licking my suddenly dry lips. Are you telling me that this is an Amway dungeon? The cardinal sneered, widened. The heretic still refuses to renounce his faith, he said as he nodded to the dungeon keeper. The hairy man nodded and brought down the white hot closer to my face. No, 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 I said quickly. I like bangles and the ready to walk like an Egyptian. Pyramids are all the way for me. Multi-level marketing. Right, I said. The great multi-level marketing of Giza is my favorite wonder of the world. Silence him, the cardinal snapped. I closed my eyes and felt the heat grow closer to my face. The sizzle of burning flesh took its place. I opened my eyes warily. I was sitting on a beach. The sky was crimson and the swollen, ruddy sun burning bright overhead. Near the shoreline I saw a giant crab chasing a butterfly-looking creature. I know this place, I said. It's from a book. H.G. Wells, the time machine, the voice replied. Everyone else focuses on the Morlocks and the Loy. You always like the versions of the distant future. How did you know that? I asked. I never told anyone about that. Well, um, that's kind of complicated. You say that about everything, I protested. Give me a hint, will you? Something to uncomplicate things a bit. And, yeah, I guess that's allowed. Turn around and say hi. Feeling a bit like one of those three stooges a moment before the pie in the face, I turned around slowly and found a man standing there, slightly above average height, shaggy hair, five o'clock shadow. Yeah, he was familiar, all right. Should have guessed, I said with a snort as I looked to clear a space and sit down. The only person who could be that frustrating and annoying is me. My doppelganger smiled down at me and plopped down in the sand before me. It's more correct to say that I'm a part of you. He, it, I explained. I am the part of you that has already figured some of this stuff out. Care to share it with me? I asked. He shook his head. Doesn't work that way. I can't just hand the information over. You have to draw it out and into your own awareness. I rolled my eyes. Why am I not surprised? I asked. He shrugged. If you had been, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that part now, would I? I grimaced, but I didn't say anything. Fine, I said. So let's start at the beginning. It takes more to talk to you than getting blitzed. Fine. What does it take? He just eyed me. I wasn't close enough for him to fill the gaps. I still had to work with it. Okay, I said. What do these dream walks all have in common other than the drugs and desperation? He grinned and I smacked my forehead. I was terrified both times, I said, trying to get away from something inside my own head. Exactly, he said. You sought refuge in your own desperation and pounded on the doors to a random that is normally sealed off. You slammed into it over and over again until, finally, the lock gave away just a crack, enough to wedge a toe into the gap, but nothing more. Nice metaphor, I allowed. Thanks, Mr. Hinckley should never have given us a D in English test. Mr. Hinckley was my ninth grade English teacher. That was reaching back a bit. Does my subconscious hold grudges or something? Whoa, he said, raising a hand. Back up. I am not your subconscious. I didn't say you were, I... Oh, okay, so you're in my head with me so you can read my mind. I forgot. Fine. You're not my subconscious. What are you? Again, he shrugged. Humans aren't exactly all there, he explained. I snorted a laugh. 
Well, yes, he went on, we're a little nutty as a species, but that's not what I mean. Think about it. Psionic warriors kill non-Psy enemies, right? Now he nodded in agreement. Why was he pointing out the obvious? Unless, that is, he was trying to draw my attention to something I noticed earlier but had ignored. I thought about it for a moment, and it hit me. If we were becoming telepathic, I said, then why does slapping our telepathic lobe and backwards grant us shielding? He nodded. It was an innate ability that we already developed before the Chimera arrived, he said. You noticed it, but were too busy with other things to dwell on it. Come on, think back to when Volson was showing you the diagrams of the lobes. Why would different species all develop the same brain structure? I asked myself. That's been bothering me. Its brains differ from planet to planet. Why is that one structure always the same? Perfect, he said. You were paying attention. So what does it mean? I thought about it for a moment. They aren't natural, I concluded. Someone is making them telepathic. Not just telepathic, but telepathic in exactly the same way. Yes, he said. You invent a radio once and you don't invent it over and over again. But why only certain species? Why do it that way? Can't help you then. You haven't figured that part out yet. I'm just as lost as you. But you think you know who's doing it, I counted, because I think I do too. The abjectors again. Yeah, half a point there, he supplied. You've been wondering about the abjectors for a while and thinking about why they get involved with lesser beings. Why are they so concerned about the rules of engagement? Unless... Unless somehow it infects them, I said. That's what you meant by proxy wars and game pieces. The abjectors aren't abjectors for us. They're referees between a war between someone else, some factions within their own race. You think so, yes, he agreed. You also think that the abjectors race has been involved in things from the very beginning. They made some races telepathic, and others they allowed to communicate with a symbiote. They seem to be very interested in providing a wide, open, and level playing field. Also, since very little has changed across the galaxy in the past few million years, you think that means that there's a stalemate between the sides? I snapped my fingers. The Chimera, I said. They're one side trying to break the stalemate, which means the conflux stopping them is just... The other side trying to preserve the status quo, he agreed, as he yanked off his tennis shoes and wormed his toes into the hot sand. Can't prove any of it yet, but it seems like there is a strong majority that wants to keep things as it is in the smaller groups of dissidents who want to shake things up a bit. Which side is the good one? I asked. Either, he admitted with a shrug. This is not a fight between good and evil. This is a fight between giants who both want to squash us, but they are too busy fighting each other to bother with something as insignificant as humans. I sighed. So we're back to being insignificant, I muttered. They think so, he agreed. They're wrong, though. Humans are a very big part of the play in this. How so? I asked. He grew silent. I was back to guessing the fool in the blanks. I groaned. Fine, I said. Humans evolved, we grew, we changed. Why? Those blackout areas, I asked. The quarantine. We were left alone. I don't know. Yes, yes, and no. You don't know. Think. I was really going to dislike him, or me, or whatever. I concentrated. Chimera, I said at last. Their technology is stolen. You think this, or know it? A bit of both, I said. The way their technical manuals read is like one any bit of technology is viewed as a religious relic. The instructions are more like rituals than guidelines. It feels like they were handed to these great tools, told how they worked, but never even understood them. They're a cargo cult. A cargo cult that worships what? The super sentience, I said and frowned, but their description of them is all over the map contradictory in places, then they think they need to rebuild them to bring them back to the reason why is not really defined. It makes me think that the game of telephone, where one person whispers something to the next, and they whisper it to the next, until at the end you have gibberish. Lost in translation, he agreed. So the abjectors, or, um, a faction of them, gave the Chimera technology on purpose. But why this nonsense about the super sentience? Because it's not nonsense, he said, just a bad translation. The abjectors told the Chimera about them, but something along the line, they've lost sight of the original mission. 
I looked over my shoulder at the ocean. The water was oddly flat and still. The sun loomed in the same place as if it would for a longer spun. As I stared at where the blood red sea met the sky, I thought I saw a blurred shape. What in the... I asked. We're all waking up, he warned. We need to finish this quickly. I looked up. Finish what? Humans are different, he said. It's more than we got cut off. Think about what the Chimera believe. They keep coming back to Earth over and over again. When they invade, they go straight to Earth, and whenever something happens, they go away. You mean the invasions aren't invasions at all, I asked. They're actually coming back for Earth. Exactly. They're checking on it because it's important to them. The super sentience, I asked. You think so? You think that's why humans are strange? Why we can fend off psychic attacks? We're different. Different how? I asked and shot another glance over my shoulder. The blur was growing. It now swallowed a quarter of the horizon. I think, you think, that there was something about this world that the super sentients left behind. Like a relic? I asked. Like a trap, he clarified. Humans weren't given psychic powers, we evolved them. That's not the way it goes. That's why the abjugators or the faction, someone had them try to switch it off. But that didn't work. What? I asked, shooting a doppelganger in the eye. Something went wrong, he went on. Maybe the trap was sprung too early. Maybe when they flipped the lobe of the brain and left us alone to evolve for a few thousand more years, we figured something else out. You haven't figured it out yet, but you have to. Why? I asked. From the corner of my eye, the beach was fading into a uniform white color. It was bland and yet somehow familiar. I suddenly realized my heart was thudding in my chest and I couldn't breathe. The whiteness flowed around me and ate away at the dream world, leaving my double alone in a tiny oasis of beach and ruddy sky. You have to find out what they did, he said. They're afraid of them. Even after all these years, they're still afraid of them. That fear. We can use it. Use it for what? I asked. Both sides are going to want to wipe us out when they realize what humans are. Both sides. The Chimera and the Conflux. Stop thinking small. Look, you're almost awake. Find out why the abjugators killed them and started the war. Killed who? I asked. The Super Sentients, the predecessors of all life. Aren't you paying attention? You have to. The voice cut out as the white expansion swelled up and swallowed him. I blinked my eyes and realized that the reason it looked familiar was there was a corridor in the battle moon. Strangely, I was upright and running down the hallway as if demons were on my tail. I slowed down and tried to catch my breath. Where was I? My helmet was down. I tried to get open, but it refused. Broken. Now I saw a warning light flashing. And oh, atmosphere outside. I wandered out of the human decks and was going through the ones that I'd left without atmosphere. I tried to communicate. Hello? I asked. My voice sounded rough. My throat was raw if I had been screaming. Jason! Someone yelled. Jack's voice, I thought. I'm here. Where is here? I asked. Um, looks like you're, um, three decks away from the refugee level. I thought that was on the other side of the far ship. I shouted. I regretted doing this that instant, but I shouted anyway. You've been running non-stop for three days, she said. Three days? How? Why? What? You had better find a lift and come back, she said. I'll warn Volson to stand down. I think she was standing by the door with a chair, hoping to clobber you when you came in the last I spoke to her. Clobber me? I asked. What's going on? She was quiet. You probably want to come back here so I can explain to you in person, she said. Explain what? I asked. Where is the others? The professor is fine, Jack said. She is just resting. We've been manning the common ships trying to talk to you. Talk to me. What are you... Wait. What about Heather and Lee? Where are they? Surgery, Jack admitted at last. With Silthus, you better get back here fast. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 22. Written by Semi Loki. I tried moving towards the closest lift, and I couldn't do it. My legs refused to move. I wasn't paralyzed or anything like that. I just didn't have any energy. I could feel my muscles quaking with the effort of holding me upright. I was moments away from passing out. A borrowed memory flashed through my mind. 
The armor was powered. Commands to the armor were sent by a mental link-up using inductive sensors built into the helmet. Think about the right patterns and the suit answered. I quickly sent the instructions for the armor's motors to take over, keeping me upright. The armor stiffened and I collapsed into it. Adrenaline was bleeding out of my body and pain was setting in. I was in agony and I wanted to sleep at the same time. I sent the instructions for the armor to march towards the closest lift. Using the armor to lift my dead arm and summon the lift was interesting. It was a bit like operating a claw machine to get a toy when your arm is asleep. I didn't even really need to touch anything. Just wave my arm in the right spot for the generic sensor to pick up that I was actually summoning a lift and not just loitering or something. I still managed to overshoot the spot twice before I got enough fine control to bring the lift. Only after the lift arrived did the obvious go to me. Dyer, I murmured. That was about as loud as I could force myself at the moment. Yes, Captain. Take me to surgery. Where is Science Officer Madakai and Security Officer Jack? Surgery. Understood, the ship replied. I fell asleep standing up in the armor, except that it didn't feel that at all. It felt like I blinked my eyes and they would just wouldn't open for a moment. Then got stuck when I forced them back open and I was still in pain and still tired, but now the lift doors were open and I was near the surgery. Based upon past experience, the trip ordinarily took ten minutes or so. I forced the armor to march me out. I navigated down the hallways in a clumsy fashion. My eyes would go fuzzy every now and again as I almost drifted off to sleep. I tried to will myself to stay awake, but that was like slapping a duct tape after the dam had already broken. I wouldn't be awake much longer, no matter what. With luck, I would be able to at least make it to surgery and meet up with the rest of the crew. Jack must have heard me thumping my way down the hall because she poked her head out of the surgery and recoiled when she spotted I was still in the armor. It's okay, I called out. I think it's under control. She frowned but didn't challenge me at that point. She simply stepped back into the surgery and waited. The professor was standing next to the trio of medical pods. Indicator lights in them stated that they were occupied by this warning signal. I wanted to ask what it was meant, but it seemed the prof had anticipated this. The warning, she said quickly, is because Dyer is refusing to heal any of them. They are alive and stabilized for the moment, but until you give the override, the ship is refusing to patch them up. What? I asked. What happened? Who's in there? Now I realized that the last question was a stupid one. At that moment, thinking was hard. What do you remember? Jack asked from behind me. I tried to crane my neck to look at her, but my muscles refused to work. I made the armor position so that I could look at both of them without moving my head. Putting on the armor, and then the alarm went off, I admitted. I felt something touch the back of my neck, and then the things went blank. The two women looked at each other and then back at me. So you don't remember what you did to Sulthus or Lee? The professor asked, all throwing Heather across the room. I did what? I shouted, a bit of life returning to my body as I stiffened. I regretted it immediately and did not so much relax as ooze back into my rigid armor. When Sulthus appeared, the prof said slowly, as if talking to a child. He sprinted towards him and almost decapitated him by yanking his head in one direction and his body in another. He grabbed your arm to stop you and you punched him into the wall. You collapsed his ribs and punctured both his lungs. Heather ran to help him and you threw her across the room. Then... You took off running. I just gaped at her. We took all of them to the surgery, Jack said, picking up the story. Lee and Sulthus first, as they had more badly hurt. Heather only had a broken spine. She couldn't walk, but she was still alive. Sulthus and Lee were both dead. We got them into the pods and the ship refused to treat them. Since the captain attacked Sulthus, a prisoner, then he was classified as an enemy. Since Lee tried to assist the enemy, he was classified as a, um... Traitor. I just gaped again. The ship is refusing to heal Heather for the same reason. The professor continued. We've convinced this ship to stabilize them because you might want to interrogate them, but we can't. Her voice trailed off. Dyer! I shouted. Yes, Captain, the ship replied. The armor malfunctioned, I began. Affirmative, the ship replied. I blinked in surprise. You knew that it malfunctioned, I asked. 
Unit was logged in as defective and scheduled for repairs when the ship was placed in lockdown status. Repairs never took place. Of all the rotten luck. Wait. The armor malfunctioned, I repeated. That means my mental state was compromised. The ship remained silent. While I was in such a state, I went on, would that not mean that I would be temporarily relieved of command until I was able to command effectively once more? Yes, Captain, the ship replied. And who would the command go to in such instances? The first officer, the ship agreed. Traitor status revoked for both first officer and Lee and navigation officer Heather. Status has been expunged from the log and with the notation of the need to relieve captain of command. Furthermore, captain's resuming command of the vessel noted as taking places of current, healing commencing of officials' medical pods. And, I say quickly, my attack on the prisoner was not necessary. The prisoner is not an enemy. Status updated and healing resumed. Scaddy. Captain is relieved to command once more. Health is impaired. Command is now with Science Officer Madakai. What? I asked. This medical scan has indicated the captain has an impaired state. The fourth medical pod opened. I learned something important then. Dyer was able to seize control of the armor whenever he saw fit. I was forced marched to the pod and the armor started opening up around me. I would have fallen face first then, unable to even brace myself for impact. But the glowing force field intercepted me. I stopped falling moments before my face struck the side of the pod and I was lifted up and dropped inside. Which is when the buzz saw I popped open and began slicing away my clothing. I gurgled a yelp of surprise as the souls wandered about too closely to the area that, at least in my opinion, sharp objects have no business being near. Then the lid closed and finally I went to sleep. I don't remember waking up, not exactly. I just suddenly became aware of the fact that I was in the medical pod and the lid was open. I was staring through the opening at the ceiling beyond. I felt like I had been doing this for a while. Had I been awake when the pod opened or had I just opened my eyes and it had been like this? I didn't know. I tried to sit upright was pleasantly surprised to see that my muscles responded appropriately. Command transferred from First Officer Lee to Captain Jason Reese, Dyer said. Lee's awake, I said, my voice rough. I hope so, Lee answered, or else this is one ugly dream. I looked over to see him leaning against the medical pod with his arms folded across his chest. He looked intimidating. Um, if you're going to punch me, can you go ahead and do it now so that I don't have to climb back out of this thing? I'm not going to hit you, he said calmly. I can't make the same promise for Heather. I shrugged. If she does, it's not like I haven't given a long list of reasons, I said. This is just the latest. He nodded but didn't volunteer any other information. I looked down to the side of the pod. Fresh clothes lay on the floor and neatly folded. I looked up at Lee. Been here long? I asked. He shrugged. I was walking by and saw the lid was open. I saw you laying there like death warmed over. Though we might have to chat when we're up and around. A chat? Well, given the choices, I think that I'd rather go with a punch to the face. Dyer could patch me up with that. I reached over and lifted up the clothes. Do you mind? I asked as I held out the clothes for inspection. He shrugged and pushed off the pod. He walked around to the other side of it and leaned against the other side with his back towards me. How long was I out? I asked. A day and a half, he answered. The ship said your glucose levels were extremely low. I think you burned through your reserves. It fed you a bunch of nutrients and repaired some minor damage to your joints and muscles. Otherwise, you've been sleeping. The ship can't do anything about that, really. I nodded, and then he couldn't see it, and I tugged on my pants. And how long have you been out? I asked. About seven hours. How do you feel now? My shirt was on. I had debated putting on shoes at first. If I did have to start running, it was easier to do so shirtless and shoeless. But Lee still seemed calm for a moment, so I put that on the last. Like it never happened, he admitted. The ship does a remarkable job of eating. Physical things, anyway. I felt a butt coming on. He turned around without invitation and saw me chugging on my shoes. The stuff in your head, he continued. That stuff takes a bit more, doesn't it? I yanked on my shoes and stood up. Look, I said as I approached him, my arms held wide. 
I'm sorry, I'm still willing to give you a free shot if you feel... This ain't part of where you talk, he interrupted. This is the part where you shut up and listen. I slapped my jaws together and waited. He stared at me for a moment as if testing to see if I had my attention, and then he ran a hand through his hair. If you think you need to apologize for the assault, he said at last, don't. If you think that's the first time someone's kicked my rear, then you don't know anything about life on the street. That wasn't, I began. What did I say about shutting up and listening? He asked. I took the hint. He sighed. Yeah, he said at last. You were strung out on some drug and having a bad trip. Jack told me. Hate to tell you this, but it ain't the first time I've heard that one before. Maybe not, but I bet this particular concoction was a new one. I remained quiet, though. You had a bad trip, he repeated. You weren't in your right mind. Sometimes college kids get a few beers in them and decide to kick some homeless mad around. See if you like sleeping on the sidewalk with a few cracked ribs. When they get caught, and that don't happen often, they weren't in their right mind either. It was a bad light swinging at the tire iron, your honor, not me. You hear what I'm saying? I nodded silently, and he grimaced. I don't care if you're Bruce Lee, he said. Eight guys come down on you swinging. You drop. It's not a matter of if, just when. I broke eye contact at first. I've never done anything like that, I muttered. I didn't say you did, he agreed. Just trying to show you where I'm coming from. I didn't look up. I didn't want to meet the gaze right then. You've had a middle-class jerk's curb stomp you before, I said. It doesn't make me feel better to know that I'm in such company. This ain't about beating, he said. This is about you forgetting your place and looking down on us. Now I looked up at him. I've not been looking down on you, I sweated. That's not even... You had a bad trip, he interrupted. Some alien juice lit a fire in your brain, right? You didn't even know that you were doing it, right? I studied the question. It seemed to get me off the hook a little, even. He dangled the question out there like bait. I was suspicious, but I took it anyway. Yes? I asked hesitantly. He nodded. Armor malfunctioned, right? He asked. I nodded this time. Think my ribs might have survived that sucker punch if the rest of us had been wiring armor too. Damn it, I knew it was a trap. I broke eye contact again and studied the floor a little more. Man, that was a nice looking floor. I didn't, I stammered out. I didn't what? Didn't want them to get hurt. That's a laugh. Didn't know that I would do that. So we're trusting chimeras now. Didn't think. Hey, we have a winner. Didn't handle that right, I admitted. I should have had all of us outfitted. And, he promoted. I looked up at him and he rolled his eyes. You should have asked the ship which ones were good ones, he pointed out. The ship doesn't seem to like to volunteer information. I nodded in agreement. This was the longest conversation I'd ever had with Lee. I'd grown used to the fact that he was the quiet type. For him, this was practically a speech. I held up my hand. I'll ask for more input from all of you, I swore. I will discuss plans more. I will not try to take so much on myself, and I'll ask the bloody ship if the smart move before acting. Better? He shrugged and stood up straighter. Then you might as well join us in the cafeteria, he said. We're making final preparations. Final preparations for what? I asked. He walked past me and entered the hallway. I fell in step behind him. He was quiet for a long than I thought that he didn't hear me. More likely he decided that it wasn't worth answering. I was neither, apparently. We finally thought to ask the ship if it could talk to the Dyson thingy, he explained. Guess what? It could. Said hello and explained who it was and who we are. A few hundred cannons were trained on us and we would have blown your way had you gone your original plan and were told to stand down. Nice, huh? I decided it was still time to shut up and listen. So the rest of us figured that this ship is pretty good at flying itself and taking care of itself. So good, in fact, that we don't see any advantage there isn't leaving anyone here on the ship when we go. Go where? I asked. I thought I made that clear, he said as we turned the last corner. We got permission to land. We're all going. I opened my mouth to question the wisdom of this, but that's when I realized how precisely Lee had timed things. I was still inhaling the voice of my ejections when I stepped into the cafeteria and found myself facing three armed figures turning to face me with their guns held at attention. Hello, Jason, one of the helmeted figures said with Heather's amplified voice. Ready? 
for round two. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 23, written by Sebi Loki. I pushed past Lee in the cafeteria, having Lee sandbagged me with guilt trip just after I woke up was low. Okay, maybe I deserved it. A little bit. But this, this was trying to strong arm me into a risky move when I was still vulnerable. Unfortunately for this crowd, I was an office worker. If they thought that I would roll over for a dumb decision just because I was too tired to argue, they didn't realize who they were dealing with. I walked out into the middle of the group and made sure all eyes were on me before speaking. Daya, I said aloud, when you asked for permission to board, was it living person who responded or some automated system? The response was automated. The ship confirmed. Oh good, I said dryly. Do we know if there are any active personnel on that thing? Unable to determine, Captain. I see, I said, nodding, and the automatic defenses had been turned off. That's night. Are there any inside? Unknown, Captain, the ship replied. The facility is classified. Outstanding, I said. How about the armor everyone is wearing? Has it been checked for defects? Affirmative, sir, the ship replied. How thoroughly, I asked. Level 1 pre-check, the ship answered. How many levels are there? I persisted. Five, Captain, the ship went on. The most thorough inspection would take half a day to perform. Up until now, Lee's face had looked slightly smug. I suppose he had asked many of these questions. His face still now had lost some of its color. I caught his eyes darting first to Jack and then the Professor, both of them wearing a full battle suit. Spectacular, I said, so it is possible that these suits will malfunction as well. Affirmative, the ship replied. Probability of malfunction is 5% of the armor unit worn by science officer. Probability of malfunction is 8% for armor unit worn by security officer. Probability of malfunction is at 13% for navigation officer. Hands flew towards fasteners on the armor. I ignored them and continued my interrogation of the ship. Is the facility occupied by anyone other than staff? I asked. Unknown, Captain. Air quality, unknown, Captain. Okay, I said at last, let's make this easier. If the site is abandoned and there are automated defenses, can I get in there safely? Unknown, Captain. And the rest of the crew? Negative, Captain. Lee's eyes bulged. Why do you say they cannot get in safely? I asked. At the time of appointment of acting captain, Jason Reese's nanite swarm deployed affix to his person. This ship answered, the nanites are used for identification purposes and establishing security protocols. And the rest of the crew? I asked. Security nanites were not requested by the captain. The ship answered blandly. Lee wouldn't meet my gaze. All right, people, I said at last. I realize I suck as a captain and that stupidity got us in a mess, but damn it. That doesn't mean that we should expect stupidity to get us out of this mess. The response Lee, I said while looking at him directly, if you still were in the military, what would you do in this situation? He didn't answer. Lee, I prompted. Gather reconnaissance, he admitted. Send a smaller scouting party and... Damn it, Jason. So you wouldn't deploy everyone all at once? No, he said in his side. Guess we both got a little excited, huh? I shrugged. None of us know what we're doing, and we're making it up as we go along, I replied. We're all being idiots here. Um, Heather spoke up. As long as we're admitting to being idiots, can I ask why our job is to even look at this thing? Isn't there someone else we can, like, call or something, who might have a better idea of what we're doing? A few guilty looks all around. Well, not everyone. The professor looked thoughtful. And when they asked how we got stumbled across this, the professor asked, looking directly at me. I'm certain they didn't get any special coordinates when Dyer implanted memories in me. Four sets of eyes were now looking at me questioningly. Uh-oh. With the little respect I had managed to salvage was now the serious jeopardy. All my talk about trying to be smart about this for a change, and I was going to have to try and convince this group to take advice from someone who hears voices. What could I do? I didn't know what I should do, but I just knew what I had to do. Okay, I said. Everyone put their armor back and meet me back here in five minutes. We need to talk, and I don't want any of you armed when we do it. 
Whoever said confession is good for the soul never tried confessing to hearing voices in a room full of irritated people a thousand light years away from the only planet they'd ever known. With every word I babbled, I felt myself grow smaller and smaller, and the grazes felt heavier and heavier. They never asked questions, none of them, they just waited for me to finish. So I told them everything, about the abjugators, their threat to delete the system, my alternative personality, and his explanation of why the abjugators used the symbiotes. I talked about the super sentience, and how the factions of what would become the abjugators fit into it. I told them about my fear of going crazy. I told them everything. I didn't just spill the beans, I ran down the bean aisle of the supermarket with a can opener and a complete lack of inhibitions. If I was there much longer, I'd be confessing to the Lindenburg kidnapping. So finally, I shut up while there was a chance that they might still stick me in a room with rubber wallpaper, rather than booting me out the nearest airlock, just in case what I had was contagious. The professor broke the silence by looking at Lee and nodding. It fits, she said at last. What does, I ask? If his symbiote was still partially receiving messages, Heather asked, completely ignoring me, how do we know the alternative personality managed to switch it off? They could still be listening in for all we know. I doubt it, the professor said thoroughly. If they had to wait until they entered the hibernation before they got a clear signal, then I would guess that when he's awake it is probably much too difficult for them. Still, I suppose we can ask Dyer to scan his brain as well as our own and see if the symbiote has mapped out any different pathways. Um, excuse me, I stammered. Aren't we skipping over the part where our people call me crazy? Even if it was telling the truth about that, Jack declared, I don't think we can trust this other Jason either. How are we to know if this is really part of his mind? Maybe the abjugators left something behind to trick him into thinking that. Then why send us here, the professor countered. I don't know, Jack said, crossing her arms over her chest. That's what bothers me. If they want us here, do we really want to be here? If they didn't send us here, who did? Um, guys, I said, crazy captain here. Are we going to do something about me? Heather looked over in my direction and gave me a sour look. If you aren't going to add something meaningful to the conversation, she said, then shut up and stop distracting us. We've got bigger problems than your need for the sanity check. I blinked my eyes. Nope. None of them had grown antlers. I was really seeming this. You believe me? I asked. The professor looked at me and frowned. Well, she said slowly, we knew you were getting information and we weren't from somewhere. Every time you woke up from something, it's like you're a different person. Look, Jason, you're not a dummy, but no one is that quick. You picked up on things way too fast and never gave us a satisfactory answer as to where you were getting this from. We knew someone or something was feeding you something, but you wouldn't tell us what. I looked over at Lee. Wait, I spluttered. That little incident back in the medical pod. He shrugged. I am really angry at you, he said, and you've been acting like an idiot. But we weren't sure if you were really you. If you were, and you didn't think that we trusted you because you were an idiot, then you probably wouldn't protest when we locked you in your room until we figured this out. I tried to glare at four different directions at once. Are you trying to tell me that if I had just told you everything from the start, I asked slowly, you would have believed me? No, Lee volunteered. We'd probably have thought you were crazy then. But after what we've seen, plus, there's what Heather told us. You weren't acting like yourself, Heather added. So serious and studious, hardly any snarky comments, no petty pranks. You were acting like a decent human being. And that's bad, I stammered. For you it is, she replied. We knew something was wrong. I started envying Julius Caesar then. At least only some of his knives went into his back. So the fact that I was an raging jerk and that I was figuring out things pretty quickly made everyone suspicious of me, I asked. They looked at each other, traded expressions, and then looked back at me and nodded firmly. And, I said, if I'd been an obnoxious jerk who fumbled around and couldn't find his own arse using both hands and a flashlight, you'd have been more comfortable that I was really me. Again, nods. Thanks for the vote of confidence, I grumbled and slumped down on the bench. Slamming my forehead on the table was a bit dramatic, but it needed to be done. We made you captain, didn't we? Jack asked while patting my shoulder sympathetically. Why did you do that? I muttered between folded arms. Well, the professor answered at last. So far, every alien creature we've met has been some kind of jerk or another. 
We figured someone who spoke their native language was probably the best one to put out front. It is impossible to mount through the table through sheer force of willpower. Believe me, I tried. So what now? I asked. I still like a plan, Lee spoke up. We check it out, but we do it smart. I looked up to see if he was being sarcastic. No, his expression looked thoughtful and not condescending. I think maybe we put everyone in two ships, he went on. Half on one and another half on the other. We put the aliens at the controls and tell them to hold steady and drive. We hold one half in reserve and the other checks it out. Maybe, if something happens, we can rescue the first ship and the second. Doesn't that put everyone in danger? I asked. Ship the size of a moon versus one the size of a solar system, Lee replied. What can you do that doesn't put everyone at risk? Good point, I replied and sat up. Okay, how about we get to the ship and check out the five suits and five guns. Give them a good rundown. While that's happening, we look for two ships in the hangar. Find out which is the most heavily armed and which is the fastest. The second group goes in the fastest ship. Advanced group goes in the best armored. Meanwhile, I'll figure out how to get you guys infected with nanites. That seemed to adjourn the meeting as everyone got up and scattered to the various jobs, even though, to my best of my memory, I never assigned any. Everyone, that is, except Jack, who hung behind after everything else had left. Lee gave you a hard time, she asked me. I grimaced. No more than I deserved, I suppose. She glanced at the hallway as if to see if anyone was listening before looking back at me. Something happened to him, she told me. What? I asked in surprise at the bizarre change in topic. When he was overseas, she said, a rock, I think. I don't know what it was exactly, but he doesn't like talking about it being over there, or what he did. When he came back, he was pretty messed up, he used to get in a lot of fights. He got drunk a lot. Sometimes he was more than drunk. I just stared at her. She licked her lips, checked the door again for eavesdropping, and then went on. When he was using, he was still in a different person, she admitted. It got... It got pretty bad. One day, while he was using the... He... I don't know if you'd actually hurt me, but I pulled a knife on him anyway, and he's been trying to get sober ever since. I was working until we came here. I looked at her as though she had just told me. I really don't remember anything that happened, I said firmly. It was like my mind just switched off. I believe you, she said. The others do too. It's just that he can't because he said the same thing before. Our officer was a drug addict. Wait who was a homeless and dying of cancer before I found him. Of course he was a drug addict. For the first time, I realized that Jack wasn't telling me the story to make me feel better. She was trying to tell me something else. Dyer, I called out. Yes, Captain. The drug the suit injected me with, I asked. Is it possible to lock that down with a safe word? Not understood, Captain. From now on, I want the armor to be unable to inject any of us with this, unless someone says, um, yabba dabba do." Code accepted, the ship replied. Jack gave me a fleeting smile and then started to walk away. She paused at the doorway before walking back inside and giving me the briefest hug that was humanly possible. It was awkward and she half choked me when she did it. It was like she had only seen a fiction in a movie and never tried it before. It was also the nicest thing that had happened to me in a long time, so I smiled at her as she scurried away. Now what? As it turned out, I would ask the question a lot over the next two days. As promised, it took Dyer half a day to give the verdict on the five suits and weapons that we were in top shape. Lee appointed himself in charge of the armory, and Heather busied herself in the hangar asking Dyer about the ship's fastest and strongest. The professor, meanwhile, tried to figure out a way around some scientific equipment. So, it was Jack, of course who had the free time to come up with a solution all of us should have been seen to begin with. Exterminate! Exterminate! The meat grinder robot screamed at me. Can we turn that off? I asked aloud. It shut up for a moment and spun around with saw blades spinning. Jack went with her explanation. Daya can feed us video directly from them. She went on. We pilot the ship by remote control and send the dolly things. Daleks, Heather and I had corrected at the same time. Whatever, Jack said. Into the Dyson. If they don't get blown up, we start sending in people. I glanced at Lee. He was shrugging his temples while muttering something under his breath. It sounded like, we're idiots. The professor just looked thoughtful and Heather frowned. 
Can we put Jason's nanite things inside of it? She asked. No, I answered for Jack. As it turns out, the nanites are very host-specific. I can't transfer them to anyone. If I am no longer captain, the ship orders them to deactivate. They also could not survive very long outside the body, so don't even bother thinking about putting a vial of my blood inside. Heather's frown deepened and her brow furrowed. Can we put the nanites inside them? I shook my head. As the living organism, I said, believe me, while I went around and round the tire over there, I was trying to figure out a loophole to give you all captain level clearance. I had to settle for two levels below that. What's below captain? Jack asked. Clochy, believe it or not. This is beside the point, Lee said. How do we keep the Dyson Sphere from attacking them? We lapsed into silence. Well, the professor said at last, what if it does? We looked at her. She shrugged. I mean, as long as we get video feed, can we see where the traps are and how they are sprung? What does it matter if we lose these? Exterminate! The pseudo Dalek screamed. So, my plan got modified at the last minute due to cooler heads. We rolled a couple of the definitely not Daleks into the hangar and loaded them into the heavy armor ship. I still liked the idea of sending in the ship that could take the most abuse first and no one could come up with a reason not to. Partially because we had several of the things and it wasn't like having one shot full of holes would really set us back. The armored ship looked more like a brick than anything else. No wings, no wheels, no struts. Just six flat faces painted in a dark red. Dyer opened the door and we pushed out the dull lex inside and shut the door behind them. We left the hangar and left Dyer to figure out how to steer the thing out of the hangar doors and pointed at the Dyson Sphere. It took ten minutes to get the human habitation deck from the hangar, and by the time we got there, the armor ship had barely made a dent in the distance that it had covered. Originally, I had been all for the little craft to make a loop around the sphere, before trying to dock with it so that we could get a better view of the exterior. Someone worked out that it would take somewhere in the neighborhood of a month for the little ship to do traveling at full speed, so we decided to go ahead and send it into the docking coordinates right away. The little ship chugged along down the gravity well at full acceleration. It still took nearly two full days to arrive. Those were two of the most agonizing days of my life. Finally, and I do mean finally, Dyer alerted us when the armored ship was making final docking preparations. We all joined in the cafeteria from our various locations and had Dyer convert the wall into a view screen again. We got a live feed from one of the dull decks. Exterminate, it shouted as the video showed a little craft chugging its way to the doors the size of Manhattan. Didn't we tell it to stop doing that? I asked no one in particular. Apologies, Captain, Dyer answered. Unit is malfunctioning. The drone is not designed to operate at such distances, and its programming has become unstable. I grunted acknowledgement and watched. The door slowly opened and... It was silent, of course. There was no atmosphere out there to carry the noise of the massive slabs of black, something, sliding doors. But if there had been an atmosphere, it was certain that the noise would be deafening. The door seemed to be moving in slow motion, yet, as the ship approached, I saw that the gap between the two doors was actually almost a full mile across already. The door stopped moving and allowed the tiny ship to enter. I could now see that the doors were not just wide, but also thick. Five miles? Ten? It was hard to say. It took the tiny ship almost a minute to cover the distance of the entire hangar. No sooner had it cleared the doors than it began grinding shut again. The ship continued its way as if oblivious to this and puttered its way through the hangar. I had described the doors the size of Manhattan. Judging by the hangar that we witnessed, those doors weren't there just to be awe-inspiring. They were docking berths large enough to hold something that would probably have just barely fitted through those doors. What sort of people would build ships that big? The kind that converted moons into battleships. Stupid question, I realized. I should be the first one to go, Lee whispered. There was no need to whisper. There was still sound, but having seen this place, we couldn't speak in a normal tone either. We can't risk Jason, he went on. As far as we know, he may be the only one who can talk to those abjugated people. And as the only person who is even remotely a scientist, Professor countered, I still say that it should be me. It's risky, Lee said as he shook his head. Jason said it himself. 
We need to start being smart for once. We need to... His voice trailed off. Our tiny ship had finally found a place to park. The hangar continued for some distance still, but there was a door here that had familiar designs of an airlock. Dyer brought the ship in for landing and managed to get the dull legs to stumble their way out of the ship and pointed them in the direction of the airlock. The two drones bumped into each other and seemed as if they would collide with a wall when, at the last second, Dyer managed to correct their course and come to a stop at the front of the doorway. The door opened due to some signal that I couldn't see and the two drones pushed their way through. Sound began returning as winds buffeted the two drones inside the compartment. It really was an airlock. The door sprang open in the inner door and one of the drones shouted, Exterminate! When the video cut three seconds later. We didn't see what happened. A transmission just ended and all five of us stood there staring at the final frame of video feed. Screw the risk! The professor blurted, I'm going. Me too, Jack seconded. Heather and Lee didn't even argue. They were running out of the room with to suit up as well. Yeah, we were being stupid again, but I could really fault the decision. After all, seeing a Brachiosaurus munching on a swamp vegetation would have been exciting enough. But the airship floating behind it was the part that really caught my eye. I forced my feet to unglue themselves from the floor. Wait for me. I screamed and ran after the rest of my crew. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 14 In a race between excitement and common sense, excitement wins every time. Fortunately, hopping in a shuttlecraft and traveling a few million miles to dive leap into a dinosaur-infested Dyson Sphere takes a bit more prep time than going through to drive through at White Castle. Granted, both require the lack of foresight and an almost certain end in pain, but cruising across the void of space requires some planning. Planning is nature's soul for the heat of excitement. Did you ever participate in track and field? Jack asked me as we carried a crate of weapons to the waiting shuttlecraft. This one was jet black and looked like an enormous arrowhead, even though it was not really meant for spending extensive time in the atmosphere. It was like a designer couldn't help making it streamlined, just to emphasize how fast it was. What? I asked. We were talking about how what to do if the dinosaurs eat people, she explained. Heather said that we should pack a few gallons of ketchup and dump it on your head, as you are probably the slowest and could make an escape while they were devouring you. Heather's all heart, I agreed. So, Jack asked, can you run? I try not to, I told her. Never really got much enjoyment from the sensation. Do you think being eaten by a dinosaur will feel better? Maybe dinosaurs are allergic to ketchup. Didn't anyone think of that? We walked up the ramp and stacked the crate next to the others. The real estate inside the craft was already at a premium and, so far, no one had been able to agree when we should stop packing. Two of the fake Daleks were powered down and shoved to the corner of the back. That was Jack's idea. We knew one of them died, so why not bring some more and keep them throwing robots at them until we figured out what killed them. Made as much sense as anything, so in they went. Then Heather began wondering if anything might be inedible. Despite the car tripping rack of ribs suggesting by a certain cartoon, I was fairly certain that hunting dinos was off the menu. So Heather had insisted we bring food and water. Dyer had informed us that there was an alien equivalent to MREs. The ship had programmed the dispensers to create what the ship had called field meals, Rations designed for long-term storage, easily carried, and offered to complete nutritional needs of the human body. The field meals turned out to be brown bricks about the size of a bar of soap. We each tried one before we set out. The things were tasteless and had the texture somewhere between beef jerky and warm taffy. It wasn't sticky, but it did require a lot of chewing. Still, we decided it was an acceptable for short-term survival. A few days of this, and you'd still to resort to cannibalism just to remind yourself what the tongue was for. But for a few days, we could hack it. Water was another problem. Did you know that water doesn't compress? It's true. Apparently, that's part of the reason that belly flops hurt so much. You hit the water, and the water doesn't feel like moving or hits back. Or something like that. 
My point is that despite all the high-tech eddy and gear that we were toting around, that would move moons with all the grace of a buck skylock. Lugging around water still relied on low-tech jugs. Things weren't all bleak there, though. Apparently, the shuttlecraft and the battle armor contained something called water reclaimers. Basically, a lot of the water humans lose every day is breathed out. Since the ship has a closed atmosphere, it can filter off most of it and allow us to drink it again. Gross, but when you realize that it also used the water reclaimers in the privy, you just had to close your eyes and not think about it. The armor went one step further and absorbed sweat and injected it back into your body. It's a bit like the still suits of the Freeman War during June, but nowhere near as efficient. With the helmet down, you can make it through the day drinking only a cup of water or so. Not too bad as long as you didn't question why the bladder never seemed to fill up. I really, really hoped that I wouldn't feel the catheter being inserted. Anyway, that's besides the point. The point is Heather thought that we should plan for a week's supply and water for all of us. She argued that an Earth's drinking unfaltered water could lead to all sorts of disease. No one wanted to try swamp water that dinosaurs had been defecating in. I wasn't even sure water like that would flow from so much ooze. Point is, we packed water. A lot of it. We decided unanimously that too much water was better than not enough. So jugs of water, bunches of them. Then the professor got in on the act. She wanted us to take a medical pod in case one of us had a close encounter with the Jurassic kind. That kind of took up most of the available room in the cargo hold, all by itself. But she also wanted to take scientific tools, scanners, shovels, and things that went beep. I piled it in without protesting. Lastly, Lee insisted that we needed to be armed. Guns made sense, I guess, but he wanted to bring bombs as well. I asked him what good bombs would be. He asked me if I ever watched Barney. I packed two crates of photon grenades. There was barely enough room for five people in full armor to squeeze in now. Too bad we had seven people since my own contribution was that we take the two aliens. Strange as it was considering how accommodating I was to their demands, they had no problem bulking at mine. It's too crowded as it is, Lee pointed out, and I don't think I trust either of them. Me either, I agreed, but Volson is also the closest thing we have to an expert in alien technology and science. If we don't take her with us, we put ourselves at risk. They didn't like it, but I eventually won them over to my side. Silthus was a harder to sell, as my argument was essentially, I'm not leaving that bastard alone on the ship. In the end, the others relented, with Jack pointed out that if we got stranded, we could eat Silthus when the food ran out. So, eventually, we decided that we were going to go. I gave Dyer explicit instructions to shoot anyone who was not us who tried to board and call us if they would need to start shooting or run. The ship agreed, but I still felt a bit nervous about abandoning the ship, so I called up a few of the Daleks and patrolled the interior of the ship with instructions to buzz or anything that moved until I or someone else in the crew told them that they could stop. After that, I ran out of excuses to stall. Even the faster shuttle in the ship, the journey to the Dyson Sphere took some time. The ship actually made a minor jump through metaspace just to cut the trip a bit shorter. Still, it took six hours to get there. During that trip, we discovered that Jack was a local paper, rock scissors champ, and that nobody but me thought that a certain pattern of stars looked like Popeye wrestling a squid. No imagination in that lot. Thankfully, we arrived in the set city-sized doors before Heather had to make good on her threat to sing show tunes. The doors were both more impressive and disappointing than when we see seen in real life rather than a video feed. Space is dark. There are lots of lights out there, but they aren't doing much good. Shadows can extend so far that if you turned on a flashlight, you'd die of old age before it could chase the full length of it away. Even when that wasn't the case, human eyes aren't built to take an object several miles tall, unless the object that we're looking at is small enough for us to hit with a rock and a barbecue. We just aren't really capable of comprehending the scale of the full thing. So while the camera and the robots had given us a fisheye glimpse of the doors with the brightness pumped up, 
When we arrived in person, all I saw was a giant hole ready to swallow us in one gulp. I hadn't realized before how much it reminded me of a mouth. We flew into the gullet of the Dyson Sphere, and Volsen piloted us expertly near the spot where the other ship had parked. As we neared, I saw one of the dull legs bumping into the wall and pirouetting in its own personal belay. Or maybe it was just stuck on a spin cycle. We landed, and all the humans, myself included, reached for the guns. Um, Zorthus stammered, with his tentacles twitching, perhaps I should stay behind with the ship? Remember what I said about not leaving this bastard alone in the ship? Still didn't care for the idea. I frowned and started to make my objections. You know, Lee murmured in my ear, if we need to make a run for it, having someone stay here to keep the shuttle ready might be a good thing. I was torn between two desires. The desire not to leave Sulthus near anything that might endanger us, versus the desire to having every avenue of escape devoid of roadblocks. I really, really didn't like this. However, self-preservation is a powerful emotion. Fine, I said as I reached behind the pilot's chair and yanked out a bundle of cloth. But take this. I tossed a ball of fabric at the alien and untangled it. Dyer had recreated a red shirt for me faithfully. Wear that, I instructed Solthus, and if some sort of life form or type of energy that is unlike anything that you have ever seen happens by, I want you to wander outside the ship and optimistically try and engage in peaceful conversation with it. I do not understand, Solthus replied. You don't need to, I answered. Can you do that? Yes, Jason Reese, he agreed. Is this some sort of human luck ritual? If it plays out like it's supposed to, then the rest of us will feel very lucky indeed. I answered as I pushed my way to the ship and down the ramp of the hangar. The hangar seemed to still be in a vacuum. A selectively permeable force field allowed me to walk out the door without the shuttle losing its atmosphere. But once I crossed the barrier, it was like my footsteps and all the sounds save my own breathing disappeared. I walked over to the airlock door and waited for the others. Valsen stepped out of the ship a moment later wearing a suit much like the hazmat uniform. She was followed by three shapes that, based on their sizes, I guess would lead Jack and Heather. The professor brought up the rear. She had one of the portable scanners slung over her shoulder. We all carried backpacks with a few dozen bars of field meals, a jug of water, and a few medical supplies, and a spare gun, as well as a few other photon grenades. Nothing extravagant. According to the plan, the first trip was not expected to go much beyond the doorway of the airlock. We stepped inside the airlock and waited. Wind nearly knocked me off my feet as a pocket-sized tornado descended upon us. A few seconds later, it was over and the door in front of us cycled open. First, mystery solved. The dull egg was right in front of us and just outside the door. Probably even intact. Hard to say is only part of the domed head protruded from the pool of mud. Exterminate, his voice gargled. Yep, it was intact. I waved into the airlock and Jack sent a spare Dalek through. We steered it past the mud-trapped companion and trundled it a bit further into the swamp before it too became stuck. I felt my shoulders slump as I watched the wheels spin helplessly on the muddy patch of soil. Maybe wheels aren't superior to legs, I told the robot. Exterminate, it replied. I shook my head and stepped past it to see if I could find a tree branch or something to help pry it out the mud. I only had stepped out into the opening before I was driven face first into the mud drenched ground. Having bullets whiz past your head will do that to you. Just so you know, a voice that seemed to be below a screech at the same time warned me, I don't necessarily have to miss. You might want to ponder that fact that you stand up real slow. The words came to me as a weird blend of spoken word and symbiote translation. The words were chimeric after all. Well, sort of. A mutant form of chimeric with some odd grammar and pronunciation. But it was still close enough for my borrowed language skills to pick up the word here and there. Slowly, I lifted my face from the mud and looked up. The man was short but heavy built. He wore brown breeches tucked into a high boots that seemed to be made of leather. Over his barrel chest he wore a dark red button-down shirt and a long coat that draped just below his hips. 
In his extended right hand, I saw something trained my head that was most definitely a gun. A strange looking one, but still a gun. The barrel looked almost like it was made from ceramic. Short yet heavily built, a mass of longish brown hair surrounding the squared off face with a heavy brow and a sloping forehead. A Neanderthal was pointing a gun at me. How much weirder could my day get? Valsen chose that moment to crash into view, and the gunman twitched his eyes towards her before swinging the gun in that direction. What in the outer dark are you supposed to be? he asked before swinging the gun back at me. Someone better start talking or I'll put holes in people, he warned. Ah, that's how much stranger. She's a friend, Heather said as she raced into view with her hands held up to her sides. She said it in English, I wasn't surprised when the gun swung in the wider arc to take in all three targets. Someone, he said slowly, better talk now. I drew my feet up underneath me and pushed myself to a standing position. I raised my hands. Please, I said no harm to you, we mean. My horse ate six candles. Damn it, I tried again. We mean you no harm, I said. Strangers, we are here. I may not be a linguist, but from the experience I can tell you this much. If you ever want to pick up a new language in a hurry, all you need are three things. First and foremost, have a symbiotic creature inside your skull, providing real-time translations of what you and they are saying so that you can correct yourself on the fly. Two, have the root of the language that you are trying to speak imprinted on your memories. And thirdly, and I can't emphasize this last one enough, have someone point a gun at you and threaten to shoot you if you don't learn. The gun lowered just a hair. You can speak, the gunman declared. Learning your language, I am slowly, I said. I concentrated, lassoing a wild dip thong. I tried again. I am learning your language, I said, but it is slow and I'll need time. He cocked a fuzzy eyebrow at me. Seem to be doing a pretty good job there of it, son, he appraised. We have uh, animals in heads, I said. Helps with hearing your words. We all understand speaking is harder. He holstered his pistol. You all have the symbiote. He asked pleasantly. Well, out to dark, you all really are outsiders, aren't you? The stranger said that you would be, but I don't always take to what they are saying. Strangers? I asked. He waved his hands at me. The rest of you all can come on now, he said. I ain't likely to hurt you. Glad to hear it, Lee said, stepping out from behind the dark shrub. He said the words in pure chimeric, but I think the gunman took their meaning. The rifle Lee pointed at his chest assisted with the transition there. Jack followed a moment later, trained the pistol on the gunman. He didn't even flinch. He just watched us as an expression of polite curiosity. The professor was the last one to step out. She gaped openly at the new arrival. Oh yeah, anthropologist. I should have expected this. The gunman stared back at her before returning his attention to me. Lady back there with big guns, he said. She's staring at me. I looked at the professor. She's unarmed, I pointed out. Not from where I'm standing, he corrected with me, but shrugged. Exterminate. The voice goggled from behind us as the gunman's pistol was out again. He moved so fast that I could even saw his hand move. There was just a blur, and the gun was pointed at where the buried Dalek was churning up the mud. For the first time, the gunman seemed really surprised. Is that, um, metal? He gasped. I looked down at the silvery dome in her head. Yes, I said. He wiped his mouth with his hand and the pistol holstered again. That's pure metal, he said. Real metal. I looked at the others. They looked at me. I had no better answer. Mostly, I said. Why? He looked up at me with wide eyes. You got no idea how much that's worth, do you? He said, asking me, stammering. You're all planning to buy half the sphere or something? That's why the outsiders come in here. I looked at the others. We just came to shave ostriches, I said. I took a deep breath and tried again. We came here to meet humans, I said. We heard that there were some noodle kicks. Some, uh, colonies here, he grunted. First thing, he said, we need to get you and your metal in the ship. Ain't everyone on the sphere as sociable as me. Come on, I'll help you pry him loose. The gunman found a loose branch and plunged it into the mud next to the sunken Dalek. 
With a heave of muscle I didn't think was possible with a human frame, the lever plunged downwards and the robot was lifted with a wet sucking sound. Lee and Heather grabbed the sides and tugged it free from the muck. Exterminate! The second robot shouted. The gunman wheeled and smiled. You got two of them, he almost squeaked. You people are going to be the life of the party, I can tell already. The second robot, which was already bogged down, the Anderthal freed by merely lifting it out and setting it to the side. He then dusted off his hands and waved at us warmly. Follow me, he said. My name is Reynolds, and I'm captain of the boat of the yonder. He pointed at the meaty hand at the horizon, and I saw the upper portion of a massive airship that we had seen in the robot's video peeking out over the tree line. The dinosaurs, perhaps frightened by the noise, seemed to have left the area for the moment. Renault's short legs set off in the direction of the airship at a fairly steady clip. Ain't she sight, he went on. Her name is All is Serene. There was a note of love in his voice. I froze in place and lifted a questioning finger. Renault's, I stammered. All is serene. Does that mean... Just drop it, Heather advised as she shoved me forward, forcing me to fall back and step with the rest of the group. I took a hint and fell in step behind them. I guess I could ask the question after we took the tour of the Garum ship. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 25, written by Sebi Loki. Our booted feet sunk into the swamp water as we marched. Despite the fact that I could tell that it was hot and muggy outside, I actually felt reasonably comfortable. The armor seemed so do a thermal regulation and the water reclaimers I didn't really sweat anyway. The result was that I felt like below my neck was an air-conditioned room while my head was dunked inside a bucket of chicken noodle soup. Other than the lingering threat of drowning in the air, I felt okay. I wasn't even tired. I wondered if the berserker drug was the only stimulant the armor was equipped with. We eventually rounded a small, mushy hill and entered some small crops of trees. Although I didn't recognize any of the trees, they didn't look particularly alien to me either. In a way, that was a bit disappointing. I always half expected to find out the plants during this time of dinosaurs looked radically different, like giant carrots or saber-toothed ferns or something. These trees looked like they were right at home in the modern swamp. Then again, I wasn't an expert. We reached the clearing in the woods faster than I had expected. One moment I was tripping over an exposed root every tree and bush and grew in the area, and the next I was staggering onto a flat expanse of relatively dry land. The first thing I noticed was the blast of heat. The air had been hot and humid before. Now it was like I was standing in a sauna. Something long and slender passed before my eyes and caught my attention. I searched for it and found it. It was just a rope that was tied to a stake in the ground that trailed upwards into the sky. Nothing to get excited about. Wait, what was that again? I followed the rope up and up and up, and I soon discovered why it felt like I was standing next to a furnace. Technically speaking... I was standing ten feet directly below a furnace. The ship was huge. Not huge like Dyer was, but huge as in you could park a couple of the city buses inside a balloon without denting the review mirrors. And the balloon part, a gas bag, was dirty brown in color and reminded me of a leather football. I wasn't sure what was going to be made of exactly, but I saw the lighter colored patches that was evident of recent mending. They seemed to be holding the moment, so I tried to relax and not think about the wooden box the size of a small house remaining suspended over my head, largely due to an unknown person's sewing skills. It didn't really help that the armor was forced to suck up most of my sweat. Behind the wooden structure was a large container that looked like a wooden barrel. This seemed to be the source of the heat. Clouds of hot steam boiled out of the hoses clamped to the sides. Spying this, I saw Reynolds' get expression darken. Yakimo, he shouted. Get out here now. We're losing pressure. Captain Reynolds was staring up at the airship like the rest of us. So even he was taking a bit off guard, but there was a crashing sound from the trees out of the, our right. We all looked up and saw a tall ape-like creature wearing overalls step into the clearing carrying a bucket of water. 
The creature was silky long hair, dirty blonde in color. It gave the look of an ape with a Fu Manchu mustache. The head was flatter than broader than a human's, which punished cheekbones and a flattened nose. It bared its teeth at us and it spoke. Sorry, Captain. It, no, he, said in a voice that had more gravel than a rock quarry. The levers jammed and I was forced to vent to keep the pressure down. This must be a chemo, I decided. I felt rather than saw the professor gaping at the new arrival. I stole a glance in her direction. She saw me. That looks like a paranthropus species, she hissed. I just looked at her for a moment before replying in a normal speaking volume. They don't understand English. I doubt you'll offend them. Even if they could understand you, I doubt that they would understand you because I certainly can't. She glared at me. Look, she said impatiently, humans weren't the only hominid species to grace our planet. In the past, there were several different species. Today, only one branch of a family still exists, but if you set the clock back a few million years, you find a bunch more. This one looks like a descendant of one of the robust Australopithecans. I'm sure that's a fascinating topic, but they died off almost three million years ago, she insisted. He shouldn't be here. Giant sphere in space, I reminded her. We left impossible behind a while ago. I looked back at the host and found them staring at us. Are they speaking cold, Lander? Yakima asked you, Ronalds. Outsiders, he said. The robust whatever seemed taken aback. You mean the stranger was telling the truth? I thought for sure that we'd be in hand. Ain't that something? Ronalds agreed. How do you know that they're telling the truth? The captain nodded in his direction of the trees. Exterminate. The Dalek greeted. Yakumo's eyes bulged. That's metal, he gasped. Maybe even steel. Ever seen that much metal in one place before? Yakumo rocked his head. I thought it might be a sign of negotiation, like a head shake. Not that much metal in all of Newton. The man agreed as he set Daddy's bucket. Scrake seen this yet. Renault seemed about to answer when the squeaky voice spoke up. Yeah, I see it. The helium voice replied. I just don't believe it. It came from overhead, so we all looked up to the tree line. We spotted her hanging from a branch high in the tree. For a moment, I took her in to be a child, as she was only three and a half feet tall. But a hint of a curve beneath her butter yellow dress and the tiniest hint of lines around her eyes forced me to push the age up by a few decades. She looked faintly Polynesian, but with a strangely pronounced brow line. Not unattractive, precisely, but she looked almost as be out of place as Yakimo. Apparently, the professor agreed. That's Homo Florencius, she gasped. A hobbit! I looked over at the girl and frowned. Is this the part where you tell me about the ring and a volcano, or I'm not just going to stop you right there? Not that type of hobbit, she snapped. This is another species of human. We have three species of humans right here. Four, if you count us. I count us, I said, and I looked back at the woman. I looked back in time to see the hobbit woman scamper down the tree and drop softly to the ground. She walked over to the dull like an eye critically. Do any of them talk? she asked the captain. The ugly one can a bit, he conceded. The others not so much. I found it highly annoying that neither Yakima or Scrake had any trouble identifying the ugly one as me. I decided to try to be friendly. Hello, I greeted. She wasn't impressed. You selling this thing, friend? she asked me. Because the name your price and I'll take it. I'll spread my legs, or I'll hold the other two down while you spread them, if that's your fancy. I hesitated. Metal is rare, I asked her at last. She snorted. Honey, she said, I'm still low-balling you on the no matter how you sell it for. The captain cleared his throat. This is my supercargo crate, he introduced. And over there is our engineer, Yakimo. Yakimo walked over to one of the ropes and waved at us in an offhand manner. He hefted the bucket up and seemed to test his heft. Then he looked at us like he shot everyone a toothy grin. I'll be back, he said. He then placed the bucket handle between his teeth. He bit down and freed up his hands, and without any additional warning, he leapt up and casually caught the rope above him. He scrambled up the ship and going hand over hand faster than he could have done with the same flight of stairs. Okay, I conceded. 
Wrong movie, but I'll let you throw one slide as that was hella cool. I then let out an oomph sound as Aether elbowed me in the gut. The armor should have softened the blow, but I think she was amplifying her strength. Fortunately, the captain Scrake seemed to miss the exchange or chose to ignore it. Scrake was busy inspecting my training robot, turned useless exploration robot, and Renald seemed more interested in watching your Kumo progress. How did you know we would be here? I asked. You seem to have been expecting us. Renald shot me a look from the corner of his eyes before returning his gaze upwards. We told you, he said, the stranger sent us. What's a stranger? I asked. This got his full attention. They don't have them where you come from. The disbelief was evident in his voice. I shook my head and realized that it was probably meant something else to these people. So I answered, no. He stared at me for a moment, maybe to see if I was kidding, but then looked back at the floating airship. Most of them are Moj like you, he admitted. The word didn't translate. Moj, I interrupted, and he sighed and pointed at me. Moj, he declared, and then he pointed at his own chest. Tarka, he said. Now he aimed his finger at Scrake. Yite, he informed me. Lastly, he pointed at the ship. And Yakimo's a dlaf, he said. What in the dark void do you call them? I tried to recall the weird Latin names that the professor had been reciting, but couldn't remember them. I shrugged. I don't know, I said. But go on. Tell me about the strangers. Like I said, he said, looking back at the airship, most of them are Moj, a few Tarkas, maybe at Dalaf or here or there, but no Ites I'm aware of. And we like it that way, Scrake added. But the thing about strangers, he went on as if he hadn't heard her, is that they're strange, talk without using words, that sort of thing. A puzzle piece fell into place. You mean they are? Here, I tried to use a chimeric word for psychic, but even as I said the word, it didn't seem to translate quite correctly. Outminders? He frowned. Not really crazy, he corrected me. Just seemed to know things without needing any normal way of obtaining information. They claim that they don't really read minds. Most minds, anyway. But some folks reckon they do. I blinked. And the strangers told you that we would be here. A stranger, he corrected. A young last named Summer Glow. And we're back in the right franchise again, I whooped. I got elbowed in the stomach again, but I was braced for it this time. She told us, he went on, that if we skedaddled our way over the dinosaur oasis on about the 15th and drost, we'd get a payday, the likes of which we'd never seen before. All she asked was in return was for us to bring back any outsiders that we met and gab at her. When he said the word dinosaur, it was as if he had said three words at the same time. The symbiote translated in my mind's head to dinosaur, the chimeric word he used in my memory translated to dragon, but by examining the root word, I also recognized it simply meaning big eater. Never heard of a stranger being able to see the future before, he went on. He eyed me suspiciously. Not sure she did it now, he admitted. Anything you reckon you should tell me, fellow? My name is Jason, I said. How is that for a start? He grunted and eyed my companions, so I introduced the others in turn. Heather waved as I pointed at her, and Jack and Lee just nodded. Balson cowered. The professor was the one who surprised me. This is Madakai, I said. Hello, the professor greeted. Her pronunciation of the alien language was already better than my own. She saw my look. I've been listening to you talk, she explained in English. I gave me enough to work out some of the rules. This isn't the first time I've had to learn a new language, you know. I thought about the fact that she spoke English with an accent. No, I guess it wasn't. I stepped back and let her have the center stage. The captain didn't seem to mind the change in focus. In fact, he seemed rather pleased with it. Okay, sure, the professor is a lot nicer to look at than I am, but ugly. Really? Was that called for? I looked up at the airship and saw the steam taper off. The window slid open and Yakumo stuck his head out. Captain, he bellowed, the lattice is closing. Renault said something that didn't translate, but had the cadence of profanity. Toss down the ladder, he said. We'll get everyone aboard. Lattice, I asked. He waved upwards. Look to the sky, he said. I ain't got time to explain everything to you. 
I looked at the others and they followed me to the periphery of the clearing where we hoped to catch a glimpse of the unobstructed sky. We did, and I think I got all mud on my faces as my jaw hit the ground. There was a second Dyson Sphere. It was a smaller one, also jet black, but this one was more like a traditional swarm. The hexagonal plates were spread out alongst the most of the sunlight to peek through. But even as I watched, I realized the plates were drifting closer and closer together. They would soon blot out the sun and plunge the spot of space into darkness. This was how they managed nightfall. A hand fell on my shoulder and I looked over to see that it was Reynolds. You and your friends better get on board the ship, he declared. Some of the beasties that come out at night aren't too neighborly. I looked past him and saw the rope ladder had dropped to the ground. Yakiwa was scrambling upside carrying one of the Daleks with him. Scrake stood at the bottom waiting for to clear before following suit. Sorry, Reynolds went on. The accommodations aren't much. We came here bare bones. I can't even offer you a proper dinner. We have food, the professor offered. Yeah, I agreed. It's not even problematic. I was still braced for the impact to my stomach, but she was definitely amplifying her strength this time. I still doubled over. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 26 Captain Reynolds held the ladder steady and waved us to ascend. I looked back helplessly at the others. The professor broke this frozen to blue by gripping the ladder and going up. Okay, so we were planning on spending the night up there after all. Good to know. Jack went up next, then Heather, then Wilson just started. Problem, science officer? I asked at last. My arms and legs don't function in that manner, she explained. I can't perform such a feat. I swore and explained the problem to Reynolds. His solution was to have Yakimo climbed back down and loop an arm around Wilson. The balloony nature of the hazmat suit made gripping her difficult, so I solved the problem by unsealing the suit and forcing it to deflate. If there are any infections on this world, I am not hardened to... I shall, she began. The suit is still pumping in air to inflate itself, I interrupted. Any virus that can swim upwind at 70 mile gale wouldn't be stopped by a suit anyway. I saw by her relaxed body that she caught my meaning. I had only opened a suit, not unhooked it. It was presumably filtering the ready supply of atmosphere around it and pumping it in. The pressure difference as the suit vented air would provide some protection. Yakimo looped an arm around her again and half dragged her up the ladder. Lee stood to watch beside me and took his place. I don't like the idea of leaving a man down here with him alone, Lee admitted to me in English. I'm not sure I can trust Captain Reynolds. We outnumber them, we are armed, we're armored, and we can blow the ship up if it gets too rowdy, forcing him to spend the evening in Dino Land on the ground, I told him. I think we're covered. Lee looked at me and grinned slyly. You saw me pocket the grenades before we left the ship? He asked. I nodded. Don't try and be sneaky in cramped space, I advised him. It's hard to be subtle when you're jostling elbows. He let out a low chuckle and took the ladder. Probably best we leave one of the folk who can talk to them the last man up, Lee reasoned. I'll see you at the top. I slapped his shoulder in encouragement and up he scampered. That left me with Reynolds bringing up the rear. Reynolds looked at me once before shooting a concerned glance over his shoulder. You first, he said. I hesitated. Despite my bravado with Lee, I wasn't sure that I liked the idea of not keeping at least one person boots on the ground until the last moment. I didn't really distrust Reynolds. I just didn't have a reason to trust him either. Reynolds saw my hesitation. It's harder to climb the ladder than when it's swinging free, he said quickly. Unless you've done this before, I will be a lot faster for you if you go now and let me last. Point the gun at me at the top if it makes you feel better, but go now. I went. I could tell that Reynolds was right as I climbed. If this was the easy way, I'd find it miserable doing it the hard way. For one thing, the rope ladder swung no matter how much Reynolds held it. The airship drifted slightly, and with each tiny movement of the craft, a wave of movement rippled down the ladder. For another thing, the ladder was designed for ease storage rather than its ease of use, 
Small, thin rungs take up less space when in not in use, but don't take up quite enough space when looking for handholds. Still, it was fairly short distance and I made it up the ladder in a few seconds. I was just putting myself on board when the airship when the ladder started jostle and I saw Renault scrambling up. The inside of the airship looked like it had started out as a kid's treehouse. Smooth wooden planks swarmed the floor and walls. Above our heads, the bottom of the gas bag, through the rear of the compartment, aft, there was a network of tubes and barrels. I looked like a cross between a mad scientist lab and a mating ball of wooden snakes. The front, four, was a smaller room with two chairs and what looked like a control panel with a steampunk illustration minus the brass, or wheels, levers, and dials. Three hammocks lay up in the corner, their bare hooks just jutting out from the wall, and a few boxes of supplies were stashed in the corner. That was it. The ship went beyond Spartan and was half a step removed from Baron. The captain appeared in the doorway a moment later and caught my glance. It's a light freighter, he explained. From his tone I gathered he was actually supposed to mean something. He hauled up the ladder and then closed the dog door shut. I looked out the window on the opposite side and caught sight of a gloom outside growing deeper. The lattice was still closing. I continued to stare out the window for a moment. I guess I was expecting to see, well, something to clue me in on the world's weird geography. A wall curving up to the horizon in the distance. I didn't see it. In fact, this world seemed rather flatter than Earth. The land just seemed to stretch on and on until it lost into the haze. There was a tap on my shoulder and I saw a professor was standing next to me. She motioned for me to move over so she could take a look as well. According to Yakimo, she said, the lattice closes everywhere at the same time. The entire sphere is the same day-night cycle. That was a useful feature. We watched as the light outside faded until it seemed that we would lose it entirely. And then the stars came out. Twinkling lights appeared all over the horizon. Some were steady, some flashed, some moved. They were all different colors. I looked at the prof. City, she said. Campfire, ships, all sorts of lights all over the sphere. I looked back in the small window and saw hundreds of lights. If every one of those was a city then, there must be millions. I breathed. Quadrillions, she corrected. The population of the sphere is several times that of Earth's, and there are still portions of the largely unpopulated. We stood there for a moment longer as our eyes adjusted to the gloom. The professor told me that Yakimo had already informed her that the lattice didn't entirely close. The world was never entirely plunged into darkness. Just a very deep gloom as only part of the sunlight was allowed to escape. I turned away from the window and looked around the room. The captain and Scrake had stepped into the corner control room and turned the two chairs to face the back into the room. Yakimo and the others were either sitting or lowering themselves into a sitting position on the floor. Yakimo himself folded his legs into a lotus position, like he was a yeti yogi. I eased myself to the floor and rested my back against the wall of the ship. The professor followed suit a moment later. A drawn-out moaning sound echoed from outside the ship. Reynolds glanced in the direction where we sound seemed to originate, but didn't react otherwise. Our neighbors seem to be a mite too noisy tonight for us to catch any shut eye, he declared. Hope none of you of the anxious for a nap. We're mostly interested in sending noisy gas, uh, exchanging information, I said. What is going on here? How did the Summer Glow person know that we were coming? What is an outsider? Reynolds held up a hand and ticked off the points. Lots don't know, and you, he said. I just eyed him. He tossed his hands up in the air in frustration. I don't know what to tell you, he said. Tell me how much you know and we'll sort it out from there. I glanced at the professor. So far, she was our best speaker. She caught my look and nodded. Slowly, painfully, she gave the highlighted reel of what we knew. She left out some parts, the bits with the educators, and the proxy wars with the other species. She also left it ambiguous as to whether or not we were on their side of the chimera or not. A clever omission if you ask me, but the important stuff was there. 
They were from Earth, Chimera would come to Earth and make weapons out of what they found. Humans were part of the last war and we were almost wiped out by a plague. We've been left alone for a few thousand years and when suddenly the quarantine ended, we managed to find a moonship and came here. A nice summary that could be read in several different ways. The professor was clearly an expert in the art of sharing but not sharing too much. Reynolds listened silently. He may have been of the statue as long as Professor was talking. When she was done, he looked not at her, but at Scrake. Looks like the Zoners are onto something, he muttered. She laughed. Zoners, I prompted. He looked over at me and frowned, as if he'd just been unpleasantly reminded that I was still there. A religious group, he said. They claimed the Changing Ones, you call them the Chimera, but it sounds like it's the same group. Put us there as a test. A test? I asked. He shrugged. Don't look at me, he said. Not many people still believe in the changing ones. Just a bunch of stories to tell the kids at night to give them a scare. What sort of stories? I pressed. Ah, uh, you know, he said with a shrug. Normal stuff. We came from a distant land and other side of the world. The changing ones brought something from every edge of our world here, including its people, and put up the walls to separate them. Walls? A labyrinth, he said dismissively, just more kid stories. There's a labyrinth here, the professor asked. Reynolds glanced at her, confusion painted his face. Of course, he said. Other than the oasis, this place is mostly labyrinth and oceans. It's part of the reason we rely on airships for so much. What sort of world do you come from? One where we don't live from fear of David Bowie wearing tights and a codpiece lurking around every corner, I supplied. I was too far away for Heather to elbow, but I was still close enough for her to kick, which she did. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Part 27, written by Semi Loki. Chimerian battle armor allows multiple alternatives for night vision. The Howard's visor can allow the wearer to toggle between multiple wavelengths along the electromagnetic spectrum. Near, infrared, far infrared, the ultraviolet light was just a few options. It also has a built-in lamp alongside the chest plate to allow a hands-free light source for the more normal visual spectrum. Lee and I opted for the latter in deference for our hosts. Reynolds supplemented with this oil lamp that, save for the ceramic and wooden fitting in a place of metal, would have looked perfectly at home on Earth as a railroad lantern. Reynolds was more than willing to explain what he called the metal crisis. Those fancy lights are yours, he said, pointing at my chest. They use electricity. The question caught me off guard for multiple reasons. First of all, these people, and I was struggling to update my definition of human, include hominid subspecies, had presented no evidence of anything more than the crudest early industrial level of technology. I wasn't sure how many lay people were familiar with the idea of electricity during the age of steam engines, but I doubt any of them would have been so blasé about the idea of an electric light. The other big reason it caught me off guard, though, was I truly didn't know. My borrowed memories told me how to use Chimera technology. There was precious little about the inner workings. I told him it was to spare him the details. He sighed and looked wistful. So much metal, he said while gazing at the ceiling. You must live like the princes and fairy. Princes, I asked. Fairy? The prof asked. You mentioned food, Yamiko, prompted. We decided that last question had the highest priority, so we unslung our backpacks and handed out our ration bars. Each bar had been wrapped in a quick degrading seal, simply puncturing the transparent seal and it dissolved in the blink of an eye. Even biting it was enough to cut the seal and allow the food inside to be eaten. This, it turned out, was a good feature, as the three sphere natives didn't even give us a chance to provide directions before they bit in. All three froze mid-chew, shot us a sour face and then continued chewing in a more cautious manner. This isn't considered a delicacy where you're from, is it? Scrake asked at last. No, I answered. It's considered a marginally preferable alternative to starvation. Three sets of shoulders relaxed. I didn't want to insult, Reynolds said at last, but I think I'd find more flavor chewing on the side of a ship. At least it has been seasoned with pitch. 
Yakima wolfed his bar down and asked for another, a toss to an extra. We came here bare bones, Yakima said, just barely enough supplies to get us here. We'd hoped to find something edible when we arrived. Some of the beasties can be a mite territorial, Captain Reynolds elaborated, so we've been spending a fair bit of time cooped up in here. I offered Scrake and Reynolds another bar. They seemed to consider it and then, with obvious reluctance, accepted another field meal. Heather was the one who thought the break her out the water supply and handed to our hosts. They drank greedily from the container offered them, so I passed another one over. You know about electricity? I prompted as Reynolds had gulped his full and passed the container to Yakimo. He licked his lips and seemed to think about how to respond. We've known about it for a century or two, he admitted. Knowing what to do with it is a little more complicated. Without metal to get it to go where you want, there haven't been any many practical applications. Metal is that rare? Professor asked. All metals were just iron or steel. Reynolds hesitated again. There seems to be a bit of iron in the soil, he admitted. We don't know much or how to get it out. Our physicians say that if it wasn't for there, we'd all be dead. That there is iron in our blood. That sound right to you. I nodded and then, recalling they used different non-verbal gestures, said that our doctors had come to the same conclusion. He grunted. That makes it worse, he said. Metal all around us, but we can't get to it. Maybe it's too scattered or something. Maybe we could get to it, concentrated, if we could build the right machine. But to do that, we need metal. He laughed at his own observation. I didn't. So metal is hard to find, I asked. Most of it went into making the sphere, I think, he said. Some of our scientists think that the sphere was created by concentrating all the harder elements into the area and shaping them. No one can agree how that happened. Some think it involved the larger sun that first exploded and then cooled, leaving a smaller core frozen inside a shell. Some think the sphere was shaped by the changing ones. Others say the Fae were responsible. That's the second time you've mentioned the Fae, Professor pointed out. You have legends about them as well. Reynolds traded a look with Yakimo. Does that count as a legend? he asked his partner. Yakimo didn't seem to have an answer. The professor looked as confused as I was. That's when it dawned on me that the word legend was translated by the symbiote. I got more complicated word through the chimeric root words. English is a strange language. Native speakers and non-native speakers tend to agree on that point. Erratic spelling, grammar rules that are more suggestions than actual rules, and voracious appetite and devouring foreign words without regard to context. It is a language that seems designed more to confuse than for communication. Stranger still, definitions of words can shift from moment to moment, sometimes within the same sentence, which is why I can say something as outrageous as, don't overlook the overlook or you might miss the buffalo, 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 buffalo. Well, no, I can't say that. I lose the buffalo somewhere in there every time. But you get my point. English definitions are weird. It sometimes reduces different or even contradictory ideas into the same word. Legend, as it happens, is one of these words. Okay, let's put it this way. Unless one of the beasties, as Reynolds dubs them, knocks on our door and asks for a tree fiddy for a box of Girl Scout cookies, it's pretty safe to say that confirmed stories of Loch Ness Monster existence are somewhere in the neighborhood of Zero. Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, the Uwe Balls Oscars, things we've never heard about and tell stories about, we just have no proof of them. These are legends. We also call people who do exist legends. When people call a sports figure a legend, they generally mean that this person has achieved some degree of excellence that the stories make like legends. Fascinating adventures of near superhuman feats. They do not imply, however, that this person does not exist. Most people are willing to admit the existence of sports figures even though they have never met them, probably because they've seen them on television. Yet, they debate the veracity of landing on the moon for the exact same reasons. This probably tells you more than anyone wants to admit about the human race. Getting back to the point, the word legend can refer to things that we believe are real, things that we don't think are real, 
and in things that we are not sure about because we just don't have any proof. Muhammad Ali, Santa Claus and the Yeti are all legends, but we believe in their existence to various degrees. At least, I don't think Santa Claus is planning on challenging Ali for the belt, but uh, if he does, my money is on Santa. Regardless, the word that the professor had inadvertently picked had been translated by the symbiote into the ambiguous word, legend, invoking the concept of no personal proof. The fact that Reynolds and Yakimo seemed to be uncertain of how to proceed was telling. You have reason to believe the Fae exist, I said for the professor's benefit. She started as this revelation, but as soon as I made the declaration, I could see the wheels working as she pieced together the same linguistic clues as I had. We know they exist, Reynolds answered. The Vonach expedition brought back word of them. We haven't heard anything since. Believe me, that's for the best. What is the Vonag expedition? I asked. Vonag was a mad wealthy Modge who lived a few thousand years ago. He and some of his friends fitted over the massive airship with a few families and set out to circumnavigate the sphere. You've had airships for thousands of years, I sputtered. He rolled his eyes. Not much to an airship, he said. Collecting enough Pyron for the steam drive is the hard part. What's Pyron? I asked. He pointed to the rear of the ship where a massive wooden boiler sat. In there, he said, it's a mineral we have here. When it gets wet, it gets hot. A fingernail's worth of it is worth more than this entire ship. I take it you don't have it where you come from? No, I admitted. I've never heard of such a thing. How does water make it grow hot? I don't know, he confessed. Some scientists say that it has something to do with it being a monopole or something like that. Water causes it to generate a current or something like that, which causes it friction. I don't understand the science. All I know is that if we hadn't discovered Pyron, we might still be smacking each other over the head with bones. Heather glared at me. I decided not to ask any questions about monoliths and my spare aching ankles further abuse. Let's get back to the topic, the professor interjected. Tell us more about the Fae. Reynolds sighed. Look... I ain't exactly prepared to recite a history of the sphere to you people, he said, sounding annoyed. All I can tell you is that when Vanach's descendants arrived, they told us the land of Fairy, which had a higher level of technology than the rest of the parts of the sphere, okay? The professor seemed a bit embarrassed. Maybe she realized how pushy she had been. I was about to change topics to something more agreeable to the captain when I felt my ankle throb again. Heather kicked me again. I didn't even make any inappropriate geek references this time. I glared at her. He said, Descendants, she hissed at me. The expedition didn't come back with the original crew. I mentally replayed the conversation. She was right. Ah, I stammered. You want to ask him about? I can't talk to them, she said, exasperated. Only you and Madakai have seemed to have figured out how to do that. Her, I understand. You, I can't. That hurt. I was half inclined to not ask her a question for her just out of spite. Then I remembered I didn't exactly have room to move my ankle out of her effective range. Besides, now I was curious. Last question, I said. About how long did the Bonag expedition last? Don't know, Benel said. A few thousand years, I reckoned. All of my companions fell silent at once. I think we were just beginning to realize the scale of the sphere. To these folk things on the opposite side of the sphere were multiple types of legend. They believed in them, but they would never have proof. It would take several lifetimes to travel there and with their fastest available transportation. The three humanoids took my last question comment as an invitation to start interrogating us. Fortunately, that meant most of the questions were fielded by the professor. Did we come from outside the sphere? Yes. Was there another sphere outside? No. What did the place we come from look like? A ball. How did we keep from falling off? Was it dark all the time with the sun on the inside? How did we keep from being flung off? The questions ran like gambit from intelligent to well-formed to just plain crazy. I waved the others over to the huddle and switched over to English. Thoughts? I asked. Lee glanced over his shoulder to make sure that the natives were fully focused on Madakai before he answered. I think we should get these people to take us to the Summer Glow character as soon as possible, he admitted. I nodded in agreement. Wait, 
Heather said, holding a palm out as if trying to hold a charging rhino. We barely set foot into this world and we're surrounded by dinosaurs. Now you want to go take us in further? What if we can't find our way back? This place is huge. Lee frowned but grunted acknowledgement. True, he said, but something's wrong here. How did she know the right way to send these clowns? I looked from him to Heather before speaking up. I'm inclined to agree with Lee, I said. Heather looked as if she was ready to protest, but it was my turn to silence her with a gesture. No, I said. Listen to me first. Ever since this idiot E.T. showed up, no offense Vulcan, we've been playing defense. We've been reacting to what someone else is doing. Captain Cock tries to kill me, I bash his head in and the commander of his ship. We arrive at the outpost and it looks like negotiations are stalled. We steal a bigger ship to take to head off us. Then someone starts messing with my head and I get directions here. We get here and we're expected. Someone else has been calling the shots and we've been forced to catch up. I think we need to take the fight to them for a change. Don't you think going into Summer Glow is going to do you what she expects? Heather asked Riley. Yes, I agreed. But did she expect us to be armed? As far as I can tell, we've got better weapons than just about, well, anyone. Except maybe these fairies that are all the way across the sphere. If a fight breaks out, we take hostages and point a gun at someone until we get dropped off here again. And then, she asked. Then we asked Dyer about what weapons he has that can punch holes in this place, I said. Or we take a coordinates of this place back to Overseer and use it as a bargaining chip. I don't know. I'm making this up as we go along. Heather rolled her eyes and looked at Jack. Can you talk some sense into these two? She asked. Jack shrugged one shoulder. Don't see how it matters, she admitted. The sphere has guns. If you don't want us to leave, they have lots of chances to shoot us on the way back out. Go or stay. Until we figure out what's going on, we're in their mercy. It was a sobering observation and one we'd all clearly forgot. I saw the change come over Heather. Fine, she said. We go. Guns are blazing if we have to, but only if we have to. First we ask questions, hard questions, lots of them. Agreed, I said. Lee nodded. Jack didn't comment one way or the other. And, Heather added, we take Volsum back to the shuttle. I opened my mouth to protest. No, Jason, Heather said with a shake of her head. That's the best plan. If worse comes to worse, the five of us can blend in with the population. But what about her? Besides, she might be able to help us from the ship if we get into a jam. I made certain sort of sense. I was ready to agree, but got interrupted again. It was all the same to you, Volson said. Speaking up for the first time in what felt like hours, I would prefer to follow you. I looked at the alien science officer. Her lips were smacking in mild agitation but otherwise she displayed no signs of anxiety or deceit. Why? I asked, for the sake of form. Three reasons, Volson said. First, I am a scientist and I would appreciate the opportunity to observe more of this world. Secondly, without your presence, I am uncertain if the ship would even permit me to operate the shuttle. I am tolerated presence, not a welcome one. And third, I prompted. Thirdly, she said. Now her agitation began to really show. I fear for my safety. If I must be on this world, I feel safer amongst your company than without. So you like the idea of having violent savages who have reason to preserve your life acting as a shield through the nasty things of this world? Accurate enough, she allowed. I shook my head. Still, we didn't pack food for you, I told her. We might be able to bribe the captain to set out by giving him some of the Daleks, but we'd have to split the field meals with them as it is. My metabolism is considerably slower than your own, she reminded me. I was aware that we might be away from the shuttle for some time. I will not need sustenance for several days yet. You need not concern yourself with that. I looked at the others, Heather shrugged. Jack gave me a thumbs up. Lee. Lee checked his pistol to make sure that it was easy to reach. Only then did he give me a careful, reserved nod. Then we are in agreement, I said. We pay the crew and take us to Summer Glow. What do you mean that all other species of human are extinct? Reynolds roared as he leapt to his feet. His hands fell from the butt of his pistol. 
Yakimo grabbed a wooden tool that looked like a crowbar and slowly rose to his feet. Scrake remained sitting on the floor in a lotus position, but a lap I saw a dagger with a black blade. Not steel, I realized. Something else. Didn't I read somewhere that an eye surgeons were using obsidian scalpels because they held an edge even sharper than steel? Was that what obsidian looked like? Okay, I said, still in English. I am ready for someone to suggest plan B. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 28, written by Sebi Loki. I don't know how long I stood there, frozen, facing off against three of them, maybe one or two seconds. I have a better idea of how long we stood there frozen, about thirty microseconds at a guess. Do you know what the difference between a military trained combatant versus a casual street brawler is? Neither did those three, thankfully. V crossed the room in a blur of motion. One moment he was standing next to me, and the next he was standing in front of the Captain Reynolds. I don't even think that he kicked the armor into enhance to do that. Lee was just that fast. Lee placed a hand on Reynolds' right hand and shoved him down, keeping the gun holstered. Reynolds did the obvious and tried to get up much harder to pull his pistol free. That was a mistake as Lee had the entire arm and that was still free. While Reynolds' attention was out where the back of Lee's fist struck him in the nose, Reynolds' legs crumpled as Lee tossed him the pistol aside. Without breaking stride, I only realized later that Lee was never standing still. He stepped up to Yakimo and punched the engineer in the stomach. Yakimo dropped and Lee shoved the falling body onto the top of scrape. She tried to roll to one side only to get caught up by the well-timed kick from Lee. I am describing events as if they happened sequentially, but in reality it may have all happened all at once with Lee superimposed in three places at once. There was a dull thud as Reynolds hit the deck, followed by almost immediately by a double thud of the other two crumpling. Lee disarmed the other two and stepped backwards a pace. Did I mention that Lee was armed? His pistol was right there in easy reach. The fact that he elected to instead step across the room and inflict a beatdown on all three of them without so much as breaking a sweat, rather than shoot them, told me two very important things. One, he didn't consider them much of a threat. Two, I have no idea what that drug was that the armor hit me with, but it allowed me to get the drop on that man, then I have praise. Chimera Pharmacology for permitting me to survive that encounter. Lee glanced over his shoulder and met my eyes. Plan A, he said simply. I cleared my throat. Anyone here still interested in getting their hands on some serious metal? I asked. Three groans of pain followed by three glances at centering on me. The three Daleks were for the taxi service to see their summer clothes character. I used the phrase... How for leather, for how fast I wanted them to take us there. But I'm not sure that translated. They just stared at me, so I tried again. Balls to the wall? I asked. That, they understood. Granted, contrary to popular belief, the term originated from an era of steam engines and has absolutely nothing to do with genitalia. Many old steam engines actually employed a very simplistic governor that used a centrifugal force to regulate the spin. Two weighted balls were attached on the arms that were allowed to swing outwards like pendulums. The faster the engine spun, the further out those weights were tossed. If it spun slow, the weight comes inwards. Therefore, if an engine was going full tilt, the weights would be tossed out to the maximum length and stay there. Balls to the wall. That said, the grin on Reynolds' face shot me countered me with an eye roll from Scrake led me to believe that the other two meaning was what they took it from me. I guess some things translated space and time. Three days, Reynolds declared. If we get direct line and don't stop, we can get to Newton in three days. I nodded. We should have enough food for all of us, I said. That was technical true. Technically. The armor's recycling, and as gross as it sounds, would also, for those of us wearing it, push the threshold of starvation a bit longer. If we restricted ourselves to one field meal a day, and that would be fifteen total for my friends and myself. Reynolds and his crew would probably need two or three a day. That was twenty-seven of them. 
So call it 42 field meals. 45 if you want to pad the figures for midnight snackers. Fine. The problem was that we had only 14 packed. Two per day for a week supply. That should equal 70 or roughly half again of what we needed. Except that we all ate last night and that meant that we'd already consumed 11. So we actually only had 59 for the trek. Again, that was enough for those of us wearing armor to eat two a day every now and then, but we would have nowhere near enough food for his return trip. One problem at a time, I decided. Reynolds, Yakimo, and Scrake modified for the moment, though Scrake did complain that Lee broke a knife when he stepped on it. I returned my focus to my companions. The professor was slumped in the corner of the room. Although I don't think that she was exactly on the verge of tears, I doubt the woman as tough as Medikai cries easily. She did look extremely upset. Had the samples hide her and patted the other woman on the shoulder in sympathy. Stupid! The professor cursed herself. I'm so stupid! They started asking questions all at once, and I started to lose track. I let something slip that I shouldn't have. She was speaking English, thankfully. I crouched down beside her. Hey, don't boot yourself up, I told her. I just as much my fault as it is yours. I was too busy planning our next step that I completely forgot that these folk may have their own agenda. She flashed me a brief smile of thanks, but her expression sank once more. I was annoyed on her behalf, which meant that... Lee, I said without looking up at him. Jason, he acknowledged. Whatever you're thinking about, I warned him, probably would be a very, very bad idea. We might never find the summer go person without the help of these people. He was silent for a moment. I came to the same conclusion, he admitted. I was just looking for potential loophole. There isn't one, I told him. I'd rather not make it in order. The air grew heavy around me. I can feel his gaze trying to burn a hole through my back of my skull. You think you can? He asked softly. Nope, I replied readily enough. After that little display, I have no illusions. That's why I'd rather not make it in order. There was a snort of barely suppressed laughter from the professor. The burning of my skull lit up. I wanted to relax, but I dared not let him know how tense I really was. I simply focused on the professor and casually took her hand and patted it. The smile lasted a bit longer this time. I was stupid, she replied, but the venom was gone this time. I didn't pick up the direction the questions were steering me until it was too late. Which direction was that? I asked. She sighed. The obvious ones, she said. Race relations. In this case, the term used a bit more literally than we're used to. We assume because there are three races present on the ship that there was somehow the norm. I looked to her and then the crew of the airship glowering at us from the far side of the room. Race, relations, four species were present on this airship and now they only had one present on Earth. Did you explain that at least one of these species had gone before humans hit the scene? I asked. I didn't get a chance and I'm not sure that it would matter, she admitted. I gather things are rather tense between the species. They just found out that all of their kind are dead on our world and reached the obvious conclusion. Time frames don't matter in such instances. Then think about it. If you stepped into a time machine and were whisked three billion years into the future and a robot greeted you by saying all humans except you are dead, how would you react? From your point of view, they were just there. She had a point. The human brain does find the things with certain scale, but when things really get huge or really small, our ability to process it just seems to break down. The scale of the sphere was still tripping me out, and there was a physical object that we could see and touch. How would any of us approach something as abstract as, while you were away for the last hundred thousand years, we've done some global housekeeping? Well... Fortunately, there is a readily available tactic when dealing with unpleasant news. In the corporate world, this tactic is known as blame-throwing. I spun around and faced the airship crew and tried to give them a disapproving glare. My glare skills are a bit rusty, but they are at least seem to be paying attention. My associate, I said speaking slowly and carefully, has been trying to explain to us where the misunderstanding originated. No misunderstanding, Ronald said. She told us that the Modge are the only humans left. 
Yes, I said, but you interrupted her before she could tell you that we were almost wiped out when someone dropped a killer plague on our planet. Now all the eyes were on me, including my own crew. Hopefully they would keep quiet. Well, I only really had to worry about the professor. The others could blather all they went all along as they kept it in English. A plague, Reynolds asked. A plague wiped out everyone but the march. That sounded dubious. I tried to wipe out the march too, I corrected him. Our kind was reduced to a few thousand survivors at one time. That was a half-truth. I had read an article, at one time there appeared to be a genetic bottleneck in some human species. We vary less than most other species. One theory that had been proposed compared the time frames with the bottleneck appeared to having first occurred as evidence of an eruption of a volcano. Mount Toba, I think it was called. It's true, humanity really had narrowly recovered from the near-extinction level event. The problem is that I'm fairly certain the time frames of these eruptions took place a few thousand years before the events of the third wave. Of course, I never specified when humanity was reduced to such a small number. I just left them fill in the blanks where they could. Who did that? Reynolds asked. A group called the Conflux, I answered. They were warring with the Changing Ones. They believed if they wiped out the soldiers of our world and provided the Changing Ones would be forced to retreat. They were right about that, wrong about it wiping us out. It has been a long and slow recovery, however. Reynolds glanced at the crew of the airship and they went into their own huddle. It didn't last long and the mood was considerably lighter. Sorry about that. Ranald said as he stood up and dusted himself off. Your friend was perfectly in his rights to sock it to me. I should have known. We'll head out at first light and take you to summer. Tell me, is this Conflux group still around? Because if they are, we'll do whatever we can to help you take them down. Fighting one thing but trying to wipe out humanity? That's messing with family. I kept my eyes fixed on him and pointedly did not look at Volson. Thank you, I said with a nod. We may need your help with that. He smiled. Hey, your friend in the weird suit is an interesting dance, he pointed out. Yes, she does that. How long until daylight? To my surprise, he withdrew the wooden pocket watch and stared at it. About five clacks, he said. How many clacks are in a day? Twenty. Why? So, assuming the day was roughly 24 hours, a clack would be only a little bit longer than an hour. Because we probably should try and get some sleep, I answered. Well, we can. He agreed with the sentiment, since our arrival made hooking up the hammocks impractical for him and his crew. Scrake and Reynolds elected to sleep in their chairs in the control room. Yakimo called up on the floor next to the five of us. It was a very, very tight fit. Jack ended up using my legs as a pillow which wasn't so bad. Yakima snored on the other hand, which was pretty bad. Granted, the noises coming from outside tended to drown him out. I hadn't really had time to notice before, but dinosaurs are loud. Really, really loud. Movies had not prepared me for this fact. In the movies, dinosaurs roar or growl. Occasionally, they make sounds like a blue whale but in reality it was more like having ten-ton birds screeching outside your window. We killed the lights and closed the shutters on the window. It was now pitch black inside the airship, but still, distressingly enough, way too noisy to formerly sleep. I dozed off a few times, but woke up soon afterwards, as what sounded like a giant crow began screaming contest with a macaw. It was a miserable night. Sometime before dawn, or rather, the lattice opening, I found myself awoken by a soft brushing my ear. I nearly crapped myself before I realized that it was a pair of lips whispering in my ear. Jason, Heather hissed, are you awake? Am now, I whispered back. There's something you need to know about me, she said. Please let it be that she has a crush on me since 8th grade. Please. Sure, I whispered back. She was quiet for a moment, so very quiet that I thought that maybe she had somehow managed to doze off again. I have a problem, she said. Please don't let it be explosive diarrhea. Not here. What's that? I asked. I never told anyone this, okay? She said. 
You have to promise not to tell anyone. Who could I tell? Okay, I whispered. I have anxiety, she replied. I didn't get it at first. We were stuck in an impossible physical structure billions of miles from home and surrounded by potentially hostile aliens, some of which wanted to destroy the Earth. Who wouldn't have anxiety? Then it hit me. Oh, I said. Ordinarily, I'd take something for it, she went on. Lexapro, I didn't mention it, because when I heard the ship could fix Lee's cancer and the professor's dementia, I thought... I thought... No, I repeated. She was probably getting tired of hearing that, but I couldn't think of anything else to say. Right now, she went on, the thought of being taken away from the door to the hangar is terrifying. I can't deal with it. I feel like we'll be lost forever and never find our way back. I'm scared. Don't say oh, don't say oh. Ah, I said instead. Moron. I felt her fingers clutch my bicep. Her grip was strong. Please, Jason, she said. I'm out of my mind. You've got to do something. Talk me down or something. I'm running in circles here. What could I tell her? I thought about it. Surprisingly, an answer of sorts came to me. Heather, I said, just repeat after me. Map on. Map on? She gasped and let go of my arm. Like me, she had taken off her helmet for comfort. She must have seen the glow come from it all the same, because she was suddenly reaching for it. I heard her fumble for a moment to put it on over her head. Jason, she said, all coloring her voice. You're a genius. I decided it wasn't such a bad night after all. The lattice opened some time later and the crew scrambled to their feet and started preparing the airship for flight. Other than the fact that Heather rather strangely refused to remove her helmet, there was no evidence of the conversation from the night before. Everyone focused on what needed to be done and I opened the windows to stare out into the light of the new day. I was greeted by the core of a sauropod that sounded remarkably like a peacock times 5,000. As I watched the forest's green head lift above the tree line, the airship began its own steady rise. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, chapter number 29 Like a lot of high school students, my classmates and I used to engage in the time-honored tradition of trying to get the teacher off topic. Act interested in some tangential topic, egg him on to talk about it, and then try to beat the clock by keeping him talking while not actually learning anything useful. My 11th grade history teacher, Mr. Lawrence, was famous for falling for this trick. You just had to ask him about history, anything in history, whether or not it had to do with the topic, and he'd just go off on a rant. One afternoon, while we were supposed to be learning about King Henry VIII, Kyle McNamara referred to the king as a blimp. As luck would have it, that minor fat joke was enough to get Lawrence rambling about the dirigible fleets of Germany. We pretended to be interested just to keep him going and, lo and behold, the bell rang saving us from having to hear about the House of Tudor. I don't remember much about the rambling lectures about dirigibles, save for the rather odd instances that USA was responsible for kidding the airship as a mode of transportation. According to him, the Zeppelin was considered acceptable method of travel up through World War II. They were the luxury cruise ships to the sky, as he put it. That was until the Hindenburg caught fire and everyone suddenly thought that strapping yourself to a spluttering gasoline engine, spinning a propeller was a safe option. How does the USA get the blame as others than Hindenburg exploding on USA soil with news cameras rolling? Because of hydrogen. Mr. Lawrence stressed that helium wasn't a new idea. Everyone knew that hydrogen was dangerous. The problem is that while hydrogen can be found anywhere that you find water, helium is much, much rarer. To point in fact of, it was so rare that the country that held the lion's share of helium at the same time of the Hindenburg was the USA, and it wasn't about to share it with the Germans. So they flipped the US the finger and went with as much more readily available gas and started taking on passengers. At the same time I heard this explanation, I recall not being entirely convinced that the USA had to take the full blame for the death of an airship. 
Now, having ridden one, I can confirm that Zeppelins have nothing on airplanes. After riding in one, I found myself lounging for familiarity of cramped seats, tiny bags of peanuts, and salesmen from Peoria who won't shut up. First of all, however long you think things should take you, you need to multiply that by eight. I was under no illusions that we would have a rapid takeoff, but for ten minutes I thought that we must still be tied down. The propellers at the rear and the gas bag were whirling away, but we weren't moving. I was getting ready to ask what the problem was when I noticed how frantically Yakimo was adjusting the control rods at the boiler. Steam power. Steam power is never in a hurry. It took half an hour to build up enough pressure to get the blades and propellers spinning fast enough to actually get the ship to move. Prior to that, the propellers were trying to keep the aircraft stationary. So, it wasn't a tender that was keeping us in place. Just good piloting. Even that didn't save us once we went aboard the tree line. Every breeze, no matter how tiny, seemed to cause the airship to buck and drift all course. If an Allosaurus farted, we'd have to adjust course. Airplanes have to adjust for winds, yes, but this was just ridiculous. We could be going full throttle in one direction and still end up going backwards if the wind hit us the wrong way. Or, worse yet, if it hit us on the side and shoved us laterally, we'd still be moving more or less in the right direction, but we were moving further and further away from the target destination. All in all, airship travel was a pain. On the other hand, it was still an impressive way to see Dyson Sphere. Reynolds had referred to the sphere as a labyrinth and, alternatively, the land of dinosaurs had an oasis. I didn't realize the scope of either comment until we were truly in the air. Balls rose up in the distance and I hadn't noticed them from the night before because of how dark it was then. But now that it was a full daylight, I was further up and I could see them in the distance. White, blurry lines that ran above the trees. I estimated the walls were somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 feet tall. They were also, at a guess, at least a hundred miles away. We lifted up and I saw more of the sphere. I saw that there was not an unusual arrangement. Enormous open areas that you could stuff most of New England inside, surrounded by walls of a maze-like network of branching hallways that connected with them. Two of these openings, or oases, could be right next to each other, and it would take hours or days to walk from one to the other by going through the labyrinth. The popularity of air travel made a lot more sense in that context. Some of this took it almost immediately. Some it wouldn't learn for a day and a half that it took us to cross the expanse of the dinosaur oasis. I spent a lot of time in the first day looking out the window. Part of the reason I did this was so that I could stare at the dinosaurs, which was, to put it in technical terms, extremely cool. Titanic beasts larger than elephants lumbering around us and bellowing bird calls at each other. Dinosaurs were a lot more colorful than I'd ever imagined. Malted purples and yellows were common enough themes, but some were electric blue. We were too high up for me to tell if the colors were the skin itself or if they were covered in tiny feathers, so, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to settle the debate once and for all. All I can really say is watching them move is disorienting. It was like watching an underwater dance. Each movement was slow, and there was a noticeable delay when the larger ones moved their necks. First, the part near the base of the neck would move, and then, slowly, the movement would go down the length of the neck until it had reached the head. It was like watching a whip crack in slow motion. Another reason I stood at the window was because it gave me the illusion of open space. There were just too many people in a small cabin. Reynolds and Scrake helped out as much as they could by confining themselves to the control room, but that still left seven bodies crammed into the space normally used by three. We were helped a bit by Volson and Heather claiming opposite corners of the cabin, sitting down and ignoring the rest of us. Wilson curled up to an almost ball, but it seemed to be too terrified to interact with anyone. Heather, on the other hand, spoke in brief monosyllabic sentences and kept her helmet shut. I did a mental inventory of my crew. First, there was the professor, 
recently cured of Alzheimer's. She seemed intelligent enough, but the night's display had me worried. I don't see how we keep the fact that Earth was currently had only one member of the Helmet of Family secret forever. Even if Lee, Jack, or Heather never figured out the language, I wasn't so sure that I couldn't keep the fact from slipping. So why had she beaten herself up about it so much? I felt I needed to approach her about this at some point, but I wasn't sure if I would ever find a good time. Next, we had Lee, a known alcoholic, possibly abused other drugs, also certainly suffered from PTSD. In the brief time that I had known him, he had gone back and forth between laid back and openly hostile. He was either so reserved that he was almost oblivious, too ready to cave in someone's head. There seemed to be no middle ground. He'd been the first to sign on with me. He was an apathetic man, an apathetic to life and to his safety. He just wanted a place to stay out of the cold and something to eat. Now he was ready to curb stomp people for making the professor sad. Another conversation I needed to have with this one, and I was especially dreading as I was growing less and less certain of Lee's triggers might be. Next, there was Heather. Smart and serious, she was also the only one of us that I knew of with an actual diagnosis, untreated anxiety. This trip on the sphere had set off some sort of anxiety attack, and she seemed to have retreated into a world of maps and the coping mechanism. The armor was meant to be used in battles, and as such, you could not always depend on your enemy being thoughtful enough to provide detailed maps of the territory. The armor tried to get around this by providing an option of real-time active mapping. It would send a ping out of sorts, and the scanner frequencies would try and build a map of the immediate area. As you moved, it would rescan and update the map as well as noting where you had been. The range and detail it provided were limited by factors such as how high up you were and when it started scanning and obstacles in the terrain, but the mapping did allow some degree of navigation in unfamiliar areas. Unfortunately, it also ate energy reserves faster than normal. Heather should be good for a while, but if I didn't break her out of this map-watching habit in a few days, she was going to seriously limit her armor's capabilities. Well, I guess it's lucky that I made her navigation officer. Then I thought of Jack. Orphaned, homeless, ready spoke, and when she did, there was a certain degree of cautiousness and paranoia mixed in. Then again, there she was an orphan raised on the streets. She seemed loyal enough for now, but could we count on her? Or was she unstable with her adoptive father, Lee? Another conversation that I dreaded. Lastly, we had Volson. My cowardly, overstimulated, and marginally uncooperative former kidnapper. She seemed almost catatonic in the stress of being airborne in an untrustworthy ship and surrounded by creatures that might decide to kill her at any moment. Her, I didn't feel any pressed to need to talk to. I sighed in exasperation. There was a very good chance that I may be the most sane person of this expedition. That was a worrisome thought considering my own failings. I was caught mid-muse by the sight of Lee ambling casually in my direction. I resisted the urge to curse. It was an inevitable situation in the ship with a small, and I'd bump into someone that I didn't want to talk to. I'd assumed the feeling was mutual, as all morning Lee had steadfastly refused to meet my gaze. That was fine with me, and I had stuck by my window as he, the Professor Jack and Yakimo, tried not to jostle into each other too much. Now he seemed to have changed tactics and was making a beeline for me. I watched him from the corner of my eye line, pretending to stare outside at a herd of yellow-green hadrosauruses. Jason, he said in a low voice, we need to talk. He was speaking English, so whispering had to be for the benefit of our companions. Wonderful. I'd ask you to step into my office, I said, but the floor's being redone. I nodded out the window. He didn't smile. Who do you think is the biggest threat? He asked instead. I was caught off guard with a sudden shift in the conversation and actually looked at him. Maybe because of my earlier ponderings, I thought he might be asking me who I was afraid of amongst our own crew, with an emphasis that it better be him if I knew it was good for him. But no, his attention was elsewhere. I could see that he was trying to watch the entire room at once. He wasn't asking about us. He was asking about the airship crew. Ah, uh, 
Me? I said slowly. You're the military guy. That's not really my... No games, he shot back, at the faint suggestion of irritation. You're smart, you're observant, and whatever you want to call it, your intuition, I guess, is generally spot on. Now come on, I'm serious. I can't shake the feeling that these guys are up to something, and I need to know what it is. I looked around the room. Yakimo was puttering around the boiler. Greg and Reynolds were up front in the chairs, forced forward, piloting the ship. None of them appeared to be paying attention to us. I looked back at Lee. He fidgeted slightly under my gaze. Maybe, he allowed, I'm paranoid. But if metal is as scarce as they claim, they knew we had two Dalek thingies and we promised them a third if they took us back to the summer girl her back. Two should be more than they can spend in a lifetime. Two lifetimes. A third is just getting greedy. They didn't even argue when we told them that they would have to leave them by the door to the hangar for now, as there isn't enough room on the ship for all of us and them. I frowned. The problem with dealing with paranoids is that it is hard to tell when they're onto something real, or if they're just contagious. Either way, now that he said it, I didn't like the way they felt either. It's been easy, he went on. Nothing's been easy so far, and I don't trust it. I thought about it and nodded. They also gave up just a bit too easily after taking that demonstration of yours, I said, thinking aloud. You think there might be a hurt feelings lingering? He winced. That was reckless of me, he said. We were better off when we were than unknown. Now that we've established that we can fight, we're ready for it. Um, thanks for talking me down later on, by the way. I brushed the comment aside and went back to the earlier question. The most dangerous? I asked, um, probably Scrake. He raised an eyebrow at me, an invitation to elaborate, I thought. Okay, I said. They obviously want us to think that Giacomo, him being the biggest and strongest, that would make a good guess. But he doesn't seem to be the fighter type. You knocked him down in the gut punch. Any fifth grader knows you tense up your abdominal muscles before getting into a fight. The fact that he didn't know that makes me think that he's not an actual knockdown drag out fights. Maybe he gets spy on intimidation. Lee rolled his index finger and middle finger in a silent plea for me to pick up the pace. Reynolds, I went on, doesn't seem to be a fighter. I don't know much about the Neanderthal anatomy, but I can see it varying too much from our own. That punch of yours should have broken his nose. It didn't, which means that he must have realized his mistake and rolled with the punch before it connected. You hit him hard enough for it to hurt, but not hard enough to take him out of the fight entirely. Lee frowned, but it didn't interrupt, so I went on. Scrake, I said at last, just sat there while the knife in her lap. I think she wanted to see how we would react. She saw you take out Reynolds and Yakimo, and when the engineer started to fall, she actually had the sense to roll away. If she hadn't rolled directly into your kick, she might have cleared it and still been armed. As it was, she got taken out with a knife got broken. She complained, but not too seriously. If that were her only weapon, I'd think they'd be more upset than that. Plus, there is that whole business of her watching us from the trees when we first met her. She likes to hang back and observe. He closed his eyes. Damn it, Jason, he said. Under his breath, I felt my cheeks grow hot. Look, I stammered, I told you I wasn't good at... I've been watching the wrong one, he continued as he opened his eyes and met my own. Why didn't you mention this earlier? I stared at him, slack jawed. You just asked me, I pointed out. I wasn't even thinking about it. Well, he said, maybe you should start getting into the habit. We need to find out what they're hiding and where. Control room, I blurted out. Reynolds and Scrake have barely left it since we got on board, and they've left everyone else out here. Also, if someone tried to hijack the ship, that would be the obvious place. He snorted once in the corner of his lips curled upward slightly. You were an office worker, he asked me. I nodded. He shook his head. What a waste, he muttered. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing for similar reasons. So now's the tricky part, getting a peek. He started to turn away when I grabbed his shoulder to stop him. He shot me a questioning look, curious but no hostile. Given a turn of events and the past few days, I was viewing that as an improvement. Send Jack over there, I told him. Okay, now he looked a bit hostile. His face darkened slightly with anger, but he was still listening. 
Send Jack over, I repeated. They've seen you fight and they're watching you. Tell Jack to walk over and look bored. She almost never speaks and I bet that they've already forgotten that just because she can't speak the language that she doesn't understand them. Have her hang around looking like a bored kid. Wait five minutes and then send the professor over to poke her head into the control room and ask a few nosy questions about where we're going. Have Jack wait another five minutes and then come back and tell us what they did. His face lightened up with a smile and crept again on his lips. Aye aye, Captain, he said, and what should I do? Stand by the boiler and try to look suspicious. He chuckled. Can do, he agreed, and turned to walk away. I let him go this time. I was captain again, huh? I shook my head and resumed staring out the window. Half an hour later, I felt trap on my shoulder. It was Lee. Rifle under the control panel, he said in a low voice. At least one knife beside Scrake's chair. I really hate being right sometimes. Suggestions, I asked. He thought about it. We could get them to shoot us and hope their fancy armor can protect us, he said. That should shock them into behaving. Too risky, I said. If they aim for the head, I don't know if the faceplate or the helmet can stop it. He nodded in agreement. Other suggestions, I prompted. He rubbed his chin in thought. We were better off with an unknown quantity, he repeated. Maybe not, I thought. Reynolds, I shouted to the control room. What? He shouted back. Do you really like those ration bars we have? He spun around in his chair and gave me a look that he thought I might have gone insane. Those things are terrible, he concluded. I looked out the window. Well, I said thoughtfully, those things out there looked good eating. Lee? Lee had guessed what I was thinking and was way ahead of me. While I'd been speaking to Reynolds, he stood silently next to me like a dutiful soldier. The moment I said his name and nodded out the window, the pistol was in his hand and a glaring flash of light burned the sky. The dinosaur had been a sauropod of a type I didn't recognize. If I had a textbook, I might have had a clue, but as it was, all I could say there was a four-footed, had a longer tail and a long mech, a lime green, dark blue body, and a charred and smoky lump where the head had supposed to be. It slumped down to the forest floor. It looked back at Reynolds, his face was white as a sheet. If you sat down, I'm sure we can barbecue that sucker. Probably get a few good meals out of it easy. Ah, uh, he stammered and looked down from me to Lee and back again. There's not really going to be good clearing around here. No problem, I said easily. Just let me know when you see a good spot and land, and we'll take one of them down there. No sense in dragging that heavy thing through the forest. Uh, right, I I'll keep that in mind. Okay, I said agreeably, but next time maybe we should use your gun. I think this one takes off too much of the meat. A nice shot to the eyeball with a regular pistol would probably leave much more meat intact. Or a rifle, if you have one. To his credit, Reynolds did not look towards his rifle. He kept his eyes on me and forced a smile to his lips. Yes, he agreed, of course, and with a beastie that big you can afford to waste a little bit of the skill. I clapped a hand on Lee's shoulder and shook the friendly manner. Yes, well, that's Lee for you, always thinking with his stomach. No matter how big the animal is, he wants to save as much of it as possible, because he doesn't know when he's going to get to eat again. I laughed at that, and Lee looked stoic. Reynolds looked like he wanted to be somewhere else. Madly, Scrake looked cautious. Good enough. I waved at them and looked out the window again. Lee murmured from the side of his mouth. How did you know I'd take out the dino in one shot? He asked. I wasn't sure, I said. They were used to living tanks and second wave, remember? I was mostly just hoping that you'd at least stagger it. He shook his head. I'm never playing cards with you, he said, walking off. I gripped the side of the window and tried to hide my shakes. The rest of the day played out fairly quietly. The professor came over to talk to me for a while, and I casually tried to steer the conversation towards last night's meltdown. She deftly changed the topic, and I got the message. She wasn't talking. Well, fine. As long as it didn't become a regular thing, I was okay with that. She eventually wandered off to talk to Lee. Whatever they talked about involved a lot of giggling on her part and some knowing smiles from him. Again, this worked fine for me. Jack was less talkative. She approached me only once and that was to get my opinion on how to distribute the field meals. 
I quoted my figures of day two from the non-armored people and one for the ones with armor. She silently handed out bars for lunch and the crew of the old serene for lunch and a few bars for everyone for dinner. What I am saying is that I was bored and the conversation choices seemed to be limited potentially homicidal sphere residents, catatonic alien and Heather. I chose Heather because, well, I want to say familiarity but I'm fairly certain breasts figured into this in some place. I slumped down on the floor next to her. Heather? I asked. Hmm? You awake? Mm-hmm, she answered. Doing okay? Mm-hmm. The ship's on fire. We're plunging to our deaths. Thought that you might like to know. That's nice. Heather, I asked, trying another topic. Hmm? Do you know how you can tell that Mick Jagger is in Scottish? Hmm? The lyrics to the song go, Hey you, get off my cloud, and not, Hey my cloud, get off my you. She was silent for a moment. Damn it, Jason, she snarled. I've lost my place now. Hi, Heather. I greeted her helmeted face. Hi, Jason, she replied. Any chance that you're going to go away? Any chance you'll take off your helmet and talk to me? She lifted the faceplate and glared at me. Jason, she said quickly. I don't have time to fool around. I'm updating the map and I think... Heather, I interrupted her. We're in an airship. Until we touch down again, it isn't really a matter of where we're on the map. We can't change things one way or another. She frowned at the comment. Jason, she said icily, don't do that. Don't make me feel like I'm crazy. I'm not saying you're crazy, I added quickly. I'm just saying that the map will update whether you're looking at it or not. It's okay to take off the helmet and talk to your friends for a while. She looked at me suspiciously but loosened her helmet. Fine, she said, but I'm putting it back on again soon. I'm trying to figure out how close the Newton town is to the dinosaur oasis. Can't be too far, I said. At the speed we're going, it may be next door. She shook her head. Now you're not paying attention, she said. Look at Scrake. I glanced over to the co-pilot chair and saw the hobbit was napping. I looked back at Heather and shrugged. So, I said. Remember that they said there was a three-day trip, she asked. I don't think that they meant three days with overnight stopping. I think that they meant three full days of travel. She's sleeping now to take a shift later. I started to shrug again and then stopped myself. Something was beyond the walls and making my navigator nervous about getting back. I slapped down my faceplate and called up the map. It showed a narrow swath of green under me. I cursed. Of course, I hadn't been actively running the map since we started. It didn't have the complete scans of the area like Heather's. Then again, did it need to? I searched my borrowed memories. Yes! It was possible to link up on a board computers, or whatever they called them in the armor. I called up Heather's map instead. The dinosaur oasis filled my faceplate, and I saw a green rolling expanse of dense vegetation intermixed with swamps. At the far edge of the map, I saw white lines representing the labyrinth's walls. Beyond that was a narrow expanse of blue. The map updated, and the expanse of blue grew wider, and another update, wider still. We're going to go out over an ocean, aren't we? I asked her. She put her helmet back on and slammed her faceplate down for an answer. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 30, written by Sebi Loki. Next two days were some of the longest of my life. I was afraid to sleep at night for the fear that I'd wake up to find my sound plummeting to the waters below. With the last sight that I beheld being the grinning face of Reynolds leering at me from an airship. None of which actually happened. The food bars were passed out, Yakimo tended the boiler, while Scrake and Reynolds took turns piloting the airship. By studying Heather's map, I determined that I had seriously underestimated the scale of things by a lot. The dinosaur oasis wasn't a hundred miles across, it was hundreds of miles across. Converting the chimeric units to miles per hour was tricky once one system of measurement was derived from arcane quantum movements of atoms, and the other was based on the point of some ancient English moron who tired of walking. I'll leave the rest to figure out which is which. Anyway, by estimation, the airship was trucking along at roughly 30 miles per hour. That's just a rough estimate that I came up with based on the chimeric units of distance the angle of the ship and the fact that we were moving at about twice as fast as most of the dinosaurs out that were walking 15 miles per hour, 
sounded reasonable for the way they were doing it. Look, I'm an office worker. I don't know how far a mile is. I just know that I'd rather do it in a car than walking. My point is, 30 miles per hour seemed like a good guess. The days here seem to be permanent equinox of 12-hour days and 12-hour nights. Or, having native units, 10-day clacks with 10-night clacks. 30 times 24 is 720. It took us a day and a half to cross the expanse, which puts it at rough a thousand miles. Or, to put it another way, if the oasis was on Earth, one could be in a Canada and they'd be speaking Spanish by the time that you reached the other wall. It was huge, larger than anything that I had ever seen before that wasn't floating in space. Yet, the oasis was just one of many continent-wide gardens set aside of snapshots of the history of Earth. At midday the next day we were over the ocean. I tried to remain vigilant for whatever mischief the crew and the all serene had planned for me, but hours later we were still just trekking over the wide expanse of the blue with no hint of hostility. I stared out the window. Maybe there was a special place that they were looking for. Some bottomless trench filled with prehistoric leviathans that used dental floss to remove whales from their teeth the size of skyscrapers. The lattice closed and the world was dark once more. Reynolds took over the scrake, stepped away from the control and, and stretched. She walked over to the door of the airship and pushed it open. I raced myself and she undid a button in her skirt and... Oh well, next time I find my shop in an airship with internal plumbing... I turned away and stared at the wall to give her some of sense of privacy. Don't think I don't see you peeking handsome, she called out to me, but you might want to give me half a clack to scrub up first. I rolled my eyes. I thought I was the ugly one, I counted still without turning around. Now don't tell me that you were taking that seriously, she said. The captain does that. He calls the tall one shorty and the tiny one stretch. And the handsome one's ugly, I asked. No, she admitted, but still you shouldn't take it personally. I continued to look at the wall. You practically jumped out of your skin every time me or my friends moved, she pointed out. If we didn't have such a long history, I'd almost think that you suspected us of something. I stepped over to the window and looked out. It was too dark to see the waters below. Not a water down there, I said dryly, just for contrast giving all the way below. Oh, that there is, she agreed, and it gives us the shakes too. Ordinarily, we would take the land route swinging the south and follow the coastline. Adds another eight days, but if you start losing gas, you can at least land without a splash. I turned around finally and met her gaze. She had buttoned her skirt back up and the dusting her hands off. Want to help me with the door? she asked. Lee and Jack were still awake, at least, so the odds were good she was probably wouldn't try shoving me out. Still, I couldn't help but feel that there was a target on my chest as I stepped to the edge of the craft and reached out into open sky to catch the handle of the door. Oh well, I'll be in Newton by lattice close tomorrow. She told me, stick with us that long and you can see you can trust us. A long time to wait for a constantly on edge. She strolled back to her seat and dozed off. I climbed into the corner and tried to make myself comfortable. Should I make a schedule for us to sleep in shifts to make sure that none of us lost sight of these things? Wait... Volson didn't sleep. Did I need to disturb her others when she had a paranoid alarm clock ready to scream for help at the first sight of trouble? I was still rolling the idea around in my head when I dozed off. I dreamed that night that I was in an airship. Well, I really was in an airship, but this one looked more like the photographs that I saw inside the Hindenburg. I saw myself sitting at a table. Across the room from me was dressed in some sort of uniform. I tried to step closer and he, I saw, me, coming. I, he, waved and shouted something to me. It sounded like he was saying something about dairy. Was my dream self-lactose intolerant? Before I could find out more, I was jostled awake. I started to look around to see what had shaken me. No one was near me. The ship shook again. Just turbulence, it seems. Yakimo sat in front of the boiler and was brushing off his Fu Manchu moustache while a white comb. From where it sat and looked like he was made out of bone. Bone? Why the hell not? No real metal to speak of in this world. Instead of taking my accustomed spot by the window, I spent most of the day attempting to doze. I half hoped that I'd see the dream double again if I did. 
The closest I got was a dream where I was in a soap opera and I had an evil twin. Since I had to play both parts in the dream, I was constantly running behind the set, either to slip on or take off a wig. I gave up and went back to the window. The gas bag made it almost impossible to see the sun in the world, but no matter where you chose to stood, it was directly overhead, after all. But sometimes, when the ship was pushing in a stray breeze or the captain turned sharply, I caught a glimpse of it. When I did, I could also see the lattice. The lattice was always visible no matter what time of day it was. In the day light hours, the panels separated and rotated until they were perpendicular to the sun and land. Most of the day, it looked almost like it was sun was surrounded by a giant honeycomb. At night, the panels rotated back and the panels slipped closer together. The latter seemed to be impossible. How could such a structure exist? The outer shell of the Dyson Sphere was impossible in its own right, but it didn't have to separate or move. How could this inner sphere stay intact? Wouldn't the stresses of opening and closing tear it apart? When it opened, did it move to a higher orbit and then to a lower one when closing? Was that even possible? More mysterious from a place that seemed designed to be nothing but mysterious. An arm touched my elbow and I saw Jack was handing out evening meals. Dinner time already? Then that meant... I leant out the window and a line of jutting out from the swatch blew ahead of us. We were reaching the edge of the ocean. It still took hours and I was afraid the lattice would close and we'd be plunged into darkness before we arrived. But no, with less than a clack according to local time, before the lattice closed, Reynolds took us over the wall. We were easily 200 feet up in the air, probably more, yet the top of the wall nearly scraped the hull as we passed. I had been too distracted to pay attention to the first wall that we crossed when we left the dinosaur oasis. But this time, I was at the window and had a chance for a good look. I wasn't sure what I expected to see, but the reality was much stranger. The walls were white as snow, the base was wider than the city block, and they tapered to a round point, not much wider than the airship was long. The wall was also cracked and chipped in several places. Fissures filled the rubble of centuries of decay zigzagged their way through the surface. Though the walls were ancient but already fading, yet everything else in this world seemed much hardier. Did that mean something? I considered it as the airship crossed the oasis and began drifting downwards at an angle to the wall. We had arrived in Newton. Newtown looked a lot like I imagined an 18th century London might look like. Squat brownstone buildings with shattered windows and cobblestone streets winding between them. There were even gas light lining the streets. All it needed was a Moriarty as a sprint by with a man in a deerstalker hat giving chase to a really set the mood. But I saw no metal, no matter where I looked. No brass fittings, no copper tubes, or even line lampposts. Just wood and the odd ceramic that I had seen earlier. Yakimo had revealed to me earlier in the flight that one of the most precious resources in this world was a type of iron wood that was extremely durable and impact resistant. The D stone buildings hide iron wood frames. Reynolds turned to the left and slowed the craft down. Soon I saw our destination. A wide open field with an anchor moorings hammered into the ground. An airship landing field. Dozens of other airships much larger than the all is serene were already either anchored or circling in search of a good landing spot. Reynolds flew past the field towards a smaller field just beyond. This one was little more than trampled grass. I looked over at Yakimo, who was stationed in his accustomed spot by the boiler. We rent this space from the Nedetic Kin, he explained as he caught my glance. They watch the ship and see to the upkeep. Who? I asked. Gypsy engineers, he explained. I didn't get it, but then again I didn't have to. As we pulled closer, a half-dozen teenagers and young men of different geomonid species ran out of long buildings and raced towards our dangling mooring lines. They all wore either leather helmets with goggles covering their eyes, otherwise they wore all manner of costume from grease-stained coveralls to almost nude save for a pair of threadbare shorts. Yet each one secured the ropes with well-practiced ease and the airship came to a stop with barely a shudder. 
The rope ladder was lowered and we were all on the ground before the lattice plates had even started the laborious rotation. We stood there for a few moments on the edge of the field waiting for the captain to make his arrangements with the kin. As we stood there, Scrake glanced in our direction and swore. Better seek cover now, she said. Pilgrims are headed this way. What? I asked. Zona's looking to convert, she said before disappearing into a crowd of Nordic kin. I turned to the other direction to see that I could see the pilgrims Scrake had warned us about. That turned out to be no problem. They were standing right in front of me. Eight people, all Moj, standing before us. Two women and six men. All wore long purple robes. None of them looked like they had eaten a decent meal in some time. One of them, a sallow-faced man with a bald head and an unkempt grey beard, stepped forward. Have you heard about the true zone of the Changing Ones? he asked for me. For it is written in the tomb of a sire that this is a world but a test, a construct by the almighty Changing Ones. If he starts talking about wicked, I said in English to Lee, you have my permission to shoot him. What does the Wizard of Oz have to do with anything, he asked me. Never mind, I said, and I looked at the man. Actually, I said, we were wondering if you heard of the true faith of the reincartographers. The man's eyes had rolled towards the sky in supplication, but now rolled back to focus on me. I am not familiar with that faith, he admitted. He opened his mouth and inhaled as if he was preparing to continue with the sales pitch. Oh well, I said quickly in a preemptive interruption. We are the gazetteers of the true word. The man blinked. Beg your pardon, he stammered. We of the recontographers' faith know that this world is one. Is that not so? Yes, the man agreed. And as beings of the sphere, we are a part of the sphere. So we too are one with the sphere. Is it not a true as we are one with the sphere to sphere in its worth as all? Um, I suppose, he said. But we of the true zone... As we with the spear, I said, all this time but one, a great serpent eating its own tail. The man tilted his head to one side and shot me a puzzled look. Why would it do that, he asked. Probably just peckish, I said, with a shrug. But as all land forms a sphere, so too must time itself. There is no life or death, merely the passage within the sphere. Wait, one of the women, a flyish looking woman with missing teeth, my mom died half a year ago. You're trying to tell me that she's still alive. Yes, I went on, getting into the swing of things, but passed on to another form. We are born time and time again within the sphere and the sphere of time. As with the sphere, you must have a map to guide you. We provide the maps not only for your life, but how your past lives as well as your future lives. Time is an illusion. An illusion caused by the inability to see more than our current location in time and space. But, with a proper map, you can see all. That's nice, the first pogrom said again, but we're talking about the future of all humanity and- Yes, I shouted, the future and the past. All is mapped out and was not for the sacred word delivered to us by the four cardinal points. The what? The cardinals who lead our faith, I said rolling my eyes back my head and raising my hands to the sky. The four cardinals need us. Look here, the man said as he balled his hands and placed them on his hips. I don't know what you're going on about, but, uh, ah, I said as I lowered my head and favored him with an indulgent smile. Then you are aware of our great tragedy. Then you are aware of our great tragedy. What tragedy? He asked by reflex a moment before his eyes went wide as he realized his mistake. The imposter, I said haughtily. For years we suspected the Cardinal North was not the real Cardinal. We searched for many years to locate the true North. When we did find him, he was very sad. It turned out he died many years before. Sorry to hear that, but uh, in the tropics, I said, of cancer, the pilgrim gave up. Why don't we just let you and your friends go about your business for now, he suggested. We have a big meeting every week on last day in a big temple down the town square. Come and join us if you like. Yes, I said. We shall bring the maps. Do you do that, he said, as he retreated a step with a pained smile false to his lips. 
He gripped the shoulders of two of his companions and half dragged them away. Once they judged that they were out of arm's reach, they turned and won and fled the area. What in the world? The professor asked in a low whistle. My mother, I explained, looking up. You hear enough cult philosophies, you start packing it with you. Like cargo? He asked. He yelped and Heathers kicked him. Reynolds chose that moment to part company with the kin and marched towards the street. He waved one hand to signal us to follow him. I took the lead. My group instinctively surrounded Volson to shield her from as much possible from wandering eyes. We walked down the side street and over the green space occupying a square between several shops. Reynolds started down the alleyway and we followed close behind. On the other side of the alley it seemed to relax a bit. Not many people travel this area, he explained, especially at night. Less chance of being seen here. He shot a significant glance at Volson. Why is that? I asked cautiously. Is this section of town unsafe? No, he said. This area is a ghetto for the strangers. Again, I got a weird layered translation from the UX ghetto. The word is actually said was closer to partitioned quarter, but the symbiote was trying its best. Strangers, we must be nearing the summer glow, woman. As if that were a cue, Reynolds pointed at a two-story building directly in front of us. A wooden stair ran close to the side of the building to a door on the second floor. Up there. He led the way once more as I followed close behind. The wooden stair shifted slightly under the combined weight of so many climbing together, but it still felt sturdy enough. Reynolds pushed to open the door at the top without knocking. The room beyond was dark. Outside it was not much brighter, but the start I realized that the lattice was almost fully closed. I stepped inside without thinking about it. Then I froze in shock at the sight that I beheld. The others pressed in behind me a moment later. I was too stunned to move out of the way, so they simply shoved me to the side. It was Volson who naturally broke the silence. Jason Reese, she said. Those symbols written on the walls look like the letters from your alphabet. She was right. Specifically, it was my name written over and over again along the surface of the room written by a shaky hand with some sort of red liquid. Well, he said, clapping his hands together. Been fun hanging out with you guys, but I forgot that I have a pressing need to flee. I was right behind him with that suggestion. We spun around to face the door. It was closed. Standing between us and the door was a slender woman with a haggard face and a long hair that looked like it had been combed with washed in weeks. Jason, she hissed while without looking up. You have come at last. She spoke in English. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 31. Written by Sebi Loki. Do you know that sort of deep-seated panic you get when you walk into a strange location and find an emaciated and clearly mentally disturbed young woman has written your name in blood all over the walls? No? Just me. Well, let me describe it to you. No, no, I insist. This is such a singular experience that I would hate to deprive everyone of it. First off, let me just lay this out there. There is no real defense mechanism in your entire arsenal of tools to deal with pure madness. Humans are, and probably will be, at least on some level, a rather primitive animal. We like obstacles. We can club over the head with a rock until it goes away. Faced with an unspeakable monsters from the outer depths of space, hit it with a rock until it's a squishy puddle you feel comfortable speaking about. Boss wants you to use a new TPS report. Drop a rock on his head until he changes his mind. Alvis rises from the grave and wants a hunker hunker your brain. Kick him in the rhinestones and drop rocks on his head until he ain't nothing but a ground blob on a parking lot of grime. The point is, we're good at dealing with threats we can see. Threats that bleed. We understand our place in the universe in relation to them. We either drop rocks on them, or they drop rocks and or claws or fangs on us. No matter how scary the monster is, if we can hit it with rocks, we feel a lot more comfortable around it. Things we can't club make us nervous. Diseases scare us, not as much as they used to, 
Antibiotics aren't a very impressive club, but if you take a couple pulls and suddenly you send a life-threatening illness running for the hills, we're pretty content with that arrangement. Diseases that we can't send running to the pills, injections or even risky surgeries scare us. The threat is there, but nothing we can do will hurt it or even scare it. The idea of having our bodies torn to pieces by a threat that we cannot even see terrifies us. Having the same thing done to our minds, that sends us screaming for the hills. The girl who faced me was clearly broken. I don't mean that she had a sad life. I mean something very critical inside was broken and the remaining gears were either spinning free or rocking down hard and sending a shower of sparks out. She stood there at the door and possibly still. Her eyes didn't blink, forcing me to try and keep my own open, lest that momentary flicker gave her an opening that she was looking for. Of course, she may have blinked while I was refusing to look into her eyes. Something was very wrong with those eyes. I couldn't even put it into words, but what was looking at me was not human and had not been for some time. She was thin, almost frail-looking, straining with a threadbare shift draped over her skeletal frame like a dressing gown on an animated corpse. Her lips, if she was still capable of smiling, had probably once been full. Now they were chapped and bloody, twisted and snarled that no human face would be capable of. Worst of all was her abdomen, red-stained and damp. She had been clawing into her own stomach to fashion her rink. Jason Reese, she hissed again. Then, almost in a sing-song voice, she continued as if reading a poem. Jason Reese, Jason Reese, the whispers and the screams, the dreamers, the schemers, the whispers, the whispers never cease, never sleep. Always with the whispers, the whispers. Yep. Uh, it was Reebok's time. I took a step back and prepared myself to charge over the top of her to go through the door. That's when Renault stepped between us. He wasn't facing me. He was facing the thing that had been the girl. He gripped her, its shoulder, and did the most reckless thing that I've ever witnessed a sentient being, human or otherwise, do. He looked right into her eyes. Summer, he said, he's oddly heavy with concern. You've not been taking your medicines. She switched to the native language. Ran out, she said. Apothecary is so far. Away and down and around and gone. Can't step away from my work for so long. He looked up with the words scrawled across the ceiling and grimaced. I see that, he said, shooting a tone. You've also spilled your paint all over your gown. Paint? And looked at the walls again. It wasn't blood. Just a thin and runny red paint. I relaxed slightly. I mixed it with my own blood, she said cheerfully. And the tension ratcheted right back up again. Reynolds stroked her hair and she flashed him a brief smile. I'll be better soon, she declared. All better now that Jason Reese is here. Reynolds turned to eye me. He narrowed his eyes at me. It wasn't quite accusing me, but it was in the same neighborhood. Just like that missing piece of the puzzle fell into place. Why would a trio of merchants go off on a wild goose chase to a dinosaur-infested land with next to no supplies and a word of a psychic? The answer was obvious. They knew her, or at least Reynolds did. The latent distrust, the ominous refusal to stray too far from their weapons, the ready agreement to fly without even loading up the metal. It had made sense if I added just one small assumption. What if they thought I was doing this to her? Oh dear, Reynolds, I said, holding up my hands to show that they were empty. We are not doing this, I swear it to you. We did not know about this. He didn't look entirely convinced, but he didn't argue with me either. Summer spoke up again. It's not him, she whispered. It is him who whispers in my head. We both looked at her in confusion. She switched to English and again the same sing-song voice that she had been following. In the deadless path without a clue or a bull, to find you must best she, the crossover world to that went the untested night. Reynolds looked sickened. She's been speaking gibberish for days, he apologized. It's getting worse. It's not gibberish, I offered before immediately correcting myself. But it is. But it's our language. How can she know it? No one in this world should be able to speak it. He rocked his head at the dot Dyson Sphere manner, indicating the negative. I don't know, he said. 
She just started doing it a couple of pauses ago. Now I felt ill. A pause was a Spherian time unit. Since they never had to deal with the Roman Empire and the quibbles between their two emperors with the calendar was a bit similar. There were ten months called Pausa. That is both singular and plural, and in case you were curious, with 36 days apiece. That left five days left over in the year, which were separated by from the pauses. They were New Year, first of four, half year, third of four, and end of year. Each of these days was considered a holiday. When I was first told about this, I assumed that they never dealt with leap years. Then I heard a passing reference to New Year occasionally being celebrated over two days. Each pause was eventually divided into six-day weeks, and one confusing part of some folks called these weeks five days because, traditionally speaking, people work for five days in a row and then take the sixth one off. But at least other naming confusion didn't really kick in until you were at a weekly level. Two pause ago would have been about the time I started having dreams about this place and its coordinates. I did not think that this was a coincidence. When did she start saying my name? I asked. He looked at me clearly puzzled, then his eyes widened. Jason Risha, he said in a low voice. I could tell by the odd way of his mispronouncing it that he was trying to replicate the sounds he had first thought were gibberish. Words that were actually in a language that he had never belonged to this world. Someone tapped my shoulder. I glanced over in annoyance and met the gaze of the professor. May I? The doctor gestured past me. I stepped to one side to give a room to question Reynolds. She spoke to Summer Glow instead. Summer, she said in English surprisingly. How do we get to this tower? Tower? The coyote of the steps, I see, the professor said shaking her head. But where do we find that? Vija. The professor looked confused. I was interested now. I grabbed her shoulder, but rougher than I should have, and I will admit, and spun the professor to face me. Why did she just say that? The professor was taken back. That name means something to you? She asked. Yes, it's from Star Trek, I said. Now why did she say that? Star Trek? The professor asked. Greek mythology, poetry, pop music, and now television. What are you talking about? I asked. How can you possibly understand this? The professor frowned and looked up to meet Reynolds' eye. Is there something I can write with here? She asked. This would be easier to explain if I could write it down for you. Write it down? I asked. Reynolds, however, didn't question her and stepped over to a small chest occupying the corner of the room. I hadn't noticed it earlier, but there was a couple of such chests spread out across the room each one looking a tiny pirate treasure chest without the metal bindings. Reynolds swung open the lid and one returned with a paper and a pencil. Ha! <laughs> Some things were universal. Madakai took both gravely and dropped to the floor. This, she said and quickly jotted down a few words, is probably what you heard her say. In the daedalus path without a clue or a pull, to find he, you, must be she, to cross other world to that went to the untested night. But the professor went on. This is what she actually said. In the daedalus path without a clue or a pull, to find he, you must be a sede, to cross the other world to the went to the untested night. Well, she was mostly right about the first part, except I had no idea how to spell Daedalus. I shrugged and looked at her. She tapped the first part. Daedalus is from Greek mythology, she said. He's a great inventor. We mostly remember him now as the father of Icarus. The kid with the wings, I asked. She nodded. Right, she said. He flew too close to the sun with the wax and he melted over the wings. Why did he do that? Reynolds asked. It was only then that it dawned on me that she was speaking in Severian so that it to include Reynolds in our discussion. It's a myth about taking chances, she explained. He wouldn't listen to his father and flew too close to the sun. Sounds more like a myth about a father not equipping your idiot sons with wings, Reynolds countered. Be that as it may, she said, tapping the paper once more to draw attention to it. Daedalus was also the man credited for creating the labyrinth in Crete where the Minotaur was trapped. This part she directed solely at Reynolds. The Minotaur, she explained, was a monster who had the head and tail of a bull. He was slain by the hero Theseus, who was used the ball of yarn to find his way back out of the labyrinth. 
She touched the paper again with the word clue. Ball of yarn, she translated. No clue or bull, now I get it. The labyrinth here, yeah, I said. She's talking about the labyrinth here. Yeah. The professor nodded. I think the first part means in the labyrinth, the professor said. But, Reynolds injected. The professor cut him off. The second part is a little easier, she went on. Sidhe means an Irish mythology. You rarely hear it anymore except as Banshee. So what? I asked. Sidhe is another word for owls. No, wait. Not just owls. Fairies. She's saying that the labyrinth is in fairy. The professor nodded again and touched the third line. An untested knight, she went on, used to be referred to as a childer. There was a poem of Browning called, It was Lee turns to interrupt. Georgia Rowland went to the Dark Tower, he gasped. I looked at him, he shrugged. I'm a Stephen King buff, he said. That poem formed the basis of the Dark Tower series. I looked at the words again. And the other world, I asked. A land occupied by fairies, she said. Time is supposed to run slower there. I nodded. Go to the labyrinth, I translated, to the land of fairy to find him. Him is not explained right now. You must best the Sidhe, cross their land, and find the dark tower. The professor nodded. I think that's what she's saying, she said. All close enough. But from what Reynolds told us, this fairy place is on the other side of the sphere. We would never get there in the ship. So I asked how to get there, and she said, Coyote and the step, I asked. She wrote the word, step. On the paper, in the early 20th century, the professor went on, a German novelist by the name of Hesse wrote a book which gave him the name of Kyoto on the steps. She wrote the name of Steppenwolf. Magic carpet ride, I said, now getting into the swing of things. We get there on a magic carpet. The professor nodded. Jack squirmed. The book is about a magic carpet, she asked. Lee rolled his eyes. Jack, he said at last. When we get back, I need to introduce you to the classics. Stephen Wolf is a band, I told Jack. I guess they got their name from the book. Jack grimaced. Great, she muttered. More antique music. I decided to ignore this comment, as murdering Jack probably would just delay things. And you asked where we would get the magic carpet. And I went on, and she said, Vija. The professor agreed with a nod, which I didn't understand. But apparently you do. I did understand the reference, just not the significance it might be. Vija, I told her, is the name of an entity that is heading for Earth in Star Trek The Motion Picture. It turns out to be Voyager satellite that got lost and was now returning to Earth to complete its mission. The professor wrinkled its brow. Its mission, she asked. To learn about the universe and tell Earth about it, I explained. When I got lost, I was too discovered by an alien machine species that helped by, by... I trailed off by outfitting it with a ship so that it could head back to Earth, Heather added, picking up where I trailed off. Something from Earth using an alien ship to get to where it was going faster, I said. We're idiots. Excuse me, Reynolds interrupted, but why doesn't Summer say these things instead of speaking in riddles? The professor looks like she was about to answer, but unfortunately Lee nudged her and distracted her long enough to catch my expression. Not sure, I said aloud. Something getting jumbled up. Maybe she's getting confused. The professor looked unhappy, but didn't challenge me. Heather shot me a questioning look, but Lee and Jack remained stoic. They were either aware of the minefield that we had wandered into, or, more likely, had enough awareness of the situation to keep their faces neutral and not openly question me where we were being watched. I would have to speak to the professor and Heather about that later. Reynolds was clearly close to Summer. Friends, maybe more. Maybe seeing his friend in such a state was distracting him, or, possibly, the references were so far outside his frame of reference, he still didn't see it. The message wasn't a puzzle. It was bait. The phrases were specifically targeted to us, to our interests, even to the fact that he used puns was just bouncing the hook to entice us. The conclusion was obvious. Summer hadn't picked up English in a few parser. Summer Glow wasn't home anymore. Whatever we were talking to was not Summer. She had been turned into a transceiver for whatever it was that wanted us to go to the ferry. I switched over to English. Something wants us to go to the ferry and some tower there, I said, maybe a bit unnecessarily, and there seems to be a possibility that we may not be warmly welcomed. 
Great, Lee said. So how do we fit the ship through the airlock? I shrugged. Maybe there's a loading bay somewhere, I suggested. You want to search the entire sphere looking for it, he said. Or, I went on, maybe we carry it through the airlock. We fold it up like Volson ship. That will not work, Volson said. The Chimera lacks such technology. It is one of the few areas where the Comflux are more advanced. I cursed. Okay, I said, Volson shuttle, we take her craft and... My shuttle is badly damaged, Volson interrupted. Besides, it's too small to accommodate all of us. I put my tongue to bestow an urge to scream. Fine, I said. We repair your shuttle and expand it and... And then the matter compression will cease to work, Volson said, once more interrupting. I do not think you understand the mechanism. The compression takes place because the matter is used as unstable projection of energy into coherent matter. The energy is stored in the archetype of the... Okay? I said, no lectures. I get it. Any alterations to the ship mean that it won't fold up anymore. Great. I guess we're back to looking at the freight entrance. Why don't we alter it once we carry it over? Jack asked aloud. We all stared at her. Beg pardon? I asked. Well, she said, we don't need to use the ship to get us back into space, just to cross the sphere faster than a normal airship. We have lots of those dolly-like things, and we already know where the gypsy engineers live in the city. Why don't we just go back to Tyre, grab Volson's ship, and whatever other supplies we need, come back here and another doll thing, and have them turn the shuttle into something we can ride in. Volson even seemed stunned by the suggestion. I was suggesting dropping a frame over the shuttle, she asked, using it to ferry the craft from the local design. Yes, Jack said with all the defiance of a twelve-year-old could muster across her arms over her chest. Why not? Well, it would make the ship slower and far more clumsy. Such a frame would also need much design and tolerance and stresses, but in theory, it should be possible. I breathed out a sigh of relief. Okay, I said. That's one problem down. Now for the other biggies. Other problems? Heather asked. She glanced off to the side where Reynolds and Summers still stood. I ignored this. Yes, I said. Problem one is something wants us to go to Ferry. Whatever it is, the thing seems to be powerful enough to hijack Summers' brain. Um, uh, Jason, Heather said. Just a moment, Heather, I said. Let me get this out of the way first and then you can talk. If it can hijack Summer's brain, it's pretty safe to say that it's something we probably don't want to mess with. So now we have to decide if it's a bigger danger to go in or to make it angry by ignoring it. Jason, Heather said again. Heather. I said, you will have your turn. Other big problem is Captain Reynolds as his merry men. Right now, they're cooperating with us because they think that we can make them rich and cure their friend. Now, we can do the first, but the second probably isn't happening. I recommend stalling here, lie if you have to, until we figure out the course of action to keep our distance in English so that we can maintain some privacy and... And we're not the only ones who speak English, Heather blurted out. What? I said before I caught her meaning. I spun to face Reynolds. Summer had her lips pressed close to his ear and was whispering, presumably translating what we were saying. I'm not sure how faithful it was though because that was about the time he drew his gun and shot me. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 33 Spherians would use wooden bullets with ceramic jackets. I figured that out, but the first one collided with my chest plate, and I got a mouthful of splinters. The bullet was slower moving and packed less of a punch than earth ballistics. I later found out that even with rifles, accuracy dropped off pretty quickly, even at modest distances. Sphering guns were meant to be used in close range and aimed at center mass. To compensate for the fact that their bullets packed less kinetic energy, Sphereans had apparently decided to focus their efforts on maximizing the rate of fire. Instead of one heavy bullet fired fast, they fired a lot of lighter and slower bullets. Which is why, even though I was already moving, Reynolds' second shot struck inches away from my first impact site. The second bullet had probably left a muzzle before the first one had even struck home. The third bullet hit my shoulder, and then I had finally succeeded in twisting and falling to one side. The armor had barely registered the impacts, and that was good. I'd left my helmet on the ball as serene. That was very, very bad. 
I tucked my head down to my chest and rolled my back towards Reynolds. I tried to take stock of my companions. Bolson's suit offered almost no protection at all, and she would be in the highest concern. I found her squirming on the floor under a pile of bodies. Heather and Professor had tossed the alien to the floor and were now lying on top of her face down with their hands covering the backs of their own heads. Considering the fact that the room was every little bit of way covered, it was probably a sensible move. Unfortunately, it also meant the three of them were effectively pinned themselves down until the shooting stopped. I scanned the room for Lee and Jack. Lee and Jack both apparently jumped towards Reynolds. If he were only an obstacle to fight, it would be over. Unfortunately, if you hear gunfire, was some sort of signal as the door to the room almost seemingly being kicked in and two shooters came through, the door carrying shotguns. Again, small and slow moving pellets, even without the armor, would probably face a 50-50 chance of surviving the encounter if we stood more than 30 feet away. The problem was that the room was much shorter than 30 feet in length and all of us had left our helmets behind. Jack and Lee covered their faces with their hands and charged blindly towards the shooters. Something that smoked and sizzled was tossed through the open doorway and onto the floor. Mom! I shouted. Jack and Lee dropped. I followed suit a moment later and the three were already on the floor. No explosion, but there was a lot of smoke. Smoke bomb, I choked out. Now we were in a tiny enclosed space full of the smoke and a hail of bullets coming down on us. Let's see... What would MacGyver do? Probably yank up the floorboards and build a motorcycle out of duct tape and his wristwatch. Okay, what would Lee do? Grab his pistol and fire back in the direction of the door. Just because we couldn't see that they were there didn't mean that we didn't know where they were going. There was only one exit to the room. Me! I shouted without looking up. We need to get back to the airlock. I glanced over and saw Lee adjusting his aim slightly and shot went downwards at an angle and part of the floor disappeared. There was a squawk of surprise and then the smoke began to dissipate as the smoke bomb dropped to the room below us. I got a better look at the attackers now. Reynolds was at the door where I half expected him to be. He was tugging Summer Glow with him by her outstretched arm. She didn't seem eager to follow. There were five goons with guns crowding the entrance, the sixth was trying to climb out the hole where the floor had been a moment before. None of them were from the crew of the older Serene. Two looked like Neanderthals, the other four were humanoid that I didn't recognize. Hide muscle, local talent. Reynolds clearly didn't warn them about our weapons, as there was a shared look of panic as their bullets shattered harmlessly off of our armor. Reynolds wasn't trying to kill us, just slow us down long enough for him to get the girl out of there. I drew my own pistol and took careful aim. The gun's output was variable. You could set the beam or anything from widespread to low-powered spray to a high-powered needle-sized point. I set the focus down low and the power levels down even lower, more or less the lesser pointer capable of delivering a sunbird. I shot the door frame immediately beside Reynolds' right eye. He lost his grip on summer and the tables were turned just like that. The shooters lost their nerve. With it went the coordination, and now they were no longer concentrating their gunfire and us firing wildly. Lee was free to move about the room. I didn't see what happened next as I was busy pointing my pistol at Reynolds' chest and daring him to move. He didn't take me up on the offer. He stood there and waited as Lee dealt with the gunmen. Although I wasn't, technically speaking, watching the carnage, it was hard to be completely oblivious as someone after effects. I mean, when someone flies past you screaming at the top of his lungs, only to become a fixture in the wall, it's sort of hard to tune it all out. I did my best, however, and in a few minutes Lee was standing in the middle of the room, panting heavily. The bullets had stopped flying. I'm getting really tired of this, he snarled, of not being allowed to just shoot them. You only needed to keep Reynolds and Summer alive, I pointed out. The others, you could have shot. Now you tell me. Jack climbed to her feet and sniffed once. She seemed almost disappointed that she hadn't gotten a chance to participate in the mayhem. Heather and the professor continued to lay on top of the struggling Volson until they were absolutely certain that the coast was clear. Give your gun to Jack, I said to Sverian. 
I was surprised to note that there was not even a hint of anger that I felt resonating in my voice. I sounded rather calm, actually. This must have worried Reynolds as he immediately flipped the gun over and held it out, but first for Jack. He didn't break his gaze with me. Who was that? I asked. My voice was still eerily calm. What was wrong with me? I wanted to scream at him, to slam his head into the wall with my amplified strength and demand answers. But instead, I sounded like I was discussing the weather with him. I don't know them personally, he said. We hired them through the Nordic kin, local gang members, I suspect. I took a step towards him, and he flinched backwards. Reynolds, I said, taking another step. This is getting very old. He tried to take another step backwards and found that he couldn't. He'd go over the railing outside if he tried. He stuck out his chin defiantly. I thought you could cure Summer, he said. Now I hear you talking about abandoning her and... He shut up. Having hit the door frame next to your head and explode with a superheated ball of gas, we'll do that. You do not have the floor, I said coolly. Until I say otherwise, this is not a question and answer session. This is me talking, you listening, or find out how long you can live with a fresh fried liver. Understood? He remained silent. Good, I said. You can learn after all. However, you seem to be rather nasty habit of double-crossing. I offer you a deal. You agree, but secretly plan to kill me. This is starting to upset me. He looked like he wanted to say something. He almost did say something. But he remained quiet. I can't help your friend, I said patiently, because I don't know exactly what is going on with her. I have an idea that there is someone we might know and we can ask him. But apparently... That requires us to be on the other side of this world. You shooting me ruins any chance of having Summer get fixed. He still looked defiant, but I saw his back stiffen as I stated this. He was confused, trying to improvise with an unknown that didn't seem to be playing by any rules that he was familiar with. I almost felt sorry for him here. I knew exactly how he felt. All the same, he needed to start exploring some other strategies besides shooting me. I'd already demonstrated twice that this was a really bad idea. I would not do it a third. I sent to the gun on his chest. You can talk now, I said. You'll need a crew, he said. What the hell? Crew, I asked. He nodded. Summer was telling me a bit about the ship that you're going to have the kin build for you, he said quickly. I only stood part of it, but I know enough to say that you'll need a crew. I shook my head. We can pilot on our own, I said. You know that much about airships, he asked. This won't be an airship. It will be, he insisted, because that is the closest thing we know of what you are describing, and that is the kin will build for you. We'll manage, I said, and let him see my IM-10s tens as I brought the faintest amount of additional pressure to the trigger. Maybe, he said quickly, or maybe not. There's no harm in having extra hands. You might have use of some local technology after all, but it'll be nice to have someone who knows how to use it. I prefer my crew not to make attempts on my life, I answered dryly. I'll find someone else. You'll go through the same thing with them, he said. You're a rich stranger, an easy-looking mark, and you're asking us for something that's suicidal. The next one, you might actually have to shoot and you'll get stuck here where you are. It was a feeble argument, but I pretended to consider it anyway. I relaxed my grip slightly. And why will I trust you? I asked. You shouldn't, he said, nor the people I recommend. We're all greedy in our own ways and we have our own agendas. You can't trust me to be on your side. However, if my goals are in alignment with yours, then I have less reason to betray you and the others, yes? I looked at the grinning girl standing beside him. You mean Summer? I asked. He winced and I looked at her. His face fell. The cockiness was gone. He now looked tired. I grew up near a ghetto, he explained, without taking his eyes off of her. I probably spent as much time at her house as I did my own when I was growing up. She's like a sister. He glanced at me. I mean, Summer, he said, as if that was clarified things. And am I to take the bringing her with us as part of the price of admission, I asked. He nodded. I'll keep her quiet, he said, but if there's a hope for her and it's out there, I want to go. 
What about the rest of your crew? They'll follow me. Are you certain of that? I asked. Yes, he said firmly. They'll convince themselves that this is some sort of scheme I have to rip you off or to bring the treasure back from the frary. Either way, they'll follow me to see what play I make. I nodded. I didn't care that he didn't understand the gesture. I liked what I was hearing. I didn't want to get him. I wanted to use him as a guide of sorts as much as I could. I didn't want to learn my way around another group of natives. I preferred working with him. But he thought that he was convincing me of the merit I was much better. So, you and your crew can be of use to us with the fairy, I said. And what do we get out of this? Not just me and my crew, he said. I know others, desperate people who would join you. I'll have the crew as large as you like. We can bring an army if you want. I glanced around the damaged room. You may have noticed, I said softly, that the local talent pool doesn't stack up very well against our weapons. He just looked at me. Jason, he said from behind me, I know what he's getting at, and this is a bad idea. I don't know, I replied in English. An army with powered armor is better than five people with it. Yeah, he said, but if we surrender what little advantage we have over them, they'll rub us blind. Good point. No armor or weapons, I said to Reynolds and Sphirian once more. He continued to stare at me. I squirmed a little under that glaze. No, I repeated. He didn't break his gaze. Janeway learned to get along with the Marquis, I muttered to Lee. Jason, he warned. You know, Snape also seemed pretty untrustworthy, but when you got right down to it, Jason, be serious. I am serious, I said. He's right. We need the manpower. We need people familiar with the area. We also need someone to watch our backs for us occasionally. We're outnumbered a few quadrillion to five. If we don't outfit them with something, then we'll have to spend all our time safeguarding them. He crossed his arms and stepped into my field of vision. I don't like this idea at all, he said. Me either, I admitted. But we'll make sure that Dyer sets it up so that we can lock down the Rama remotely and that they can't use it against us. He frowned. Think that's possible? He asked me. I nodded. Probably, is what I said, though, not use admitting to him that I had already done it to the same extent with the Berserker drug. Now he was thinking about it. If we can lock them down, he said, and they can't shoot us, what about stealing it? I shrugged. Think we'll miss a suit of armor? I asked. Think what we could do with this world with that armor if left unchecked? He asked with more emphasis. Okay. He could probably terrorize the local segment and if they shoot him with enough bullets and get past the defenses, or he dies of old age. Either way, the place is too big for him to conquer on his own. Lee uncrossed his arms and rubbed his chin thoughtfully. You're okay with possibly setting up millions of innocents for collateral damage? I glared at him. No, I said. I'm not okay with that. If someone steals from us, we do our best to shoot them in the back as he runs away. If that doesn't work, we try and lock it down and leave the locals to tear apart the metal. Installing a local despot is a lost resort. He shrugged. Then I'm in, he said. Just make sure that we can shut them down before we give them so much as an armored glove. Agreed, I said, and we'll tell them the armor has to be equipped on Dyer and not here. Why, he asked, isn't that a bigger risk? What if they try to steal something off the ship or Dyer himself? Then we grab the popcorn and watch, I suggested. He smiled. Understood, Captain, he replied while standing stiffly to attention and giving me a sharp salute. I returned the salute, sloppily. I really needed to get the hang of this stuff. I looked back at Reynolds. He was quiet. Summer stood nearby, grinning at us. She hadn't bothered to translate. Well, whatever was putting her marionette strings apparently approved the direction that this was taking and was okay with not stirring the pot. I really felt like I was squatting buck naked over a bear trap and seeing how close I could dangle before singing soprano. I don't like it, Jason, Gatha said as she stood up from where she and the professor were sitting next to the spasmatic former science officer. The more people we have in armor, the harder it will be for us to control everyone, even with the remote kill switch. In addition to that, the professor said, there is an issue of logistics. We need food, water, and other supplies for everyone. How big can we make this frame and still use Volson's ship to pull it? 
I nodded in agreement to both points. Not an army then, I said something smaller. Ten, Jack suggested. That's two for each of us to watch if it goes badly and two to watching our back if it goes well. Fifteen armored individuals against an impossible planet. Meh, there could be worse odds. I nodded and turned to Reynolds. We'll take ten in total, I said, and we need to not get outfitted on the ship. Reynolds was making a barking sound. I think it was an agreement. Only eight need armor, though, he said. Scrake probably won't fit in anyway, and I plan on keeping her on the ship as much as possible. Our eye in the sky. And the other one, I asked. He glanced at Summer. Definitely not, I said. If there's a cure, he said, we're taking her there. I'm going with you, Summer added. She said it in English, naturally, so I knew better than to debate the point. Fine, I said. We head back to the dinosaur oasis as soon as you can arrange transportation for the other crew members and... He grinned at me. Right, I said, sighing. Let's go back to the airfield. When we got back to there, all serene, I wasn't too surprised to see a second airship sitting next to it. This one was slightly larger, and if I understood the local alphabet as well as I thought, its name was Small Ruddy. I closed my eyes and prayed to whoever was listening. Please, 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 I chanted. Don't let it be. Welcome, friends, the wheedling voice said nearby. My name is Captain Reimer, and I'm a senior officer aboard the Small Ruddy. Crap, I looked up to see a man. He was tall, thinly built, and wore a dark blue jacket and pants. Senior officer, the professor asked, and who is the captain? Reimer pointed at me. I guess I should have figured the one out of my myself. Okay, so Reynolds was passing the buck to me. I was now in charge of everyone. I frowned. Heather saw my look. What's wrong, Jason? she asked. Nothing, I said as I shook my head. Guess I should just be glad it wasn't the cat. No kick that time. Ha! Huh. Needed to loan her my DVD collection if we ever got back to Earth. Before setting out, I asked Reynolds to introduce me to one of the kin, as I needed someone to help fashion a vacuum suit for the crew and the two airships to enter the hangar. The concept of a vacuum suit was a new one to the idea of, he can't breathe in there, got to him motivated. I met with an old grey-haired man who wore striped vests over his plain greasy overalls, I wasn't sure of his species, as he was so old and twisted it was hard to tell whether the ape-like features were a recent feature or had been there all along. But despite of his old, crooked body, his mind beyond the visage was still keen. Reynolds tells me he wished us to construct a suit that people may breathe where there is no air, he asked. I nodded. For how long, he asked. I thought about it. What would be the twentieth of a clack and your units? I asked Reynolds. That is sufficient, the old man interrupted. So they do not need a large air supply, merely enough that it will not be toxic for a short walk. Yes, I agreed. We turned to the young girl who sat nearby. Go fetch Aunt Mott, he said at last. Her and any other seamstress you can find. Tell her we need eight coveralls with gloves and socks built in. Have them come over here and take the measurements. When you've done that, send the glass blower to me and, uh, oh, what's his name? That fellow who mixes the rubber plant gum. God here, the girl squeaked excitedly. Him, the old man agreed and smiled at the child. Now run along. He looked up at me. We should have something suitable for you soon enough, he said. I realized that I had just dismissed the, by the elder. I left without saying another word. When I stepped back into the airfield, there was a blur of activity. People ran all about the place in what, at first glance, seemed to be a random manner. Yet, as I watched, each person zeroed in on some task or purpose. They weren't the ones who were in directionless. I was. Care for a covered young drink? Someone said beside me. I turned to face the newcomer. The word coverage didn't translate directly. The symbiote tried, but all I got was an impression that it's something to do with my mother and a speculation of suggested habits that she might partake in recently deceased woodland creatures. A very insulting term, that. When I tried to examine its roots, it only became more horrifying with the implications. Yet the man who said it to me seemed friendly enough. He was a human, but that meant the Homo sapien. Human, as in he'd fit in right on Earth, California in particular. 
His hair was surfer blonde and I could tell there was an athletic build beneath those loose fitting pants and shirt that he wore while the way he moved. He had a three-day growth of stubble on his chin and a mischievous look about him. Nah, couldn't be. Hi, I greeted him. Hi, he said back. I'm Shide. I'm the converging pilot of the converging small ruddy. I hear that it said that you're the converge boss. Figuring that I might as well get to know you. I closed my eyes to try to kick my subconscious mind into talking to me. Now, on these consequences, the puppeteer's way of showing me how much control he has over the world. I thought to myself, No, I opened my eyes again. Um, I said, Sure, shite, sounds fun. Where's a good place around here to get a drink? He raised his eyebrows at me. There ain't no such thing as a bad place in converging drink, he observed. But if you want a good converge drink, you'll probably want to go with some patched drum. Patched drum, I said stiffly, of course. That seemed to qualify as an agreement, and I guess it was really, so there he led the way back into the town. The bar, tavern, pub, inn, whatever. It was, the locals that called turned out to be just an airfield and down the cobblestone street. The patch drum was a brick building with a thatched roof. It only identification mark was an ancient drum with a red patch of skin sticking out from the wall, as if it had been idly left by a passing marching band. Shied led the way inside and I heard a rousing cheer go up. Shied! Several people shouted in unison. He gave them a dismissive wave and bedded up to the bar. I followed. What's your converging preference? He said. Beer, I said. He snorted. I converging know that. What type, I meant? He asked. I turned out that the Spherians were rather democratic in their approach to fermentation. If it fermented, they had made beer from it. Apple beer, turnip beer, grape beer, and rye beer were just some of the more standard offerings. Then there was the colored beers that could be, well, anything. Each pub had their own unique blend of ingredients to come up with the color. I asked the house black beer and Shide clapped me on the back, heartily, and ordered the same. The beer tasted a lot like fermented licorice. Not great, but not exactly unpleasant either. I drank deeply and Shide laughed when I choked. We drank, we sang, we said kavaj a lot, and then I woke up on a small ruddy with a massive headache and an armor giving me a warning to change my toxic filters in my armor. What happened? You kavajing lightweight, Shide yelled as he stomped into the room, an effect that caused my ears to ring. Barely six drinks in and you can't kavajing stand. What sort of captain are you? The hungover one, I groaned. He passed something over to me. I stared at it. Tree bark? Willow bark, he said. Chew on it and you'll feel kavodging new in no time. I stuck the bark in my mouth and chewed. Not because I believed him. I was hoping the splinter might break loose and choke me. Half an hour later, my headache died down for reasons that I couldn't explain. I decided to stand up and take stock of my situation. The small ruddy was slightly larger than the older serene, but otherwise they had much almost identical layout. That made figuring out that none of my friends were with me all that much easier. I pushed my way up from where the Shied and Rhymer sat in the control room. Um, excuse me, I said, hiding the volume of my own voice. Where are my friends? In Serene, Rhymer answered, following us by about a league. League is not a word he used, by the way. Historically, the word league meant a distance a person could travel in about an hour. Their word for distance just happened to follow a similar pattern of clacks. So, even though they had their own word, Symbiote translated it to me as league. I liked the symmetry of it all, so I'm still using the word. Why? Why am I here? Shai thought you'd like the chance to meet your new crew. Besides, it's a change of scenery, Raima explained pleasantly. I shrugged and stepped into the cargo room and met the others. Introductions didn't take long. There were only six in the crew, and I'd met two of them. The first one was a soldier of the hominid species that actually looked pretty similar to a modern human. I only realized that she was something different when she turned her head too quickly, and the locks of her curly hair drifted to the side, enough for me to see the weird marks down the side of her neck that I first took as some sort of tattoos that were actually gills. So, there was a species here that did not exist on Earth at all. Interesting. She said her name was Hookson and said, Game on, a lot. I wasn't surprised. 
The other was an engineer. I later learned that he was a member of the kin. Big, beefy, with chocolate brown skin and a scraggly beard all over his chin. His name was KJ Jans. The last two were a pair of twins that I could not tell apart to save my life. Tall, broad shoulders, vaguely Asian cast to their eyes and complexion, and more knives than I could think about. Their names were Presta and Colux. I was really getting tired of the coincidences by now. Even without Heather's elbow in the ribs, it was starting to get too painful. It felt too directed, like someone was telling me something. I had a good idea of who it was too. We arrived in the airlock two days later, which took to mean that I had slept a full day while hungover. Six beers had done that to me and Shai had just walked that off. Was he declaring open war on his liver? We landed in the clearing, just barely enough room for the, both airships. The fake Daleks were still there, but fortunately, they had stopped screaming about extermination. To my surprise, it was Heather who broached the uncomfortable topic of how to divide up the two shuttles craft in the hangar. Ideally, we'd send Volson with all the locals, and the rest of us would have Sulcers to pilot us back. The problem was that Volson refused to be trapped with the many dangerous primitives without at least one of us to play bodyguard. So that meant that we'd either have to figure out how to transfer Sulcers to the other ship without a vacuum suit, an idea that I was far more tempted with than I would like to admit, or we swap one of ours for one of theirs, but the other shuttle, but who? V would be a good candidate, but Heather vetoed that as the fast shuttlecraft would arrive at Dyer first and whoever was on board might try something once there. She thought Lee and I should be there, as in her words, you two are the most dangerous. Okay, sure, I'd been doing some combat training on Dyer, but I didn't think I was that good. I started to ask her about it, but the professor translated for me. Not physically, Madakai said. Your mind, when it comes to scheming and looking for angles, none of us can keep up with you. That probably wasn't meant as a compliment, but it didn't seem to be an insult either. I let it drop without trying to figure it out. Fine, I said. Jack is probably second best at combat. Heather and Professor exchanged looks. You want to leave a 12-year-old girl alone on a ship with a bunch of strange men? Heather asked which is how we ended up with the following divisions of resources. I would go into the first shuttle with Lee, Reynolds, Reimer, James, and Joachimo. There was ones we collectively decided were the biggest threats, and the fastest we got them to die with the guns and the brigs, the better. Hooks and Shide, the twins, Professor Heather and Jack, would take the heavy transport afterwards. It was slightly larger and would be a bit less crowded, even with the extra people aboard it. Reluctantly, I agreed with this division of personnel, even though I still felt that it would be better if we all remained together. Heather, the Professor Jack and Volson separated, leaving me to lead the two R's and the engineers to the airlock. I found them standing near the Dalek skulking. Reimer and Jans were, naturally, almost speechless, while Reynolds and Yakimo affected a more blasé attitude. I made a mental note to ask Dyer to take a photo of their faces when we entered the ship. All four were identical-looking costumes. They looked a bit like homemade wetsuits, which I suppose was an accurate enough description. With a wooden bicycle pump built into the chest, each wetsuit came with a goldfish ball helmet and a rubber flap along the bottom. Reimer explained the function to me. When we were ready to pump out the air, we would put on the helmets and tuck the rubber flats under the collar of the suit, creating a seal. They would pump out the extra air, and the pressure would be helped maintain the air seal. It would only allow them to breathe for a few minutes before carbon dioxide toxicity would set in. But I thought it would probably work all the same. Interesting. We set out across the swamp. No dinosaurs challenged us, fortunately. We came to an airlock door. I had been too busy to notice before, but it was actually set in the hillside at a strange angle. It felt a level when I walked out, but now that I thought about it, there had been a slight step down when I got out. I realized that to make the airlock go in a straight line from the outside and the inside of the sphere, the hangar it had to be installed at an angle with gravity inside the tunnel of the airlock set to compensate. I told the men to put on their helmets. They just stared at me. Reynolds coughed awkwardly. 
I suppose I should mention this now, he said. We tried that door before. Have you ever step out of it the first day? It's locked on the side. He grinned at me sheepishly. I glared at him and then turned to the door. Using the nanites for identification is a weird experience. It required me to listen for the door asking who I was and then answering back. All this was done silently with some weird electronic frequency. I didn't understand. I received a silent acknowledgement and walked up to the door. I twisted the handle and swung the door open. Doors, I said as I turned around. Advanced technology. Learn them. Lee glanced to one side and feigned having a coughing foot to cover up his laugh. Reynolds, Reimer, and the two engineers simply put their helmets on and began pumping as they marched inside the door. I led them quickly across the hangar to waiting shuttle. If any of them were dying of asphyxiation, they'd hit it remarkably well. I cycled us through the airlock and into the shuttle. You have returned, Jason Reese, Sulthus cheered as we entered. Unlike Volson, who was mostly hidden behind her hazmat suit, Sulthus was out there for all to see. I spun around and looked at our passengers. Kavaj, that would have been the time to take a picture. Now nah, well, fire up the engines, I told the alien. We're going back. With pleasure, Jason Reese. The eel alien agreed. He slither walked to the pilot station and engaged the engines. He seemed way too cheerful to be seeing us again. Did you optimistically talk to anything that tried to establish communication? I asked. Indeed, I did, the alien agreed. Thank you for your advice. It was indeed quite lucky. Not for me, I grasped. The flight back to Dyer was fairly uneventful after that. Lee and I were too wired to talk with the others were in too much shock. This was the first time they'd seen the world from the outside, much less such a novel idea as like stars. Hours later, Sulthus parked us in the docking bay and Dyer and cheerfully led us out of the ship. If he were a human, he'd be humming... Such a fortunate day, he said. I groaned in exhaustion, but I felt I should say something. Why is that, Sulthus? I asked. I didn't really care, but I was being polite. Did I not tell you? He asked in apparent genuine surprise. Your communications were successful. He's here to see me. Who? I asked, and the outer door of the shuttle opened, and I found myself in the hangar. I paused and stared sight before me. Had the ship always been there? Ah, Jason Reese, a voice I hope to never hear again snarled. You return. I slowly turned to meet the gaze of none other than Captain Cock. Well, him and about twenty tusk frogs armored bodies with rather nasty looking rifles pointed at me. Excellency, Sulthus shouted as he bowed deeply. Cock ignored him, forcing all of his vast powers of glancing on me. I opened my mouth to say something, but was cut short by a herd of invisible elephants that chose that moment to sit on top of me. He was using his favorite toy again. If it hadn't been for the armor, I'd probably have shattered some bones. As it was, I merely couldn't breathe and saw black at the edges of my vision, as my thundering heart tried in vain to keep blood from flowing backwards. Hey! I heard Lee shout from someplace nearby. Lee! I croaked. Jason! I heard him call back. Are you all right? I forced as much air into my lungs as I could. The effort of inflating my chest was excruciating. Hang in there, Jason. Me, I gasped. Yabba, dabba, do. The world went dark. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 33, written by Sebi Loki. Light gradually seeped back into my world, with a came sound. Mostly I heard thudding feet and the squishing sound that seemed ominous. But there was also something that was almost like a beeping alarm. Except it didn't seem to be coming from my ears. It seemed to be coming from my head. Status. Fractured ribs, fusion in process, bruising a thoracic spinal area, repairing, combat effectiveness rating 92%. Administer booster. The last was a request my brains were still scrambled from. What had happened to me? It involved gravity. High gravity. Like that remote that cock used. Cock! Awakening flooded back into me and I told the armor to not administer the berserker drug. The armor had some first aid capabilities. 
They were nearly as extreme as the medical pods in the surgery, but then again, if the armor could keep you alive long enough to reach a medical pod, they didn't have to be. Considering that the armor was more than capable of marching your unconscious body to a medical facility, that meant the third wave soldiers could take a fairly heavy beating and still make it back home, providing that the armor survived the beating. Apparently, the crashing gravity had damaged me to the point that the armor had to first repair some damage before it judged that I was in shape to take the Berserker Serum. That's good, because I didn't really want to. I opened my eyes and found my I was leaning in the same spot and hangar floor. Of course, the hangar floor wasn't quite so blue when I was knocked out, nor sticky. I got the distinct impression that the blue stuff that I was looking at had been inside the frog-faced soldier a moment before. Nearby, I saw the unconscious forums of Reynolds and Reimer. They looked hurt. Two slumped over forms just beyond them were probably the engineers. Half a rifle clattered to the floor in front of me. The broken end had been twisted and it looked like it suggested that it had sheared off while being used as an improvised club. An armored frog crashed into the floor a moment later. The frog's tusks had been snapped off in the gum line and stabbed through the chest plate at the thing's armor. A rifle snapped a dent in the alien's lifeless skull, left me doubting if the ship's medical facilities could put Humpty Dumpty back together again. How long had I been out? I checked my armor's chronometer and converted it to human units. Ten seconds. That's it. I scrambled awkwardly to my feet and stumbled around the corner of the ship to where the meaty squishy sounds that I'd heard a moment before originated. There were seven of the frogs left now. All of them were injured. Cock lay on the floor. His high-gravity remote of mass was twisting plastic and metal that lay scattered around the pulpy mass in his hand. Cock was breathing, but a dazed look suggested that he was no longer fully aware of what happened. I looked like his fist had been forced to crush the remote until it exploded in his hand. Had Lee done that? Wait, why was I even asking that? I looked back at the seven. No, make that six. Frogs that were still standing. Those that could still hold their rifles were trying to hit a blur of pure mayhem. If the blur got too close to them, Lee began a living flail, arms and legs, and even his head. He struck with all of them in rapid succession until his opponent was bloodied wreck. If they had to keep him in the distance, Lee shot them instead. It was a debatable which was worse. Two frogs tried to pin him down against the side as one of the shuttlecraft was firing their rifles in his general direction and herding him. Lee ran up to the side of the ship and kicked off. He became a human torpedo slamming into the gut of one of the frogs. The human and frog slumped to the floor in a tangle of armored limbs while energy blast shot out the other side. The frogs went wild as they poured triggers of guns reflexively. It managed to shoot the leg of a teammate. Lee was more controlled. He shot two frogs sent a mass. Three remain standing, though one of them is now leaning on a shuttlecraft for support. Lee brought his pistol back and then shoved the barrel into the mouth of the alien beneath him. The tusks blew outwards from a meaty blue cloud of mist. Three left. I cleared my throat and tried speaking. Dire! I croaked. Intruder alert! Guns popped out of the ceiling and floor and trained on the three attackers. The odds were mad before. Lee had already taken out seventeen of them in just a few seconds. At the sound of my voice, they looked at me and I could feel a wave of terror flowing out of them. For all they knew, I was just as much of a human blender as Lee was. The sight of the guns erupting all around them just compounded what they already secretly suspected. They were not leaving this hangar alive. They tried anyway. One swung his gun towards Lee and fired repeatedly. One bolt seemed to have actually hit. Lee shrugged it off. Human physiology and its resistance to energy weapons plus the armor own dampeners kept him from actually killing him. It probably should have hurt, but Lee seemed to be in a headspace beyond pain. The rifle exploded from the shooter's hand. No. Wait, it didn't. The hands were still attached. How had he done that? The frog let out a throaty scream as he was silenced by his own rifle being shoved down his throat. Lee didn't pull the trigger this time. No, he set the power pack to overload. Now there was two. 
The two remaining frogs looked at each other and tossed their guns on the floor with a clear sign of surrender. Unfortunately, Lee didn't understand the sign language at the moment. Oh, yeah. I shouted as I saw Lee shape blur angle to intercept the two surrounding frogs. If you can lock down that armor, do it now. Daya may have answered my command verbally, but I didn't really know. I saw the results regardless. Lee's legs locked mid-stride, and his armor became a full-body restraint. Inertia carried him forward as he toppled towards one of the frogs. The frog tried to step out of the way. Too late. Lee's body was frozen, his jaw not so much. Somehow he managed to twist around enough to bite into the creature's neck as he fell past. Gravity and momentum did the rest. There was a tearing sound as a large chunk of the frog's neck ripped free. A geyser of blue blood rushed from the wound in the arc. The frog had a moment of surprise to register before its legs gave out and it collapsed on the floor. Only one soldier remained standing. It kept its hands firmly away from its weapon and locked its eyes with me. I got the impression that inside of its armor was a puddle of urine right now. Its boots would probably slosh as it walked, I mused. Lee snarled defiantly from the floor. Dyer, I said, can you get Lee to surgery? Affirmative, Captain. Lee's body jerked upright. Lee howled in a rage as he marched stiffly towards the lift. What can we do about getting the survivors to the brig and, um, disposing of the others, I asked. Biohazard automators have been deployed, Captain, the ship replied. Would you like me to escort the prisoners to the brig with my training robot? Yes, I said, nodding. I think that'll get the message across. Do it. Affirmative, the ship replied. A moment later, the doors on a different lift opened up and Dalek Thing rolled out on the blades spinning. The ship's guns remained focused on Cock and the Frog. They got up and got the hint. The Frog grabbed Cock from the floor and hoisted him to his feet. They shuffled towards the waiting lift and then saw the blade-wielding training robot hot in their heels. I was going to ask for something to carry the four Syrians who had come to, this to take them to surgery as well, but... For once, Dyer had actually anticipated my order. A lift opened and four hovering sleds flew into the room and dropped next to the hominids. I realized as that they were more or less human, Dyer probably assumed that they were part of the crew, or at the very least new recruits. That made some things easier. I waited as the sleds carried off the wounded before interrogating the ship. How did they get in here, Dyer? I asked the air. Please restate the question, Captain, the ship answered. They were waiting for us inside the hangar, I said. How did you let that happen? The hangar was not specified as a place you wished me to actively monitor, the ship pointed out. I sighed. But when the doors open, you didn't think to look, I asked. The doors have not been opened prior to your arrival, the ship answered. I tapped my foot against the floor. There has to be some evidence that it did, I counted. Checking now, Captain, the ship answered without a hint of emotion. Confirmed, there's been a modification made to the hangar doors to bypass my system. Repairs have been initiated. I felt my throat go dry. Someone sabotaged the doors, I asked. Verified, the ship answered. Modification appears to originate from the time of system lockdown. I relaxed a bit. Not my crew, after all. Then I tensed up again and mentally kicked myself. I'm such an idiot sometimes. The ship had been used as a museum for centuries. Of course, they had a way to open the hangar doors without notifying the ship. Diane, I said, perform whatever diagnostics you need to do to seek out any other potential modifications through your designs. Warning, full diagnostics will impair functions of the ship as various systems will be taken offline. Will life support be taken? I asked. Negative, the ship said. Navigations and weapons will be compromised during full scanning. For how long? I asked. Full diagnostics will take 14 Earth days. Do it, I ordered. Just make sure the prisoners can't escape during that time. Confirmed, the ship said. Internal security will not be affected. I relaxed once more. Having your own personal moon-sized battleship may be every boy's dream, but I was actually growing rather fond of this thing. The biohazard sanitation automatons burst into the room and then began going to work on the hangar floor. Each automaton had about the size of a St. Bernard and looked like a giant orange army helmet. 
One oozed with a purple foam on the floor, and it began scrubbing up the blue sludge. Another opened a slit in the stack out something that looked like a chainsaw, but glowed white hot with heat. It angled towards the bodies, and I decided that I didn't need to watch the rest. I headed towards the lift and rode it to the armory. By the time the heavy transport was less than an hour away, Dyer alerted me to the fact that Lee had been patched up and could be released from his medical pod. I put the pistol that I had been inspecting back into the charging bay and stretched. I felt some kinks pop in my back. Getting out of the armor felt good, not that wearing it was bad. After a while, it became like a second skin. Having that said, it was still fond of my first one. Did you do as I asked? I queried the ship. Affirmative, Captain, Dyer answered readily enough. I nodded and left the armory without any further comment. I wasn't ready for this, but it looked like I wouldn't have a better opportunity. Four medical pods were still occupied. Dyer had agreed with my request to keep the unconscious even if they had healed. That at least solved the problem of having them wandering around the ship until I had the resources to deal with it which should be in an hour or so after I dealt with one more problem area. The last occupied medical pod I opened, I approached. I had Dyer leave a pair of pants at the top of the cabinets in the surgery. I grabbed them now and waded them into the ball, tossed them inside the medical pod and without looking. Put those on, I ordered. Can't stand talking to a man when he's cranking beans spilling out of his lap. There was a groan from inside and the sounds of movements. I decided I may as well start talking while he was getting dressed. Bet your head feels like crap right now, I said. The after effects of the stuff is pretty nasty. A groan. Fortunately, I said, you didn't get as high as a dose as I did, nor was it a mix of whatever else Dyer gave me. Yeah, you're probably doing a lot better than I was. Still, can't imagine you feel this is the best time to be receiving end of a lecture. Lee stood up and climbed warily out of the pod. Jason, is this about, he began, this is about, I said, you openly challenge me every time I ask you to do something. I don't mind explaining things to you, but there is a time and a place for everything. I don't want to spend the rest of my time looking over my shoulder, wondering if you're going to actually slug me this time because I asked you to do something you didn't agree with. Do you want command of the ship? No, he said with such a vehemence it surprised me. I almost lost a thread of concentration. I forced myself to continue anyway. Too bad, I said, because it seems one of us has to be the leader, and if you don't want to step up to that leaves me, which sucks for me, as you don't seem to want to follow either. His eyes narrowed, but his lips tightened, but his voice was still even and measured when he spoke up. Jason, he said, let's just drop it and... What? I interrupted. Would they do to you in the military if you threatened a commanding officer like you did to me on the Aula Serene? His face grew even darker. This isn't the military, he said, and you're only the captain because we let you be. There it was. Should have thought of that before, I said. Long way to walk back home, he sighed. Fine, Jason, he said, anger seeping into his voice. You've had your moment. Don't make a golden boy feel bad about his decisions, or he might cry. Message received. I doubt it, I said with a shrug, but I don't expect much from a junkie like you. That did it. He launched himself at me, eyes blazing. A few months ago, I had been a goner, but that was before I had subjected myself to Dyer's teaching methods. I was not in Lee's league at all, but I was no starch either. I twisted to the side and shoved him as he went past me. My push combined with my own momentum accelerated him into the wall behind me. He bounced off and came around swinging. Fortunately, I wasn't standing there anymore. I would backed up to the other side of the room and he came at me again. I dodged again. Running away, Jason, he taunted angrily. Is that all you're going to do? No, I said. Five. He balled up his fist and fainted a punch from my direction. I started to side a step, but before I caught sight of him shifting his weight to one leg, I just narrowly avoided the kick that lashed out in my direction. Careful not to tip over your walker, old man, I said. Four. He buried his teeth and charged with me once more. I ducked low and to the side. He almost caught me again, but once again I slipped away just outside his grasp. Three, 
I said. He shifted his weight on his foot and held his fist close to his bare chest. He wasn't even sweating and breathing was only slightly fast. I was already out of breath. What's with all the stupid counting? He asked. Two, I answered. He shook his head and took a step towards me. His knees turned to rubber and he flopped limply to the ground. Crap, I muttered. My timing was off. That would have been a real impressive if it was at zero. Drugged, he mumbled on the floor. You had the ship drug me while I was in the medical pod. You cheated. His words were muffled from laying face down. I slumped to the floor next to him and rolled him over onto his back. Damn right I did, I said, and don't think I won't do it again. You must think I'm crazy if you think I'm just going to stand there and let you kill me. He groaned and closed his eyes. What is this stuff? he asked. I shrugged. Kind of a paralyzing agent, I said. Daya said it'll block your ability to use your arms and legs until I'd missed the antidote. When do you plan to do that? he asked suspiciously. Good question, I said. Better question is, should I tell the others that you died in the little ambush in the hangar? Armory is just around the corner, you know. I can be back before you can say boo. He sighed. He no longer looked angry, just tired. What is this about, Jason? He asked at last. I told you what this is about, I said. It's about you questioning my every move. I may not be in military, and yeah, I've been screwing up from time to time. But damn it. I'm trying. Why won't you give me a bit of space to breathe? He snorted. I prepared myself for another angry tirade. Instead, he chuckled. You doped me up while I was healing, he asked with a laugh. That's a good one. You're sneaky, Jason. Uh, thank you, I hazarded. Suddenly, his face darkened again. The mirth died away from his lips and he looked incredibly sad. What happened to you, Lee? I asked. Ordinarily, I'd be okay with you having your secrets, but things are going to get bad for us soon, and I need to know that we can depend on you. So tell me, what happened, and why do I seem to set you off? He scowled, and I thought he was going to refuse to answer. To my surprise, he replied with only a brief hesitation. You know what I like most about you, Jason? He asked me suddenly. You're a natural born leader. When things are at their worst, you are at your best. You step up when there is a crisis and you keep it cool. You do whatever it takes to win, and you don't demand anything from your people that you don't demand of yourself. Probably this. Yeah, but you know what I hate most about you? That you're a natural born leader. I was about to ask him when I had done any of the stuff he described, and I seemed to recall panicking and playing things largely unsuccessfully by ear. When had I ever been cool under pressure? But then the last sentence caught my notice. Huh? I asked. I wasn't that long ago, he went on. I used to think of myself the same way. A natural leader. Thought if there was a challenge I'd rise up to it and come out top somehow. What happened? I asked. What do you think? He replied. I got my chance and I screwed up. Big time. I was still puzzled. I don't understand. I've been screwing up all over the place too. What's the big deal? He sighed. A kid didn't die because your screw-ups, okay? He said. I got a chance to lead and I made some bad calls. A kid got killed. What sort of bad calls? I asked. Now he clammed up, his face darkening as he looked away. Real bad ones, he said. He lapsed into silence for a moment before resuming his narrative. The brass did a formal investigation, he said. Said it wasn't my fault. I got to walk without so much as a slap on the wrist. But, I don't know. How do you feel about such a thing? I didn't really trust myself after that. Felt the pressure. Started to drink so that I wouldn't feel the pressure. When that wasn't enough, I did other things. I kept it hidden as best I could, but the brass saw that I was getting sloppy. I wasn't booted out when my time was up. I was strongly encouraged not to come back. We both lapsed into silence this time. I could tell that he was leaving stuff out. A lot of stuff. For all I knew, he was lying about the details that he shared. But for some reason, I didn't think so. It felt right. Bitter. And a bit jealous. Scared. Scarred. Lee was an emotional wreck and I reminded him of who he had been before he turned to crap. Lee, I began. You can get the antidote now if you want, he interrupted. Or shoot me if you don't. I don't care. I think I haven't cared for a while. Lee, I said. We still need you. He smiled. 
Thanks, he said. I can see why she fawns all over you like that. I thought she was teenage hormones with you being the only male of her own species within several solar systems who wasn't her surrogate dad. I was caught off guard by the change of topic. Are you talking about Jack? I stammered. I don't think it's that, though. He went on as if I hadn't heard me. I think she saw it first. We're talking about Jack, I persisted. Teenage girl with a switchblade. Likes to lurk and scowl. He smiled. You'll do whatever it takes to win, he went on. Follow you and we don't have much of a chance of making it. Don't follow you and we have no chance. Hell, I'm not sure that I could even take you out if I wanted to. Jack, I said again. You bubescent homicidal maniac. You're saying that she has a crush on me. If I try to attack you, Lee continued, still refusing to answer my question in that infuriating way. You've probably left dire instructions to blow up my armor or something. Just stop his heart, actually. I didn't really want shrapnel to hurt any innocent bystanders. Still, he was ignoring the important thing here. Ow, oh, Jack, I repeated. She's gone all doe-eyed over me. You can't be serious. He shut his eyes, smile broadening. When did the others get you? he asked. I blinked and considered how much time had passed. Half an hour, I think, I admitted. Well, he said, you had better decide fast on what you want to do with me. Things are going to get awkward soon. I reached for the table where the hypo was and the antidote set. It hadn't even been disturbed when those were thrashing about. Careful planning, or dumb luck, Jason. I held it at his neck but didn't administer it. Are you going to attack me if I give you this? I asked. No, sir, he said without a trace of irony. I will not. I still hesitated. No more challenging me, I asked. He looked at me. I gave in a little. In public, I amended. No, sir, he said. I think it would be uh, unwise to distract you. I snorted and administered his injection. He was up and moving within minutes. I better get dressed before they get you, he said. Have you had a chance to find out if you can shut down their armor if we need to? Yes, I said. Daya is reprogramming the units now. But listen, about Jack. He held up a hand, palm outwards to me. I wouldn't dream of standing in the way of a true love, sir, he said, and then walked off without another word. God damn it, Lee. I stormed out of the surgery and rode the lift up to the hangar. The floor was spotless now, other than the addition of a fighter that hadn't been there before. There was no trace of an attempted boarding party. The heavy shuttle entered the hangar a moment later. As its standing struts extended, I belatedly remembered something. Dyer, I shouted, do you have some sort of equipment to take photographs? Define photographs, Captain. Pictures, I said. Affirmative. Okay, I said. I want pictures of the faces of our guests when these doors open. Affirmative, Captain. The door opened on the craft and three female members of my crew led the charge outside. To my horror, Jack really did give me a shy wave before she stepped to one side of the ramp and glared back inside, with her hand hovering near a pistol. The remaining members of the Sapiens exited the ship and openly gawked as they saw. Image captured, Captain, Dyer said. What do you wish for me to do with them? Print them off and send them to my cabin, I said. I want to admire them later. Then, to the assembled hominids, I clapped my hands and walked forward, smiling. Welcome to the Dire Blade, good people, I said with a smile. Now we begin the fun stuff. The end of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 34 Written by Sebi Loki I used the cafeteria as a meeting room again. I was certain Dyer had a much larger and more suitable spaces, but this suffered the advantage of being both familiar and on-demand catering. The professor showed at the newcomers how to order some fairly basic meals from the dispensers. Unfortunately, this led to some rather weird translation issues as the food that they were familiar with didn't always line up with what they were familiar with. Within the end, Reynolds asked for something called a jomph and described it to the professor. Jalomps were, as I discovered, were a sort of cross between a burrito and a hash brown. Vegetables, usually a mixture of potatoes and peppers, but it could include almost anything, were hashed and grilled, and a sheet of unleavened bread was a spongy tortilla, was then laid out on the hash and placed on top. 
When available, there was a few traditional sources that could go on top of it. One he described as a garlic and curds. Sounded revolting, but another source, one that was mustard seed and tomato blend, sounded suspiciously like mustard and ketchup mixed together. Lastly, if meat was available, it could also be hashed into the mix with the vegetables and sauces before folding the bread over. It's a sandwich, I blurted out. The professor shot me an odd look, almost like I was a particularly slow child, and coated in an approximation of lump. The smell that greeted the dispenser opened up and was not unpleasant, a bit like what you might get if a taco bowl set upside inside a waffle house. Ranald seemed pleased enough with the results, and the others came forward to order their own lumps. I took up a post near the other's dispenser and helped out best I could. Like sandwiches, lumps could be served a variety of ways. Shy liked these with the scrambled eggs and sweet onions. Rima took his with potatoes and chickpeas and cucumber sauce. Hookson liked hers with apples and mixed in. Keep in mind that I'm translating this as best as in earth terms. Apparently, agriculture took a few different turns in this world. For example, as far as I can tell, corn didn't exist. However, they had several different varieties of beans and fruits we did not. Some, I think, may have been descendants from varieties of vegetables and fruit that had gone extinct on earth some time ago. But others, I think they may have just used different criteria for breeding the crops. I decided to code the lyomf on my own, why not? When in Rome, I made mine out of potato, three different peppers, stewed beef, and a mustard tomato mix. I took a tentative bite from and found it wasn't bad. I chewed the larger bite and took my place near the far wall where we turned into a screen while the others formed a close, loose circle around me. Ladies and gentlemen, I greeted, I'd like you to welcome you to the Dire Blade. We will be giving you a short instructional video on how to use your armor. I encourage you to pay attention as this armor will save your life. Unfortunately, as the ship isn't programmed to speak your language, I am afraid I'm going to have to serve as a translator. If you'll... Jason, Bolson interrupted from the back of the room. What is it? Why do you simply not kiss them? I tried not to openly shudder at the thought. This was a very hairy looking crowd. I think, I told her, that won't be necessary. We can... If we intend to cross the sphere, she persisted, there is a chance that the other languages will be in use. If all can communicate with the natives, this will be an advantage. I paused and considered that. It was a good point. I just didn't like the idea. Okay, maybe Hookson wouldn't be bad, but I didn't think anyone wanted to lock lips with Yakimo. The man would make a Sasquatch reach for a razor. I think we can hold off on that for now, I said. First, we need to get the ship to explain to the crew what is needed of them. Understood, Captain, I replied in a flawless Spherian. I think my jaw may have dented the floor which which struck. Daya, I said in Spherian, you know this language. An adequate sampling was obtained to decipher the dialect, the ship informed me. Great, now I looked like an idiot for standing up there. I stepped on one side and waved at the wall. Daya, I said, if you would like to give our guests a rundown on the basic armor capabilities. The wall flashed and a replica of the standard armor appeared. Daya began lecturing all of us on the specs and capabilities of the armor. It was quite an eye-opener, even for me, and I had been wearing it already. I already knew the armor could serve as an impromptu vacuum suit and first aid kit, but it could also survive heat, cold, and even underwater for a brief period of time. As in space, oxygen reserves were a limiting factor. It carried a small supply of oxygen which could help you survive in extreme environments or gas attacks, but there wasn't enough room for hours of extended use. Backpack units for extended oxygen could be installed, however. I made a note of this and decided to search the armory for these units. It could come in handy on the strip. Next, Dyer talked about weapons, both internal and external to the armor itself. There were a few weapons bolted directly into the armor that could never be dropped. These included the pair of extendable blades that could be deployed from the tip of the wrists and over the back of the hand. Not exactly Wolverine, but still pretty cool. In addition, the wrist swords, there were also a few other built-in goodies. There was two short-range boron burners. It sounded like they may be the chimeric equivalent for the word laser. 
Did you know that the word laser was originally an acronym? It stands for Light Amplification Through Simulated Emissions of Radiation. Not too surprising that other species would find a different term for the same device. Still, it sounded similar. They were only effective at close range. The further away from the target you were, the more the beam dissipated. It could punch holes through steel at an arm's length, but the time it reached a few hundred feet, though, it could barely charge wood. There were also a couple of sublethal weapons built in, a sonic grenade that could stun many opponents, providing that they had ears or were sensitive to shockwaves in the atmosphere, and an electric discharge that could be directed through the gloves. There was also a tiny repulsive force field that surrounded the armor that allowed you to uh, push off things that surrounded you. It helped with escaping certain types of traps or made it easier to extricate yourself from a buried alive. But most weapons were separate from the armor. The first weapon was a pistol, of course. It could be varied with a rate and spread and power. Blah, blah, blah. Power was only good for, oh hell, ten minutes of continuous use, at most. The gun would recharge itself for an internal nuclear battery, but the charge had to be stored and concentrated before it could be discharged as energy fire. The other words, there were a capacitor. Depending on how fast it was depleting, the recharge process could take hours or days. The pistol was, therefore, generally used only for sporadic fire, allowing the gun to build up a charge that provided better coverage. Great. The rifles worked similarly, but had a greater range and a recharge faster and held more power in reserve. They could be fired at full power continuously for 20 minutes and 30 minutes if power was dropped to a lower setting. Recharging times worked out to roughly for a 2 to 1 ratio of charge versus discharge time. For every 2 minutes it rested, you could fire one more. Must bring rifles as well. Wolf grenades were covered as well as something called a Chekhov rifle that I decided we probably wouldn't use. Seemed pointless to me. An hour into the yet, everyone's eyes started to glaze over. I was about to tell Dyer that it would take five minutes when he dropped this little tidbit. And, of course, all weapons and armor include officer discrimination, the ship droned. If a hostile action is initiated against the superior officer, the weapons and armor will be deactivated. Had the setting changed to deactivate rather than detonate, it turned out that their features I had been trying to program in was already present in the armor. Dyer had just disabled them in our personal suits, as it was all high-ranking officers in the suits, and as such, limiters could be removed. The same wasn't true for the rank and file, and at my request, some of the officers like Lee and Jack had theirs turned back on. Now, everyone looked uncomfortable as this tip had landed in their laps. They had the armors and the weaponry, but if they tried to use it against us, it would turn out badly. Remote lockdown has also been enabled by the captain's personal request, Dyer continued. All use of enhanced armor and weaponry is a sole discretion. A lot of uncomfortable stares were shot in my direction. I ignored them. Dyer, I called out, how about we let our guests take a break and we can pick this up after they've had a chance to stretch their legs. Affirmative, Captain. Dyer agreed and fell silent. Lots of people stood up and left the room. I figured most of them weren't heading for the bathroom either. I sighed, half exasperation and half resignation, and once more the room was cleared. I waved Volson over. Did you get a chance to look over Cock's ship? I asked. I did, she confirmed, and, as I feared, it has been by a lock to his genetic code. I wasn't surprised. So, we're still stuck with using your ship? I asked. Yes, she agreed. I scanned it, and the damage is, uh, more extensive than I originally thought. How bad is it? I asked. I do not believe that it is capable of holding an atmosphere at this time, she admitted. I grunted at that one. We had considered using a smaller force of zipping directly across the interior of the Dyson Sphere, rather than riding along the curve. This put a damper on that plan. Even if I used the oxygen packs and the armor, Valsen wouldn't be able to hold out nearly long enough with her suit, and we depended on her to pilot the ship. Engines and maneuverability, I asked. Compromised, but I think still adequate for our needs, she said. I believe that we can get to accelerate the craft to sufficiently hardy construction, up to speed a range of uh, 950 miles in one of your hours. I let out a low whistle of appreciation. 
Molson seemed less enthusiastic. I don't think you understand, she said. Even if we can maintain the speed continuously, it would still take approximately 35 of your years to reach our destination. I was at a loss for words. You mean, I asked, that there is no way that we can cross the world in 30 years? I did not say that. She corrected me. There is just a complication. Complication? I asked. She fell silent for a moment and then started doing that slow waltz of agitation her species favored. My ship, it was quite damaged and... Falson, I snapped. She cowered from me in a moment before answering. If, she said, the craft that is constructed can sustain an atmosphere for a short time, we can then lift the ship out of the atmosphere and fire short bursts in the in-system engines. Their heat shielding is badly damaged, but if we allow them sufficient time to go down between bursts, I think we should be able to... Volson, I repeated, more patiently this time. Can you break it down to me in terms that I can understand? She could. It was not especially encouraging picture, but it wasn't exactly discouraging either. 950 would be our cruising speed, and we would travel along those speeds for five days after a burn to allow the in-system engines to cool. That would carry us a distance of 114,000 miles before we would start to climb out the atmosphere for a fast burn. The fast burn would be at speeds that were in the neighborhood of 0.0% of the speed of light, or roughly 45 million miles per hour. We'd maintain that burn for half an hour or so, and then drop back down to our 950 mile per hour cruising speed. By alternating between the two of them, we would get to the other side of the world, where the land of Ferry was supposed to be in uh, 11 hops or so, or roughly 55 days, except for one problem. The ship's power packs are also badly damaged, and we don't have enough power for such an extensive voyage. She must recharge at least one during these voyages, she explained. The ship could recharge off solar power. Ten days bask in the sunlight would be enough to get us moving again once the batteries were flat. How long until the batteries were flat? She wasn't sure to the extent of the damage that made it difficult to predict. The harder we pushed the ship, the faster the generation of the power packs would progress. She recommended two stops to allow the ship to completely recharge, which would add a further 20 days to our trip. If that wasn't bad enough, the ship had to be completely powered down during those periods of recharge. During those times, our speed would be limited to a maximum speed of the local technology only, or roughly 30 miles an hour. Bad enough that the periods between long bursts were barely moving relative to the size of the sphere. But those days the shuttle had to be shut down, we may as well be standing still for all the progress that we made. Still... We had better equip the local engines anyway, as, uh, even though we wouldn't make any significant progress, I didn't relish the idea of being sitting a duck while we waited. 75 days travel time, or, put another way, two and a half months, just to get to ferry. Then however long to take to accomplish whatever we needed to speak to whomever was trying to ruin my life, then another two and a half months back. Five months at a minimum to complete the task, call it half a year. Would the adjudicators allow me for such a long reprieve? Did they even know that I was here, or would they just assume that I'd gone off the reservation and were even making plans to destroy the earth? I chewed my lip nervously. Too many questions and not enough alternatives. What else could I do but hope that earth would still be there in six months from now? Load up your ship with one of the fast flyers, I said. We are going to take a pair of them back. She seemed surprised. Are you going to allow Silthus to fly? She asked. He's going back to the brig, the little traitor. I continued. I am having the Daleks pilot us. She acknowledged us with a quiet solemnity. Jason Reese, she said at last. We should move quickly. I know, I said as I stood up and walked out the door. And, she said at least, you need to kiss them. Why? Was there never a plan B? Twenty hours later, and two fast transports were bumping their way into the hangars. We were all decked out in the nines with fresh armor, except for Volson, that is. I didn't find a pistol for her, which she was gradually accepted. As we all had armor this time, crossing into and out of the airlock was a lot less stressful. This was good as we were touting a lot more equipment. Those god-awful field meals in jugs of water. We couldn't carry enough water to supply us for the entire trip. We'd have to stop and refill. The goal was to stop a few times as possible. 
Guns, grenades, scientific equipment went next. Some of it was the same supply that we thought to bring with us and ignored. Some was new. The backpacks of oxygen tanks were included with this. Next, we brought in the ingots of iron. Rather than sacrificing more Daleks, I reasoned that it was more efficient to bring a pure metal. Iron and steel were some of the most valuable resources in the sphere. I was bringing in enough to bribe the Nordic kin to build us a hell of a ship as well as bribe safe passage from whoever we came across and either couldn't or didn't want to shoot. Lastly, the twins towed to the ship mounted cannons. I had been opposed to the idea at first. The cannons were meant for taking out war machines from the third wave. Mounting them on an airship that we were building seemed like using a howitzer to swat flies. Reimer had been the one to sell me on the idea. Even if we aren't entirely sure what we will encounter, he said, better to be heavily armed than too lightly. I allowed them to bring the cannons only after I confirmed with Dyer that I could remotely shut them down as well. Fitting all of the equipment as well as the personnel into two ships ended up being a tight fit. I was half afraid the slow-moving aircraft would never be able to move that much mass. In the end, however, we arrived back in Newton a mere four days later. The airships putted into the same field as before, once more the gypsy engineers scrambling to grab the whirring lines. At the edge of the field, I could half expect it to see the zoners had returned to spread more of their version of spiritual enlightenment. Instead, I saw one man band playing a slow tempo tune that would put an isomniac into a coma while a monkey wearing a purple fez danced around and shoved a wooden cup in people's faces. Buskers were the same no matter where you went. The ladders were tossed out the side and I, for once, led the charge out of the aircraft to the ground. I wasn't nearly as skilled at descending and free-swinging ladders as the Spherians, but I was getting better. I dropped to the ground and I wasn't too terribly surprised to find the same Kin Alder waiting for me when I returned around. He stood there with his hands clasped behind his back and looked at me expectantly. A thud sounded beside me as a crate stuck to the ground. I looked over and saw a box had sunk half an inch into the soil from the force of impact. It had come down inches away from my head. Someone up there either had really rotten aim or really good aim. I hoped it was the latter. The crate was one of the dyers, seamless white box with material that looked almost like plastic. I instructed my nanites to open it. A seam appeared as the lid swung open. The elder looked over my shoulder and saw the dark blocks of iron waiting inside. I'd like to talk to you, I said slowly, about building an airship. We can do that, he said. It'll be an unusual design with lots of special requests. Doesn't matter, he said. We can do that. I smiled. Confident in your skills, I asked. No, he said with a quick glance at the box, but I am highly familiar with the extent of my greed. I smiled at him. Well said, I agreed. Is there some place we can go to discuss this? He looked back at the iron ingots and seemed to consider it. I believe, he said, anything from my studio to renting half a city a few farther are officially options at this point. Your studio will be fine, I said. Lead the way. He did. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 35. Written by Sebi Loki. The elder's name, as I would find out, was actually Lloyd's team, but everyone just called him Al, or rather, their local alphabet equivalent of Al, if you want to be ultra technical. Al Studio, as he called it, was actually a large canvas tent stacked to the corner of the field. The tent had a lopsided shape to it, almost as if extensions had been added to it over the years without regard to its original design. The color and the fabric were unrecognizable under the layers of caked-on soot and its tank of oil and possibly kerosene. I had been wondering where the Svirians obtained their oil as, well, dinosaurs were still alive and breathing just a few miles away. Reynolds told me some nights, if it was quiet enough and the wind blew at the right direction, you could hear the faint sounds of their bellowing. Was there oil in this world? If not, what were they burning in the lamps to make the gas lights? Did the creators of this world, and I was growing less and less convinced that it was Chimera, just plant oil on the inhabitants to dig it up at the later date? It was all too confusing, but on the other hand, it was also irrelevant. We needed to get up and into the air as fast as these people could hammer together a ship, assuming that they used hammers. 
With so little metal available, I would guess that it didn't use nails. Without nails, I, how do you get a ship to take shape? I hope the answer did not turn out to be glue. I ducked inside the tent and found Al and some other kin gathering around a low table with a large sheet of paper rolled out flat on top of it. Four hurricane-style lanterns hung from the knotted ropes from the poles and held the ceiling. Each lamp had a large reflector surrounding it like a clamshell. The effect was that the light from all four lamps concentrated on the table which, in turn, received additional illumination to other lamps that howled down the corners of the sheet. Little tip for you, hurricane lamps throw a lot of light, but they throw out a lot of heat too. The room was hot and stuffy and the faint wisps of smoke on all six lamps lent the air to the hazy look. I turned my chest light on and pointed at the paper. Can we turn off some of these lamps and vent the room a bit? I coughed. You're a paying customer, Al replied with a grin. Now's the time to be demanding. He snake north for one of the kids to open up the flap outside, and then he doused three of the lamps. A slight breeze wafted in to stir up the haze. I glanced over my shoulder and saw a handful of laughing children standing in the doorway, fanning the air with the sheets of what looked like plywood. Engineers who use manual labor rather than build a fan... I suddenly had my doubts. What do you need? Al asked eagerly. I returned my focus to him. Airship, I said a big one, also stronger than you've ever built before. He held a coal in one hand and dunked it into the ring pot. Yet, he didn't write anything on the sheet of paper. It remained blank for a moment. How strong? he asked. I did some quink mental arithmetic. Strong enough to hold together going roughly 400 leagues in a clack. He didn't even bat an eye. I see. You're aware that our engines are somewhat slower than that. Yes, I agreed. We'll supply the engines. My crew will soon unload a... Well, we'll call it a room. This ship will be built into around this room. This room will be our engines and control room. I see, he said. The quill still hadn't touched the paper. It also must be airtight, I said. We're going to take it outside the atmosphere of your world. I see. And I need regular maneuvering engines and control for when our engines are unavailable. Yes. Room for ten people plus supplies for a year's voyage. Yes. What else is there? Oh, I said. Internal plumbing. The quill didn't move for the longest time. He then sighed and bent over the paper. You are lucky you are a wealthy man, he said, warning me. Leave me now to work out on some preliminaries. I stood there for a moment, feeling foolish. Now the call hit the paper, I was scribbling furiously. It looked like notes, but even though I could somewhat understand the written language, it seemed like so much gibberish to me. What was the baluster condenser array? A hand touched my shoulder and I spun around to find Shide grinning at me. Best to leave the Kavojas to do the Kavoging thing in peace, I. Care to join me at the Packard Drum for a rematch? Every instinct in my body said no. That was a terrible idea. So why did I say, yeah, sounds great? Two hours later, I staggered back into the field, feeling as if I'd been buried up to my neck in a field at the World Cup, and my head painted with a black and white checkerboard pattern. Red beer was not any less potent than black. You have been warned. The field slithered beneath me like it was greased rollers or something. I had to take a serpentine path to get to my destination, which happened to be Volson's shuttle. I clung to the side of it for stability as the world seesawed around me. I closed my eyes and tried to make everything settle down. Jason, Volson's voice fell from nearby. Are you ill? The vultures in the armor were churning away at top speed, and I felt the tiniest shard of sobriety poke through the alcohol fume haze. I cracked an eye open and saw the hazmat suit looking at me. Wilson, I said only with a trace of slur to my voice. I need to get into your, um, shuttle. She took a step back. The engines are offline and biolocked to me, she warned. You cannot operate the craft even if you have a sample of my genetic material. I closed my eyes and concentrated on my next words. Don't need to use engines. Just make a phone call. Use communicator. She paused as she thought about this. You wish to contact Diablade, she asked. I nodded, regretting it almost the moment sent me sprawling, settling for my limited use of verbal skills. 
Yes, I said, want a private conversation where no one can listen in. Armors. Armors computer. Not enough range. I understand, she admitted. Then she touched the wall beside me and it disappeared. I stumbled inside and the control room was much like the one I saw in the launch when I was ferried to Earth so many months ago. It was a small, featureless room with a circular table in the middle. There were no chairs for sitting, as it wasn't designed for humans to use. She touched the table and tapped a few commands, then she walked out of the room and left me alone. Naya, I asked hesitantly. Affirmative, Captain, the ship answered. I sighed in relief as I slumped against the wall and slid down to the floor. I hoped that it would help my armor scrub out my bloodstream as I sat down. I don't know why it would, but it felt good to not stand. Status and probes, I asked. Probes have returned, the ship answered. And, I asked, did you locate any other doors in the ship? Affirmative, Captain, I reported. However, they have been sealed. Sealed, I asked. How? Unknown process, the ship admitted. Query the station's automated systems. The airlock you entered is the only operational entrance in the station. It was like I feared. The sphere's automatic defenses would only allow us entry to one port. I hadn't challenged it originally, as it didn't really matter where we went in. But now, it was a problem. We were as far away as possible from the land of ferry, and, oddly enough, these seemed to be the only doors that were open for business. Why did it not feel like a coincidence to me? Someone had gone through a lot of effort to make sure that something in the ferry was hard to reach as possible. In fact, it was not for Volson's ship ability to fold up into a compact, and it would be essentially impossible. Not a coincidence, I was sure of that. Do the others know? I asked. None have asked about the other entrances, the ship answered. It appears they believe their automated defenses are the reason they are limited to a single airlock. I nodded and groaned. I would figure it out soon enough, same as the way that I had. They weren't stupid, just distracted. In the meantime, are you able to break the seals in any of the doors? I asked. The ship was quiet. Unwise, Captain, the ship answered. There may be defenses that I am unable to detect, and it may compromise hull integrity. But can you do it? I asked. Unknown, the ship admitted. Fine, I said. You have half a year to figure it out. Send our probes or whatever you have to the door that is closest to the exact opposite side of the sphere that we rented. See what you can do with it. Affirmative, Captain. And the prisoners? I thought about it. Just keep them quiet for the next few months. Do what you have to, but don't kill them. Affirmative, Captain. I sat there for a moment and thought about things. My head felt a little less fuzzy, but not much. Dyer, I asked. Yes, Captain. Did you find any more of those unauthorized modifications in your system? I asked. Several, the ship confirmed, including a homing beacon that I believe was used to track our movements. All have been eliminated. I rubbed my eyes. They were heavy and exhaustion. Any sign of additional ships? None, Captain, Dyrus replied. Shall I continue to monitor? Yes, I said. And if you spot anything, that all, then try and contact me on this, um channel, or whatever it is called. I can't promise that I'll always be on. If I don't answer, keep repeating the message until I do. Understood, Captain. Thank you, Dyer, I said as I climbed to my feet. It's a pleasure working with you. It's a pleasure serving you, Captain, the ship responded before cutting the connection. Was it alcohol, or did I detect a hint of actual warmth in the ship's voice? I shook my head and exited the ship. Balson stood outside waiting. Where are we sleeping? I asked her. She stuck an arm out and pointed in a nearby ramshack or shack. The kin maintain lodgings over there, she said. I understand that I've set up a room for you for the night, and will help you find more suitable lodgings while the ship is being built. Lodgings, I mumbled. How long do they think it'll take? Estimates are not final, she admitted, and they do not speak to me directly, but it seems that they are talking about a, a parser, I believe they're calling it. I cursed. It was another month. What did I expect? I stumbled off without another word and staggered into the direction of the shack. The shack, as it turned out, was merely a closest in the collection of shacks. It was a regular shanty town with low wooden buildings with muddy paths trampled between them. Almost all the shacks sat upon the stilts that raised them a few inches off the ground. 
Crude stairs and occasionally ladders allowed people to access the homes. Curtains formed doorways almost as often as actual doors, and none of the windows appeared to have glass. As I walked, a swarm of children streamed out of the gaps in the alleys between the houses and circled me, laughing uproariously as they began pushing, pulling, and shoving on me to steer me towards one of the houses. With my enhanced strength, I could have resisted, but saw no reason to. I allowed myself to be led inside. The kin don't use beds, I discovered, nor do people have their own bedrooms. Most families simply have one shared room that decorated with piles of fur and blankets. The pile of material serves as a mattress, blankets, pillows for everyone. They can assemble them with their own needs. I was led to half shoved in an unoccupied corner of the room. The room was dark and I had no idea how many people were in the room with a slumpy mattress of fabric and furs. Four at least. Three of them were sleeping, but I saw one silhouette lift up enough before my entrance to give me a sleepy wave before collapsing back into its cocoon of fabric. Considering the circumstances, it seemed to be a marvelous idea. I kicked my legs into the fabric and formed a pouch. I stood inside the fabric and either side collapsed inwards as my weight settled into it. I was enveloped like a womb, different from a bed but not uncomfortable. Perhaps the engineers were on to something after all. I took off my helmet and felt a chill of the night air seeping in through the cracks of the wall to touch my exposed face. I adjusted and much more covering padding as I decided to escape the chill. Not that it mattered with armor. Closing my eyes, I allowed myself to fall into a deep slumber in this unfamiliar room. My dreams were strange, that wasn't unusual anymore, but these seemed to be just regular dreams rather than my subconscious trying to mind meld. That is, of course, unless Admiral Akbar was a subtle warning from him, but Akbar was working with the grill in the huddle house, so I have my doubts there. I awoke to find myself still in a pile of fabrics, a shaft of sunlight spearing the gloom and let me know morning had arrived. There was a familiar weight upon my chest, and I thought the first large pile of fabric had fallen on top of me, so I reached over and shoved them off. I touched the leg. I looked up and saw a girl that was straddling my chest. She was pretty. A blonde hair cut short just below her ears, bright blue eyes. She looked to be about 19 and wore a dingy coveralls that were favoring amongst the kin. She smiled at me and licked her lips. I realized that my own lips felt suspiciously damp and there was an unfamiliar taste in my mouth. Oh, how, I said in English. Her eyes widened. It works, she exclaimed before rolling off of me and tumbling off the pile of fabric into the door. Just what the hell just happened? I grabbed my helmet and half dug and swamp swam my way out of the confines of the fabric cave that had gripped me. I ended up boosting the false fields and the armor from flinging them off of me. I jumped to the floor and bolted out the door. The girl was nowhere to be seen. There were kin walking about in their normal semi-random fashion, but a sense of purpose in their stride. I wanted to ask one of them if they knew where the girl had run to, but something in the way that they seemed to avoid my gaze caused me to hold my tongue. They knew, I realized. This was cover for her escape. I pushed past them and strode towards Volson's shuttle. I was surprised to see that it was already outlined by a framing of sorts and footprints of future airship. A rectangle of iron wood stretched out and covered most of the length of the field, only to taper after a surrounding alien shuttle. I estimated its length to be closer to a hundred feet in length. Crossbeams of iron wood connected the long sides of the rectangle in their opposite ends. The wood was joined by scrapping away half the width of the board and then sliding the two boards together so that the ends overlapped. A hole was then drilled into them and the wooden peg was nailed into that, to my horror glued in place. Then, odder still, the joints were further reinforced by drilling smaller holes and looping silk through the crisscrossing pattern. A handful of workers were busy hammering, gluing and stitching this frame together. I saw my companion sitting next to the shuttle. Heather sat on the ground with tears streaming from her eyes. Lee stood next to her. He looked angry, but, as far as I could tell, had not acted upon it yet. The professor saw me coming and was half shouting reproaches of my behavior before I had a chance to commit an offense. Don't be angry, the professor ordered. She was just trying to help. What the hell? I looked Lee for help. He was quiet. 
Well, that was marginally better than the last time when the crew members were reduced to tears, but this had better not become a thing. What happened? I asked. Has no one seen a blonde teenage girl run through you? I think she kissed me. Had the sobs were renewed. Oh, how, oh, how, oh, how. I was trying to help, she sobbed. I didn't think that you and the professor should all all the responsibility of communicating. So, so, I was trying to learn the local language and... What did you do, Heather? I asked. I was just talking to them, she wailed. They were so impressed that I was learning the language as fast as I was and... I was flattered and I told them about the symbiote. I didn't think it was a secret. Heather... They wanted to know how to get one. She said quickly, still looking up. I said you gave it to me. They kept questioning me and I tried not to answer, but they wouldn't let up and... And... I groaned. Something tells me that by this time tomorrow the entire camp will be infected, I muttered. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry, she said. What was I supposed to say to that? I couldn't very well yell at her. I was the one that used the patient zero for the little play game. Madagascar probably wouldn't even hold out in this one. I rubbed my eyes and tried to think. Okay, I said, first thing first. Heather, stop crying. I want you to continue your language lessons. She sniffed once and then shot me a shocked look. Jason, she squeaked. Look what I did. We can't talk English and keep things hidden from them anymore. Which means we'll have to close our helmets and use the communicators now, won't it? I countered. But now, in the meantime, we can say we are having nothing to hide from them. She sniffed again and blinked away a few tears. She still looked like she was miserable, but also surprised. She seemed shocked that I hadn't exploded in rage. Anxiety, I remembered. Also, there was her father. The man's temper was legendary. Language lesson, I repeated. And if anyone asks you to transfer the symbiote to them, you agree with no slapping. Jason, she squealed. Eyes wide, I broke my gaze and looked at the rest of them. That includes all of you, I said. We're a corrupt of people. They didn't need to trick us. In fact, we intended to infect them all along. We did, Heather stammered. I nodded and jerked my chin to indicate where Volson stood in a hazmat suit. We need them to be able to talk to our technical advisor after all. Heather shot me an odd look. Confusion, relief, disappointment, all of the above. None of the above. I looked away and glared at Volson instead. She retreated a step away from my gaze. You, I said, are coming with me to Al's tent. I'll eat my helmet if he's not already infected. You wish me to discuss with him technical details on how to join with my ship? He asked timidly. In part, I admitted, but mostly I want you to look freaky while I discuss the other matter. What other matter? Heather asked suspiciously. Be negotiating the contract, of course, I said as I turned in the direction of the tent. Sneaky little bastard thinks they can go around my back. He'd better rethink a few dozen pounds of iron after this little stunt. I only caught Lee's face for a second as I turned, but I saw the skull transform into a knowing smirk. You heard the captain, my first officer barked. Everyone pucker up. We've got a town to infest. If they answered, I didn't hear it. I had already cleared the tail end of the framework and was now stomping my way towards Al's tent with my unwilling alien science officer in tow. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 36 Written by Semi Loki Al was tough, I'll give him that. Even with the appearance of a bug-shaped alien in his studio, he tried to keep his cool. Of course, when he started to flush as I insulted his ancestry in English, I thought I made my point. The symbiote, Hal said crisply, is separate from our original contract, and I did what was good for the kin. Good point, I said, slipping easily back into Sphirian. Make a list of what supplies you have on hand for my crew and raid before we set off. I'll take some consideration with you. He cocked his head to one side. I failed to see the comparison, he said. We have lost nothing. You retain your gift of languages. Surely the experience with Yiva was not so disagreeable. If she had asked for my consent, it might not be, I said, but acting without my knowledge or consent is the problem. Since I can't trust you to act in my best interest, I think I should take my business elsewhere. He snorted. None but the kin could take on such a massive project, he counted. 
Oh, I asked, your people out there are gluing and tying things to frame together. That makes you think that the airship will survive supersonic speeds. My tongue did a flip-flop as I realized that there was no word for supersonic in Spirian. I had clutched a word of my own involving a concept of faster than and the word of background noise. However, the words didn't mesh as the adjective implied and a concrete object instead of an abstract sound. He was clearly confused. Jason is correct, Wilson interjected. The design you are working on will not survive the stresses of heating of travel of such speeds. Heat, Al sputtered, not even pretending to understand Wilson. The high altitudes result in cooling, not heat. What nonsense is this? At speed your craft are capable of traveling, she said, the heat is negligible, it is true, but for the speeds that we're discussing. She kept talking, but the symbiote was no longer capable of translating. At least, not for my ears. The word like fluid dynamics and aerodynamic heating were mixed in with several buzzwords that made no sense outside of Boeing. Oddly enough, Al seemed to be better at keeping up with this discussion. What are you talking about is not possible, Al declared firmly. If you calculate the... And more buzzword bingo took place. Somewhere in there, the discussion moved away from the theory of particulates, as Volson spoke to him as he began sketching out the diagram of wing with arrows passing over the leading edge. Um, I snatched the drawing away from him. Wait, he called out and tried to yank the sheet of paper back from me. I need that. Really, I said, because I seem to recall that you were arguing earlier that anything you gained from us that enhanced the kin was entirely separate from the deal with the airship. Receiving the key to figuring out how to make heavier than air aircraft feasible seems to be outside the original contract. Yes. His shoulders slumped and his eyes narrowed. You expect us to create an airship the likes of which the Sphere has never seen or learned anything new? He asked. No, I said. You're free to learn on your own, but I will not give you information you benefit from. You took something from me without consulting me. That will be the last uneven exchange. So how much iron is this doodle of yours worth? You think you can blackmail me? He asked. It is not blackmail, and yes, yes I can, I said. This project and everything you learn, everything that we can teach you, will have you on edge over the competition for many years. The kin will prosper from this, and you know it. Refusing to negotiate is just you being stubborn as the potential wealth of your bloodline far outshadows the cost that you may incur in negotiating. His eyes blazed. They burned through me. I was preparing myself for another onslaught from him, but instead his face suddenly brightened as he slapped the table with his free hand and laughed. By the void, he chuckled. I haven't had this much fun in years. So you think you've got a crooked old man backed into a corner, huh? I was taken aback by his change in tone. I never said that you were crooked, I counted. Then you're a fool, he said, and I'm saying it to you. I'm a crooked old man who will scheme and cheat and do everything he can within the letter of the deal to get as much from someone as possible. What do you say to that? Sound business practice, I conceded. Anything not specified in the contract is up for grabs. He grinned toothily at me, and now some young whelp tries to dangle a morsel in front of me and thinks he's too juicy to resist. That anything I do is a petulant and he thinks that he can call the shots because he's too big of a treat. Except he and I both know that he needs me, so he's just as stubborn as well. Possibly, I said, but I have something that you don't. What's that? he asked. I shrugged. I'm a young whelp, I said. I can come back after you're gone and see if your successor is more willing to give in. It was a bald-faced lie, for all I knew I didn't have that sort of time. But as we hadn't mentioned anyone why we seemed to be in such a hurry to do this job, we had no proof that I was lying. He blinked in surprise and laughed once more. Oh, very clever young man, he said, very clever. So I either act now and make sure someone takes proper care of the kid, or you come back to exploit my successor. Pretty much, I agreed. He licked his lips and glanced from me to the drawing in my hand to Volson. I think, he said slowly, I have uh, a compromise that you might find interesting. Half an hour later, I stood in front of my crew and tried to explain it to them. They were still weren't getting it. Run that by us one more time, Lee begged me. Maybe we should have asked Volson to join us to explain what she heard. 
Heather suggested. Maybe Jason just misheard. I didn't mishear anything, I said. He jotted me down their family chart, along with the four of you. For the last time, we're kin now. Kin, Heather repeated, like part of the Nordedicura kin, the gypsy engineers. That's what I've been trying to tell you. What's more, I'm an heir. An heir to what? She asked. Al's job, I said. He put me in a third line of succession. He said that I already have a better grasp of subtleties of contract negotiation than his second grandson, so he figured that he may as well put it to use. You mean that he and the two other people die in your lead kin? She asked. Just this tribe, I corrected her. There are multiple Nordetic kin tribes, but we're being adopted into this one. Lloyd Steamer is so impressed with us that it's officially declaring all Earth's kinsmen. We're just the first ones to be officially adopted. The ceremony will be tonight, by the way. You mean to say that we're now locals? Jack spoke up. Dual citizenship. I shrugged. I guess so. This is marvelous, the professor said. It sounds wonderful. This will be a unique experience for us as, um... Uh, professor, I interrupted. That's not all of it. No, she asked. I nodded. The kin practice a sort of, um, collectivism philosophy. The good news is that the iron we brought in, that's still ours. We're a part of the tribe, so we would be paying ourselves. We can use a little or as much of it as we want when the construction of the ship. Valson and Al are already drawing up plans to maximize the use of what iron we have. And the bad news, Heather prompted. I cleared my throat. We're, um... The standing army for the tribe, I explained. What we own, including Dyer, is now part of the tribe's possession. If they need to go to war, we're expected to lend them the resources we have to them. That shut them up. He's planning a slaughter. The professor squeaked, like Captain Cook in the Hawaiian Islands. What? Lee asked as on our behalf. The Hawaiian Islands were divided by the Westerners that first landed there, she said quickly. Each island had its own independent government. Then Captain Cook arrived with his cannons and a local chieftain named Kamakemaha saw the potential of using an amazing weapon to unite the islands under his rule. Al is planning the same thing. Not exactly, I say quickly. Don't get too excited here. It's a little more complicated than that. Al's title of chief engineer. He's responsible for making decisions regarding construction and planning for the good of the tribe. Warfare falls into the dominion of the war minister who... Um, happens to be the third heir in this case. They all stared at me. You're the war minister? Lee asked. I nodded. I have command of the most powerful weapon in the tribe, so it made sense, I said. And he doesn't really want me for war. Not declaring war, anyway. He wants me to prevent war. Well, prevent a physical war. I don't understand, Heather admitted. I sighed. Here it comes. We have to share a lot of information with them to get the ship capable of surviving what we would need it to, I explained. That information will give this tribe a distinct advantage over the neighboring tribes. The professor got it first. Economic warfare, she said in a low voice. He's going to dominate the market and drive other tribes out of business. I don't think it will be intentional, I admitted. This tribe is going just to go so far ahead that they'll stomp out the competition. He says that when it's happened before, some of the confrontations can be, um, violent. So he adopts the most technologically advanced fighters around him to his tribe, Heather said, forcing everyone else to play nice as he undercuts their business. Or, I said with a frown, they merge with his tribe. He's open to that. The professor glared at me. You're still Captain Cook in the scenario, she said. You're you just using dollars rather than cannonballs. Hein in guts, actually, I corrected her. It's the same thing, she said. This is wrong, Jason. We're upsetting the balance of this world with our interference. It was now my turn to play the history angle. Musa of Mali, I said. Her anger evaporated and she seemed to collapse inward slightly. Her eyes darted guilty to the box of iron and still sat in the middle of the field where it had been dropped. Oh, she said in a tiny voice. Oh dear. Who? Lee said impatiently. Is Musa of Mali. 14th century king of Mali, the professor said as if speaking on autopilot. He was a Muslim and made the pilgrimage to Mecca. Along the way, he demonstrated his vast wealth by spending extravagantly and giving gold to any beggars he met. 
Nice guy, Lee said dismissively. The professor faced him with a puzzled look. That single pilgrimage disrupted the entire economy of several nations in northern Africa all over the decade, she said. Now they all looked at the box of ingots and shared a look of guilt across their faces. They turned to face me as if I had an explanation. I didn't think about it, I stammered. I just thought that lots of money meant, you know. They knew. They didn't make things better. I took a deep breath. Look, gang, I said, I don't know what to tell you. Anything we do is likely to have an impact, and it's a big world. The interruption caught me off guard, more due to who had said the actual words. What? I asked, turning to face Jack, who sat on the ground in quiet contemplation. I said, she repeated, it's a big world, a lot bigger than Africa. People have airships here too, and dinosaurs, and who knows what else. We're talking about a few hundred pounds of iron spread across a bigger world than anything that you can imagine. What's the impact? But, I stammered, how many kin tribes are out there, she asked. If they unite while we're out there across the globe and fall upon Al, what is he going to do? Ask them to wait a year for you to come back with guns. We're thinking too locally. Besides, this isn't gold. I stared at her and Jack actually squirmed, as if she were uncomfortable with having so many eyes focused on her. Gold has been valuable forever, but why, she went on, it's useful in electronics now. But what about before? It's valuable because it's rare and it's pretty, but iron is something they actually need. It's valuable because they can use it. It does something, and instead of giving it to beggars and whoever we see while marching to Mecca, we're giving it to engineers, the ones who'll actually do something with it to improve people's lives. No matter how much metal we give them, they'll need more. She looked away. Just seems different, she murmured. I looked from her to Lee. Lee, I said. He shook his head. No way, he said. I ain't that smart. She didn't get that from me. Jack blushed. Well, I said, you were the least smart enough to bring her here with us. Screw the Prime Directive. Let's go make some engineers filthy rich. Lee and Heather cheered. The professor looked uncertain, but at least didn't argue. Jack's blush just deepened. Who wants to go with me to find out more about this tribal adoption ceremony? Luckily, they all did. The adoption ceremony turned out to be nothing particularly formal. Engineers, it seemed, were the same on Sphere as on Earth. They were less concerned about the actual formalities and more with getting drunk as efficiently as possible. To that end, Shide found himself being adopted into the tribe at the same time upon my recommendation that he was an efficiency expert in this particular field. As the newly appointed master of ceremonies, it came down to Shide to determine the appropriate degree of hazing for us to be full members. A stage was erected from the lost timber in the middle of the field. Then night fell and a massive bonfire lit to illuminate the stage. Shide stepped onto the stage wearing the traditional coveralls of the kin. Jason, Lee, Jack, Medakai, and Heather, he called out. Stand up, please. He stood all together. He pointed at each of us in turn. You, 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 and you, he said, and as he pointed at us, you're all in the Kavodjing family. Now, let's get drunk and anyone who's still able to walk come sunrise is out of the family. The massive cheer went up as barrels of beer were rolled out onto the stage. Al smiled at me in approval in my insight into recommending such a gifted orator to him. A flagon of beer was shoved in my hands. Considering the end of Shai's speech, I felt the best not to risk my newfound status as the good graces of the kin. I downed the flagon and tried not to choke too much as it burned my throat. The empty flagon was ripped from my grasp and a full one was shoved into it. A dozen or so kin assembled near the fire with homemade instruments, the likes of which I had never seen before. Stringed instruments, woodwinds, and things that defined definition, they began playing a jaunty tune that was somewhere between an Irish jig and a camel dying a slow death. People shoved beer at their band in a desperate bid to get them to stop playing. While a few other players dropped off as they became progressively more inebriated, it didn't improve the playing of the surviving members. It soon became hard to tell if any of them were even pretending to play the same tune. I felt Meaty's hand slam to my shoulder. The armor helped deal with some of the blow, but I still staggered a bit anyway. Welcome to the tribe, Jans bellowed in my ear. 
He apparently was one of the drunks who believed the drunker he was, the more deaf you became. Thanks, I shouted back. Unnecessarily, as a false kinsman had descended upon a band with a variety of staffs, axes, and other improvised weapons, and were requesting an intermission upon pain of death. Sorry about jumping the ranks ahead of you. No worries, he shouted back. This time it was necessary to sound the bludgeoning instruments of but it made a racket. He waited until the remains were being hauled from the bonfire before continuing. That's a right awful job there, he went on. You're welcome to it. Thanks, again. He chuckled and drank deeply of his own flagon. Did you hear the latest mad scheme from the Chief E? He asked me. Chief E? Oh, Chief Engineer. No, I said. What is Al the hell up to? I had been drinking quite a bit by then. Madness, Johns explained. He's going to make double hulled design. Inner hull is where the strength is. Ironwood is actual steel banding. On top of that is silk twines too. They was going to cover the whole thing in plaster. Plaster, I asked. He snorted as if he thought I'd made a joke. Oh, I know they say that you can make a boat out of it, but who ever heard of plaster on an airship? The gas bags are going to be only half inflated. Half inflated? I know, he said. Says that bug thinks that the weird ship of hers will provide most of the lift. The gas bags will only be inflated all the way if the shop's working. But here's the really weird thing. The gas bags and the hull are going to be surrounded by another hull. A streamlined one meant to deal with heat. Heat! Who gets hot up in the air, I ask you? Heat. Wait, does that mean they already worked out a solution? The second hull, I interrupted. What is it going to be made out of? That's the daft part, he shouted at me. This time, it was definitely unnecessary, and quite a few heads had wheeled in our direction. It'll be some part of fireproof cough of some sort, with the heat sinks right behind it. Heat! Nans, I said in a lower voice. Maybe you should, you know, lower your voice a little. What? He bellowed at me. Can't hear you. Look, I'll tell you more in the morning after seeing our old parts got good thinking. I shrank into my armor and sent a fleeting look to where Al stood nearby. A couple of the burly, anti-tone, deaf band militia stood next to him with their dented weaponry. Al pointed at John's and made a rather cryptic motion with his hands. I slunk away as fast as I could without leaving skid marks on the field behind me. More drinks were shoved my way. I tried declining them. This was met with suspicion. I drank, then I was asked to be the judge in some sort of homemade hooch contest. Again, I declined, citing the lack of experience. This was also met with suspicion. I declared lucky number nine with the lingering taste of kerosene to be the winner. I tried crawling back to the cabin where I had started out the day. A couple of burly men intercepted me and dragged me back. Shide was waiting for me and wanted to demonstrate his newest invention, which seemed to be little more than a funnel with a rubber hose attached to it. The hose was inserted in my mouth and a keg was tipped into the funnel. Things started to get blurry after that. Somewhere along the line, I ended up confessing my darker secrets to a peacock that, apparently, I had stolen from some person's private collection. I also have a hazy memory of being up on the stage with my own homemade instrument, which I dubbed the Mandolin Ozither of Phone, and banged it on the stage. This was met with approval as it was the best music that they'd heard that night, and several couples began dancing with the arrhythmic clubbing. The last thing I remembered was giving a speech about how we would replace one-third of the government officials with watermelons, as that would accomplish just as much in the their term of office, but a watermelon at least had some use. Five people had joined my political party. After that, I blacked out. I woke up in pain. The first shaft of sunlight in the day had... Uh, Somehow managed to defy conventional laws of physics and slithered under several layers of blankets to burn its way through my closed eyelids and cook my raw and bloodshot eyeballs underneath. I tossed away a few layers of blankets and slammed my palms of my hands over my eyes to try and smother the flames. Surprisingly, having my armored ham slammed into my bare face didn't hurt as bad as I expected. I cracked open my eyes and found out why. They weren't armored. Neither were my arms. I slipped my hands under the blanket and felt and round for any traces of armor. I didn't feel any. Technically speaking, 
It isn't necessary to be a sky-clad under the armor. Eh, however, any garment worn under there just is a barrier that interferes with the perfectly balanced closed system and armor offers. I had elected to go commando this time. I was now regretting that decision. Crap, I muttered and tried to sit up. I couldn't. A bare feminine leg draped over my chest from while doing that. Crap, I said louder this time. Jason, could you keep it down? My head hurts. Ah, voice, and apparently the leg both belonged to Heather. Crap, I repeated, much, much louder this time. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 37, written by Semi Loki. My setup was as much as I could, as it turned out wasn't very far. Between the weight on my chest and the movement of the fabric beneath me, I couldn't seem to get any leverage. I popped an elbow under me and rocked as much as possible. Finally, I lifted up enough to see more room. Heather lay half covered in a depression just beside me. Bare shoulders sticking out from under the blankets implied a level of undress similar to my own. Under other circumstances, I'd like to explore that further, but I was in a panic. Where was my armor? Where was... Oh, I saw mine and what I assumed was Heather's armor laying in a discarded pile a few feet away. It seemed to have been removed with near <clears throat> reckless abandon. That was so not good. I wrapped a scrap of material around my waist and did my best to extricate myself without waking Heather. She mumbled something in her sleep as I pulled away. I scrambled down to the heap of furs and fabric until I reached the armor. Figuring out which bits were mine were pretty easy. They were the larger, smellier, and more distressingly vomit cake bits. I slapped a few bits to address the modesty issues and tossed the rest loose bits into the sheet of fabric. I yanked up the corners of the bundle and managed to shift it out of the room with only a bit of loud clanking. I got as far as the front door before I hastily began slamming more pieces in place. Boots, shin plates, leg plates, crotch guard are ready in place. Thank you very much. Midroof, torso, shoulder pads, and arm guards, forearm guards, and gloves. Practice may be more efficient at slamming the bits into place with whatever occult locking mechanism that had slinched down onto my skin. But I was nervous and upset that made things clumsier. Plus, it was dark. Still, with only a few embarrassing moments, I managed to get everything more or less in place. Calming my breathing, I stepped through the curtain doorway and to the outside. I found Jack standing outside with a disgusted look on her face. She turned away and stormed off without saying a word. What's in the world? How could she have... Oh, this wasn't my cabin. Crap, 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 crap. I was in a completely different part of the camp. As, I guess, this was Heather had been stashed for the first night. I didn't know about sleeping arrangements and others, but uh, apparently Jack was more familiar with them. How had she known to wait for me here? What the hell had I done last night? I stumbled off in the direction of the shuttle. I was still early morning and the kin had been up late night partying, and it would be understandable for no additional construction had been done in the future airship, which is why the amount of progress that had taken place during the first few hours past dawn surprised me so much. Gunwell surrounding Volson shuttle were now truly in place. Each one rose half as high as I was tall, and they looked as if they meant to go higher. The walls were straight, and I saw a network of steel brackets reinforcing the slabs of wood. Steel. They were using steel. The ship was worth a king's ransom already, and it was still in the early construction stages. Workers scrambling all around the skeletal rigging, and even as I watched, the ship began to take shape. I never heard him approach, and I didn't see anything either. I just felt a disapproving glare. What happened, Lee? I asked without looking around. You uh, disgraced yourself, Captain, he answered. I know that, I said as I spun around. I mean, how badly? Will anyone still talk to me? Lee's eyes had a haggard look to them. He looked like he hadn't slept in a few days. His jaw was firm, though. Your friends will talk to you regardless of your antics, he replied. That's not an encouraging answer, I replied with a glare of my own. Ah, his face was still passive and I rubbed my own. I can barely remember anything, I said. They kept shoving more and more drinks at me and I wouldn't get mad if I didn't drink them. 
Let them be angry. I tried, I protested. I even tried to escape. Shai put me under that beer bong thing that he invented. Lee's face softened a little. You're the captain, he said. You should have expected that would focus your attentions on you. I had hoped the armor's blood filter would save me. They probably saved you from alcohol poisoning, he confirmed. Do you remember much from last night? Very, very little, I confessed. Just tell me that I didn't do anything that we can't fix. He shook his head. You were mostly just an embarrassment, he told me. I think I counted seven marriage proposals. I felt my face grow hot. Did they propose to me, or did I propose to them? I asked. Both, he said. Crap. Another horrifying thought struck me. Man or woman, I asked. Both, he said. Double crap. I looked away from him, and Jack, I asked. She had enough sense not to drink, he told me, so she was fine. No, I said. I mean, have you talked to her recently? Jason, she might have caught me, um, sneaking out of Heather's cabin this morning. Oh, crap, Lee muttered. That's not good. I winced. I was hungover, but the desperation of the morning had given me the strength to ignore most of the pain. Now that the adrenaline rush was fading, however, the hangover was returning with a vengeance. That's two nights in a row that you've been drinking and woke up in a woman with no memory, he observed. Keep in mind that this is coming from an alcoholic. I think you may have a problem. I have several problems, I shouted, and then regretted it. My own voice hurt my ears. I have several problems, I repeated. Not the least of which is a psychopathic teenager with a crush who may go on a stab jealousy rampage. Am I likely to find a pet rabbit in a stew pot, Lee? I doubt it, he said. We don't have a rabbit. That's not what I mean, I said. What do you think she's going to do? To be honest, I have no idea, he admitted with a shake of his head. Life for the homeless camps is a tough. She really didn't show much interest in boys. If you were there, you might understand why. This is a new thing. I groaned. Did you actually have sex with Heather? He asked me suddenly. What? I sputtered. You don't remember anything, right? He asked. Are you certain you had sex with her? I was naked sleeping next to her, I said. What do you think? After a night of drinking, he asked me and shrugged. It's hard to tell. If waking up naked after a pender meant that you had sex with whoever was next to you, then I've got a bunch of bastard half-park bench children out there. Not helping Lee. What do you want from me? He asked. I may not be the best person for advice when it comes to making sound life choices. How badly have I screwed up when I'm looking at a homeless ex-soldier with a substance abuse, PTSD, and a large issues for advice? How low have I sunk that I'm genuinely disappointed that he can't help? I left him there and I debated seeking out the professor. She was older and, yeah, she seemed to handle her own life more so than any of the rest of us. That said, she also had a pretty firm moral compass, and I think that I had wandered off the map into the part labeled Hilar B. Dragons. I found myself walking towards the patch drum instead. That was a mistake, and I knew it. Fortunately, no sooner had my boots touched the cobblestones than I heard someone calling my name from behind. I turned and saw Heather racing towards me. Did I say, fortunately, I really need to drop the word from my vocabulary? Jason! She panted as she ran towards me. I've been looking everywhere for you. You slipped out this morning while I was still asleep. So much for the hope that her memories were as bad as mine and I could apply her for a plausible deniabilities. Uh, yeah, I stammered. I was afraid that it might be, um, awkward. She tilted her head and regarded me suspiciously. Last night, you announced to the entire camp that I was the most beautiful woman that you'd ever seen, she replied. So beautiful that if I had a brother, you'd sleep with him, and now you're worried about awkward. I forgot how to form a coherent sentence from that moment. I didn't. I don't recall. I said, what? I babbled. Then you vomited all over yourself, she elaborated. I did? She nodded. As well as that flute player guy with no one seemed to care about that, she added. But yes, you declared your intentions to sleep with my imaginary brother, then vomited. I thought it was about time for you to sleep it off. You couldn't remember where your own cabin was, so I took you to mine. A strange tension that I hadn't realized was gathering at the back of my neck loosed up suddenly. Then, you mean, uh, we didn't, uh... She looked puzzled and then her eyes widened. Jason, she snapped. What sort of girl do you think I am? You were half out of your mind. 
Um, I said, reverting back to my native language of babbling. I just thought, uh, you know, I can't remember anything. And when I woke up naked next to you, I, um... Uh, you were covered in vomit, she said, angry now. You think that's a sort of fetish for me? No, it's not that, I said. But I was naked, you see, and it looked like you were. She threw her hands up in the air. And what of it, she said. We had to strip naked in front of each other, that the hibernation thing. The entire crew has seen me naked. I blinked at her. What? I asked. She paused and I saw her calm down slightly. She tapped her chin with her finger before continuing. Oh yeah, she murmured. You woke up after the rest of us, didn't you? Wait, I said. You mean you all woke up at the same time and... She nodded. Poor Lee, she said with a half smile. You should have seen his face. Suddenly sobering, her face darkened and she looked at me again. That's beside the point, she said. You shouldn't just assume because you wake up next to a naked girl that you had sex with her. Okay, I said thoughtfully. Repeat that back to me, but this time say it the way it would make sense. She huffed in frustration. You know what I mean, she said. Look, Jason, I don't know what goes in that sick, twisted mind of yours, but last night nothing happened. You were pretty much asleep by the time I got your armor off you. So, I said, you took me back to your place, you took me to your bed, you took off my clothes, you took off your clothes, jumped into the bed next to me, and I'm the sicko for assuming that there was another part. She rolled her eyes. You're impossible, she said and stormed off. What did I do, I asked. Didn't close the cajoving deal, I'll tell you that much. I turned around. Of course Shide was there. Who else would be there to kick me while I was down? Shide... I said slowly, now is not the... He stepped up beside me and slipped my arm around my shoulders. You see, my brother, he began, you have to understand that women are like cajoving airships. Oh no, oh yes, he said. If you pull the levers right, they'll take you to the heavens. But if you twiddle the wrong knob, she'll just blow gas in your face and leave you a bloody streak on the pavement. Do you see what I'm saying? No one sees what you're saying, Shide, I protested. What he means, another voice joined in, a second arm looped around my shoulders, and another side. I craned my neck to see that it was Jans. Is that woman or complicated, he said. You didn't seal the deal, and now you insulted her. I insulted her by not sleeping with her, I asked them both. Is vomit an aphrodisiac in your world, because it sort of is the opposite effect on mine. Nah, Scheid said. You don't get it. We weren't supposed to sleep with her. You were supposed to try. Then have her turn you down. That way, it's her idea. That's right, Jans added. Remember, life is a numbers game. Ask every woman you see to sleep with you. 99% will turn you down, and they feel better about themselves for rejecting someone like you. Well, that 1%, Scheid went on, they make it all worthwhile. And sometimes you even get out of it with a few coins still left in your purse. I realized that they were steering me towards the patched drum. I had been in this town for three days, and, other than the summer apartment, I had only seen one bar. I was definitely developing a problem. I shrugged their arms off my shoulders. Thanks for the advice, fellows, I said. I really appreciate it. But I think maybe I need to spend a day or so in this fine city not intoxicated, just to see what it looks like when the floor stays in one place. Suit yourself, Shide agreed, but in my opinion you've already seen the cajoving highlights. Well, I said, as much as I like the patch drum, I... Kavodge the drum, he said. I was talking about the fair Yiva. Yiva? All right, the girl who kissed me when I was knocked out. Tell us you at least sealed the deal there. Guns asked, eyes wide. I looked at him, his face fell. Brother, Shide said with obvious sympathy. You're hopeless. I walked into town after that. Sadly, I began to suspect those two were right. There didn't seem to be much of Newtown other than a couple of grimy airfields and some warehouses. Newtown was a trading village. They made their living offering a way station for airships that traveled over the oasis. It wasn't a destination, just a pit stop along the way. But it was a massive pit stop. There was an entire street of taverns much like the patch drum. Brothels were set above some of those taverns. Unlike most earthly brothels, this one featured male and female prostitutes in roughly equal numbers. There were also degrees of brothels. Some of them sold sex, but others sold lesser forms of intimacy. I saw the price list of hugs, kisses, and even a list of subjects the staff would engage in intellectually stimulating debates for a price. 
Philosophers were just another form of prostitute in Newtown. I shuddered to think what they used for baristas. I heard a commotion ahead of me and decided to investigate. The streets widened ahead of me and I found myself at the center of a square formed by four intersecting roads. A crowd had gathered in the square and seemed to be observing some sort of circus performer. A man balancing precariously on a barrel that was desperately trying to keep five balls flying through the air without dropping them, or really, himself. Everyone was so focused on the strange impromptu show that it took me a moment to realize that it was probably a purpose. Unfortunately, the realization hit me too late. It is a testament to engineering that went into the armor that, even though I could not feel the point, I could tell the object touched the small of my back with a knife. The sensation was translated to me as a series of pressure points without an associated pain. I had a hand to it to the chimera. They knew their stuff. Don't move, a voice breathed in my ear. Male, heavily accented, the scent of garlic highlighting each syllable of his speech. I wasn't wearing my helmet still, yet the armor was protecting a good 90% of my body. It wasn't like I had much to fear from the knife. On the other hand, I was now curious. This had been arranged for my benefit. Interesting. Who were they? What did they want? And how did they know that I was coming this way? I hadn't even known. All right, I said agreeably. You will step backwards, garlic breath ordered me, backwards, two paces. To your right, you will see a door with a red paint on it. When the door opens up, you will step through, slowly, and do not call for help. Wouldn't dream of it, I said. I took two steps back slowly, but I turned to my right. I saw a shop with a red door. It looked as if it had been abandoned for some time. The shutters had been closed and boarded over with glue and plywood, and the door was painted with a chipped and faded. A layer of dust coated everything, yet the door did indeed open with the noiseless hinges. I stepped through and garlic breath followed me with a knife still digging into the small of my back. The door slammed shut behind me and the room was plunged into darkness. I think that the darkness was supposed to intimidate me. They left me standing there in the dark for much longer than any sane person would need to find a match. But I was afraid. Impatient, yes, but not afraid. I resisted the urge to cross my arms and tap my foot. The light came up suddenly, causing me to blink. I was in a room surrounded by a dozen men in dirty robes. They had unkempt beards and hair. Each of them held a pistol pointed at my chest. Again, a minor threat, but not nearly as impressive as I thought. Hello, I greeted. Is this the rest of the circus? That was apparently not the response they expected. Garlic Break shoved enough harder into my spine. It took a stumbling step forward, not the distance myself from the blade. Well, not exactly. I was afraid that if the glass blade snapped that it might give away the armor's purpose. So, I acted as if I was injured and tried my best to look sheepish. You'll be silent, you wretched thirst. One of the men barked at me. He didn't separate the words at all. It was a big jumble of sounds that made it almost impossible to understand. His voice was also heavily accented. Curious, so that these two people were the same foreign area, I assumed that everyone in the Oasis spoke the same language, based on the fact that everyone I had met had so far used the same language, and had the same accent. These people seemed to come from elsewhere. We should kill him, one of the men said to the other. It was definitely a different language. I kept my face neutral, and let them plot my death. No, the other snarled. Lord Vaz wishes to speak to him. But why? the first asked. We can cut his purse from him now. Don't ask questions. Okay, so whomever this Vaz was seemed to be the man with the plan in. I smiled. Any chance I could sit down while we're waiting? I asked. Been a long day. They glared at me. Touchy, touchy. So I waited some more. Eventually a door in the back room answered and the man who could only be Lord Voz entered. Voz was different from the others in several respects. First of all, he seemed to be very well aware of the technological advances such as bathing and personal hygiene. His robes were new and freshly laundered. They were vivid red in color and swept the floor as he walked. The latter was an impressive feat as he was also grossly obese. With the color of the robes, it made him look like I was talking to a bearded tomato. His beard was long yet neatly groomed. 
The tip of it had been braided and tied up with a strip of silk ribbon. On his head he wore a red hat that made me think of a beret. He stared at me with two piggy eyes. Do you know who I am? he demanded. Rubble Skillskin? I asked. His eyes narrowed, which really meant that they almost disappeared beneath the folds of fat along with his cheeks. I am Lord Vault of the Oaks and Oasis, he puffed. From his demeanor, something that statement was meant to intimidate me. I wasn't sure which part. I decided that it was unnecessary apostrophe before the H. All right, I said. That seemed to anger him. He twisted his pudgy body and swung his arms back and me across the face. I had seen the blow coming, however, and boosted my force fields. With a gun that large, he didn't so much telegraph his movements as he lit up the entire East Coast switchboard. When he brought his arm back to strike, his gut followed, and the movement like a bumbling puppy. And when he launched his attack, his gut had apparently got frightened and reversed direction, sending shockwaves across his chest. His hand struck a force field millimeters from my face, and I twisted away, as if I'd actually been struck. So far, they seemed to be willing to talk so long as they thought that they could hurt me. I didn't want to spoil the illusion. I am a quarter sovereign of the Kalnar Empire, of the Shah, of the cult of the Vil, he said. You will show me respect. Yes, my lord, I said, in what I hoped was a subservient manner. He glared at me for a moment more and then looked at my armor. The costume, he demanded. What is it? It is the, um... Suit worn by my people, I said. We are from the oasis of the, uh, Windslow. Windslow, he asked with raised an eyebrow. I know not of this land. We are a desert people, I said. My oasis is mostly worthless desert. And yet you come here bearing such riches, he countered. Ah, here I was thinking this might be interesting. Yes, I agreed. Our harvest was very good. Harvest? he asked. Yes, I said. I am from the house of, um, Atreides, and, uh, we harvest, um, desert rice. Rice from the desert? he asked incredulously. Yes, I nodded. The rice must grow. He just stared. Oh, well, never mind. You gather these riches from sunning rice? he asked skeptically. And my wife's pig business? I said. Have you seen my wife? Beautiful woman with dark hair. Likes to kick people. That's a sign of affection in my land. Pig business. I nodded again. Yes, I knew I was meaningless, but I was winging it with all I have. The house of Harakonnen breeds large swine, I said. The animals are so huge that you can ride them. In fact, she was riding one when I first spotted her. See, I was standing on the corner of the Winslow arid zone, A, eh? and she was a fine sight to see. When, ah, my lord, a woman on a flathead ball was slowing down to take a good look at me. Be silent, he snapped. Rude, I was still working on the next verse. I suddenly realized something was very wrong with the scene. I glanced from Lord Vance to the ruffians again. They were following this man. They were half starved as this man looked like he had never missed a meal or several ancestors' lives. He must have paid them to kidnap me, but why hadn't they robbed him as well? He was there alone, no weaponry. What was going on here? They couldn't be scared of this man. Even if I didn't have the armor, I'd be hard-pressed to take him seriously. He took a step back from me and began mumbling to himself, except that it wasn't quite right. It was more like he was having a conversation with someone that was only catching half of it. Cannot tell, I don't, yes... Yes, he mumbled. The language was one that I'd never heard before, different from the others as used as well. The degenerate speaks nonsense, he said to himself, but I must find out what he knows. What is the purpose of this? Yes. The words seemed to soothe him, but it had the exact opposite effect on me. I could only think of one species that had referred to me and the entire race as degenerates. I punched my arms downward and commanded the armor to protect blades out of my gloves. The movement caught the eyes of the ruffians and the sudden appearance of two very sharp lethal blades appeared from nowhere and desired effect. They all were confused. I punched with every bit of amplified speed at the strength that I had at my command. The room exploded around me. End 
of Chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 38, written by Sebi Loki. Later, I would feel the horror, I would taste the regret, I would have nightmares where I saw a crimson-suited man with a beard split to pieces in front of me, nightmares that would leave me sitting upright in a bed sweating. On those days, I understood Lee. I was tempted to look for something, anything, that might help block the pain. Alcohol, drugs, sex, food, something to make me feel after what I'd done, or at least feel less than like terrible. I was never given a chance to give in to those temptations, however, no matter how strong they might be. It was left to nature to take its course and scab over an open wound inside me. Until that happens to someone, it is impossible to describe. No matter what I did, no matter how low I stooped or what moral principles I bent, I could always maintain the illusion that I was basically a nice guy. Really, in all of my hijinks I had never ever deliberately hurt anyone. Even when I had attacked Quack and had been more clumsiness than anything else, I hadn't really expected to hurt the guy. It was self-defense that had gotten out of hand. I was still a nice guy. This was different. There was no denying what I had done, no comfy blanket of rationalization that I could toss over it. I was now a killer. I didn't kill to protect, I didn't kill for king or country. I did it because at that moment I was scared and I could. My illusions of my sainthood died with the first stroke of that blade that day. At the time, the entire ordeal seemed to stretch out for hours. Each footstep and every muscle twitch seemed to take an eternity. I was terrified that in the eons that stretched between each movement that I made that the spell would be broken and someone would take careful aim and then I would be dead before I heard the report of the pistol. Boosting the force field wasn't the same as wearing the helmet. They compensated just a bit just in case the helmet lost or damaged during battle. But the effect of the force field was fairly short range. The strength tapered off slightly the further it got from the point of projection which in this case, was the collar of my armor. My neck was mostly bulletproof, however, by the time it reached my jawline, there was a really significant gap in the force field. Air flowed with a mild impediment, and anything packing more kinetic energy than a football kick was gently dampened but not deflected. By the time it reached my eyes, it might stop a spit wad. The force field did little more than ruffle my hairline after that. All in all, it was a bit like wearing a Kevlar scarf. I felt exposed, I felt my own movements were glacially slow. In reality, it probably lasted less than 10 seconds, and no one had a chance to get a bead on me during that time. The man in red, the quarter sovereign of the oasis that I'd never heard of, was the first of all. My erect arm swept upwards with the knuckles of my fist brushing the tip of his nose as I ran past him. A shower of red flowed from my fist as it moved. The blade had entered at the corner of his mouth on the left side of his face and exited the tip of his right eyebrow. He barely had time to start to fall before I fell upon the next man in line. This one had a pistol that was still aimed where I had been. I punched him in the chest. The blade pierced his heart. With my left hand, I sliced his neck of the man next to him and I withdrew my right hand and pointed it at the fourth man. This one was a bit of a burner. Four steps, four men dead. I spun around and turned the burners to maximum as I swept them across the room to the chest height. The rest of the kidnappers fell without so much as putting a trigger. None of them even had a chance so much as to scream. I was still moving, my speed too great to stop all at once. I collided with the falling body of a man that I had stabbed in the heart causing his corpse to bounce off the wall. I crashed into the wall a moment later with enough force to cause the ceiling to shake and release a cloud of dust. I careened off the wall frantically looking for another threat. One of the men surely wasn't really dead. He was lying in wait, just waiting to shoot me in the back of the skull. I fired the burners again and again. Each corpse slid out a puff of steam as the superheated beam pierced them over and over. I was still panicked, still scared. More attackers must be nearby. I lurched into the center of the room and tried to find some hidden attacker. Someone who had escaped. A sniper hiding in the rafters. Something. I saw 
Nothing. It took me longer to convince myself that it was over than it had to slaughter the baker's dozen of men. Men who may have had families for all I knew. Men who had possibly been someone's father and were certainly someone's son. I staggered to the corner of the room and retched. My stomach heaved itself empty, then it heaved again. Nothing came out but the urge to be sick and still there. To me, the building itself was now contaminated. Some nameless filth that went beyond the carnage and spilled contents of breakfast. This place was a stain that could never be removed, except perhaps one way. I pointed the burners at the support beams and fired them over and over until the flames thick in the no danger of self-extinguishing. As the flames licked the mutilated bodies and burning all evidence of my sin, I stormed to the far wall where the flames had not yet time to reach. I kicked it in until the wood splintered, and then I punched it until the boards backled backwards. I shoved my way through the new door, and I was out in the street once more. A column of thick black smoke followed me out. I walked towards the airfield. I don't actually remember the walk there. I sort of slipped into a fugue state. One moment I was outside the burning abandoned shop and the next someone was shaking me awake. Jason! A high-pitched voice shrieked in my ear. What happened? I knew that voice. I blinked my eyes and found an ugly, hairy face looking at me with concern. Reynolds. What? I asked. Summer has been screaming for you. She said, she said you were in trouble. I was heading into town to see if we were at the patch drum again, and I saw you coming this way. Is, is that blood on your hands? It's not mine, I said. For some reason, that felt like a lie. He just stared at me. What happened, he asked. I looked at him. He had said something, something important, something about my name. Where's Summer, I asked. Reynolds wisely decided that someone with blood stains spattered on the elbows and entirely too much on his mind to be bothered with questions. He simply led me back to the shanty town cabins of the kin. I knew which cabin we were heading for before we even arrived. Summer was still screaming, It's here, Jason! Run! It's here! A scream sent chills down my spine. It sounded only semi-human, like something was forcing the words out of her. I pushed past Reynolds and raced towards the cabin. The cabin was the second from the end. A small crowd of kin had gathered outside. I shoved through them and without so much as an apology and practically tore the curtain from the doorframe as I rushed in. I found Summer inside. Tears ran down her face and her hands clawed ripping an invisible enemy. I seized her arms and looked her in her eyes. Just like that, it was as if a switch had been flipped and I was looking at a sane face once more. Jason, she said in perfect English. You survived. He didn't know about the armor, I explained. For some reason, I'm certain she knew at least part of why it had just occurred. She grimaced and nudged sagely. It won't make a mistake again, she said. It, I asked. So it was an abjugator. Or one of their cousins, she said with a sigh. They most likely located you with the full quack arrived. They probably didn't know where you were exactly before then. Then again, Silthus and Volsen have been their vectors as well. Now that the Sunbiot has spreading through the sphere, they might as well try to find an opening again. Who am I speaking to? I asked suddenly. She smiled. At this moment, she said, I'm still mostly summer. This uh, link is imperfect at best. Sometimes she fights me for control. When that happens, it can be... um. Confusing for both of us. You mean when she seems she's lost her mind and you two are warring for who gets to talk? Something like that. Yes. She's relaxed control a bit for the moment to allow me to speak to you. I think my own panic caused a feedback loop in her mind. You are breaking her, I said. Back off and give her the wheel again. I would love to, she said. But first I need you to come to Ferry. It's a vital to your entire species that you do. Until you get to Fairy, there is the only way that I have communicating with you or assisting. If I withdraw entirely, she may never let me back in. I don't care. I snapped. Stop torturing her. She seemed to age in front of me. She looked strangely ancient and tired. It's not that simple, she said. I will release her when I am certain that you will be able to complete your mission. What mission? I asked. What are you talking about? I cannot say much more, she warned, especially now that we know that they have infiltrated the sphere. 
They can be anyone. What are you talking about? I asked. I thought the symbiote didn't fully integrate with the human mind anyway. The abjectors could only talk to me in the first place because I was patient zero and there was some partial connection still active. She seemed taken back by my saying this. Where did you get this information? She asked quickly. Who knew about this? It was uh, something I sort of dreamed about, I admitted lamely. She stared at me as if I was trying to look through me, then she took a step back. Your kind is further along than those of the sphere, she said suddenly. I should have anticipated this. Your mission is now even more critical than before. You must get... But, I interjected. Jason, she said. People of the sphere are descendants of one of the chimera performed their most ambitious experiments on. Experiments at the behest of the abjectors. Except the chimera knew them as the teachers. Your planet is a more pure genome. Less influence. The abjectors call you degenerates for that reason, as you are deviants from their ideal. Here, in the hollow of the sphere, are the ferals, humans that were manipulated to be closer to the ideal. Fail the experiments. Some of those experiments were to create minds that were, uh, malleable to influence of the abjectated kind. Do you understand now? I thought I did, but I phrased the question anyway. So anyone who has this mystery genome that allows abjectors influence can, what, be taken over by them, I asked. Only if their receiver is in place, she said. That was part of the original design. Receiver? The symbiote? Yes, she said. I believe you call it a Trojan horse. Disguise something dangerous as something useful. The symbiote has spread throughout the galaxy, and any who are infected with it are vulnerable to their influence. All save your species, and... Here, not are all exempt. So, Molson may turn against you, she agreed. You would be wise to consider abandoning her. I liked that idea even less than the thought that there might be a viral abjectator sneaking around behind me. But the abjectator is dead, right? I asked. You killed the host, she corrected me. The abjectator itself cannot be cut, shot or burned. It's out there looking for you. If it discovers what is really going on, it'll kill you and your species just to keep it from happening. Do you understand? No? Good, she said. Your ignorance is your protection. Go to Ferry. More can be revealed then. But the whispering voice keeps me awake. Summer is resisting more. Unlike Summer, the flowers in bloom. I must go now while she fights me. Summer giggled and the madness crept back into her eyes. She licked her lips and looked at me. Jason as Jason was. Blood on your hands, blood in your heart. Were they men or less than men? A cure or a disease? Which is Jason? I left the cabin. I went searching for my wayward crew. The first one I spotted was Professor. She was chatting with an elderly lady with a kin law. On any other day, I might have joined to listen. Today was not that day. Go find the others, I told her as I jogged up next to her. She shot me a surprised look. Jason, she gasped, apparently more shocked at my rudeness than anything. This is Alda Fian, and she's telling me about... I held up my bloody hands, and she shut up. Go find the others, I repeat. Tell them to meet me in my cabin. Everyone except Valson. What? she asked. What do you want me to tell Valson? Nothing. We need to keep her in the dark about this one. Her face darkened, but she stood up to comply. She turned to go in that direction of town. Where are you going? I asked. There's a dry goods store on the edge of the field, she said. Jack went that way with some of the kin to buy supplies. I thought I'd start with her. Go look for the others, I ordered her. I'll go talk to her myself. Are you sure? she asked. She seemed to be in a bad mood when I last saw her. Oh, I bet she was. Yes, I said. I need to speak to her privately anyway. The professor shrugged but turned back towards the airfield and went off to search for the others. I steeled my resolve and jogged in the direction of the dry goods store. I caught up with them as they were exiting the store, a ragtag band of kin whom I did not know by name. They greeted me in a friendly manner all the same. Bringing up the rear, I saw a diminutive form of Jack loaded with the heavy bags of grain. Jack, I said as I raced past the others towards him, I need to talk to you. Not a good time, Captain, she grunted, sort of busy. I grasped two-thirds of the bags and yanked them out of her grasp. I nearly sent her tumbling. She scowled at me, and I looked at the others, who were now staring. 
Go ahead, I told him. We'll catch up. I need to have a word with her in private. The lion began moving again. Reluctantly, they seemed to be held back more by curiosity rather than fear that I might harm Jack. I took it as a good sign. Jack must not have said anything particularly negative about me. I waited until I judged that they were out of earshot before I spoke. Jack, I said at last, nothing happened. Don't sound so disappointed, she huffed. Ouch. No, I said. I mean, I was drunk. Heather just gave me a place to sleep it off. Nothing happened, okay? She snorted. Why should I care, she asked. It's your life, right, Captain? How could such agreeable words take on such a dismissive scorn? Jack, I persisted. I need you right now. Something bad is going on. When the symbiote got loosed from you making out with the locals, she added. I ignored this. Something got in, I continued. They just tried to kill me. This got her attention. For the first time, she seemed to really see the blood on my arms. The fire, she asked suddenly. Was that you? I nodded. Something really bad is going on and I need you, my security officer, I said. Please, Jack, I need you with me right now. She shook her head. We need to get these bags to the barn, she said. I stared at protest, but she cut me off. We need to put them up, she continued, or they'll come back looking for them. Then we can look for the others. I sent the professor to gather them at my cabin, I told her. Oh, good, she said and started walking off ahead of me. I felt myself relaxing slightly. I'm curious to see if you can find it this time, she added. I nearly stumbled and fell. This was not going to be that easy after all. End of chapter. The fourth wave, interlude number three. The second wave, Dragon Jewel. She had no name. She never needed one, nor, if given one, would she understand the function. One day her kind would have a name. They would be known by a hairless animal that she would never live to see. They would call her Acrocranthosaurus. But for now she had only she. She had no understanding of names. She understood the hunger. The sense of the lands were all wrong. She did not understand them. But she did not have to as long as there was food here. That would be enough. The hunger was strong, stronger than during the dry season when game was scarce. She hungered and food was near, and that was good. Her clawed feet sank deeply into the mud. The mud was wrong as well. It smelled wrong. It felt wrong beneath her feet. It held her weight. This was all that mattered. Ahead of her were the plants. Plants that rustled as she walked. Rats that smelled the strange places and drank light from the strange sky. This was not her home, but there was food nearby. She knew this. She did not ask how she knew this, but there why ideas of food and strong hunger came from. She did not ask questions. She walked. She ate. She lived. The ground trembled beneath her feet, quaking with each footstep. She pushed through the foliage towards the clearing towards food. The tall grass tugged mercilessly on the things that stuck out of her. She had not known their purpose. They had not been there before the burning clouds had fell upon her. She had been in her home, stalking prey, keeping the hunger sated. Then the clouds had arrived, boarding from the sky like stones. They had taken her. She had awoken a strange world not knowing not understanding. Just hunger. Hunger that could only be filled with what was in the clearing. As she pushed away, she finally spotted it. The food. Hundreds of foods. The food was smaller than what she was used to. It would take many to rid her of her hunger, but there were many here. The food saw her, and they spat light at her. The light hurt. It hurt her like claws. The light was claws. She was Claus. She knew how to use claws. She did not ask why she knew. She just used them. And her own claw lights reached out and the foods fell away. She charged upon them with a roar. She ate the foods. They were delicious. They were also foul. They tasted wrong. Yet she hungered for the strangeness. She wished to coat her gullet with it, but they knew not why. 
Why was unimportant, only the hunger was important. Her feet tore into the ground as she ran, spray of dirt and rock flew behind her as she ran. When she spied the foods, she used her teeth if she were close, she used her new claws if she were far. The foods died, and this was good. A new animal arrived, an animal unlike the ones that she had seen before. It was larger than her, larger than the big teeth ones that would eat her, longer than the big necked ones that would use to big to kill. Its feet were round and had no legs, yet it moved. Its feet went round and round, carrying it forward. The beast's skin was shiny, it glistened like water. Its eyes were large and flat, empty squares that sat flash with the glistening skin. It looked more like a rock than an animal. But it moved. It must have been an animal, and she knew nothing else it could be. The beast roared, and its claws of light tore into her. Her skin burned, and she ached. She should run, but something was stopping her. It told her that she could not run, must not run. She must fight. She roared back and released her own claws of light. They tore into the beast. Holes appeared in its skin, holes of black that released smoke, but no blood. Her own skin was torn, shredded from her body, but she was still moving. She charged, her claws, her living claws, gripping hard surface of the monster. It was stronger than skin, stronger than bone. She pulled on it anyways, screams from within. The side of the beast split, the skin fell away, and more of the foods climbed out of its belly. The foods were riding a beast from within. She did not have the ability to question this. All she felt was the hunger, the hunger, and the anger. She stomped her feet on the fleeing foods, crushing them beneath her weight. She swung her tail and struck more of the foods, sending them flying. The hard beast threw more of its claws of light at her and ripped into her flesh. She ached. She was bleeding. She was dying. She was angry. Roaring her fury, she tore at the skin of her attacker. The skin was strong. She was stronger. It tore. And it cut her as it tore. But it tore. More of the light burned her. She ignored it. She tore free of the hard flesh and focused her own claws on the light inside. She sent them inside of the vulnerable interior, over and over and over again. The beast tried to fight back. She ignored the pain. She ignored the way her bone was laid bare and the skin over her shoulder was burned away. She ignored the wash of red blood that stained her chest. She ignored it all, save for the anger. The beast must die. This beast must die. The beast must die. The chant ran through her head. It seemed almost to come from someplace else. Thoughts from another hammered into her brain. The beast must die. She killed it. More claws bit her. They raked her undamaged back. She looked around. Shiny skin flying animals. She sent light after them. They burned and fell. The foods on the ground hit her with night. She ate the one she could reach and burned the one she could not. The mist settled into the air, and her wounds were great. The strange beast had fought had mortally wounded her. She was dying. She was dying, and all she could think of was the hunger. Anger. And hunger. Hunger. And anger. More lights, more holes. Her lungs were hit now. Each breath sent more pain through her. Each movement pumped more of her precious blood, blood that she could no longer afford to squander out through the halls. Kill. She must kill. They must die. She must eat and they must die. The thoughts still came to her even now, though her strength was fading. More lights burned her. Her eyes lost focus. Something struck her in the chest. A loud noise followed. Pain. So much pain. Her chest was open and raw. Her beating heart was naked to the outside world. The bones that had protected it were gone. The heart shuddered, then stopped. The giant's legs gave out and she toppled. Her rampage 
had come to an end. A single conflux soldier, a Havam Akpo, dropped the anti-aircraft weapon into the mud next to him. The weapon was spent and useless now. It was he who had stopped the creature. It was he who had finally put a stop to the newest weapon from the Chimera. He would sing for the dead. Perhaps his entire company was gone. So fast. The creature had been upon them like lightning. How could they fight such a monster? He looked down at his crushed legs, the lasting injury from the brief encounter with the monster. The heavy assault cruiser, two mid-range flyers plus hundreds of soldiers, all wiped out, all save for him. What have the Chimera done? He asked the sky. The sky howled back a retort. Looking up, he saw the trees part. A long snout filled with sharp teeth emerge from the trees. There was another one of the armored creatures, larger than the one that had preceded it. The ground quaked with footsteps. The second and third followed into the clearing. The Okpo realized that he would not be singing songs for the dead today, after all. The creatures before him snuffed the air and turned to face him. The Okpo reached for his chest and found a service pistol. Thankfully, it was still intact. The lead monster roared once the complex soldier lifted the pistol and quickly touched the firing mechanism before the monster could take a step. The weapon discharged, leaving behind a cloud of charred organic matter and the scent of burning flesh. The Okpo's lifeless and headless body slumped to the side. The uninjured dinosaurs paused. The surgically implanted computers in the skull registered that the target was no more. Another target was located, and it pushed the primitive brain of the creature, driving it in that direction. The complex would retreat from the planet in less than three hours later. The Chimera had won their first victory of the second wave. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 39 we found the others standing by a hut. Fortunately, the rest of the kin were busy elsewhere, so the area was more or less to ourselves. Jack and I were the last to arrive, and I could tell the prof's confusion had spread to the others. Lesson one, when calling for a meeting, scrub the blood off your armor. It distracts people. Jack was scowling, but considering that was fairly typical for her, I am not sure anyone could feel any tension between us. Those that did know about it probably assumed that it was a sign that we'd patched things up. My life had definitely been growing more complicated recently. We have a major problem, I began. Did you kill someone? Heather asked bluntly. Yes and no, I admitted. Most of them were humans, but I think one may have not been. Lesson two, when calling a meeting to order, do not confess murder first thing. This also distracts people. Let's try this again, I said. There's an abjugator loose in the sphere, and it's pulling an ancient smith on us. Blank looks. Lesson three. If you ignore lessons one and two, do not make pop culture references, no matter how appropriate. People don't shift mental gears that quickly. I did my best to explain the situation in terms that they could understand, without my trained bark and banishments. Lee caught the implications before anyone else. Valson can't come with us, he declared. She might turn on us. She has to, Jack cut in. She's the only one who can fly the shuttle. It's got a biolock thing. Crap, i would forgotten about that. Maybe we can ask her to turn it off, Heather suggested. Sure, Lee nodded. We'll just ask Valson to hand over the control of his ship because we think that she might get brain hijacked at any moment by an invisible space monster. I'm sure she'll agree to that. I were, if it were possible, Balson said as she stepped around the corner of one of the huts. Lesson 4. When planning a meeting that starts off with a confession of a murder, people are too far distracted to check to see if a person you did not want to attend is eavesdropping. Valson, I stammered, we were discussing leaving me behind, she finished for me. I heard that part. I also heard why. So the symbiote actually is a control mechanism for abjugators. How long have you known this? I looked at the others before returning my gaze to the alien science officer. Alien? You know, I never asked what her species was called. I should look into that one day. Not now, though. All pressing concerns. 
I sort of dreamed about it, I admitted. There is, um, something complicated going on. I don't want to go into any details because... Because an abjugator might be listening, she agreed. This complicates things. How does it complicate things, Heather asked on our behalf. As you know, Volson went on, my shuttle was badly damaged in the flight from the outpost in the dire blade. One subsystem that is compromised is the bio-identity calibrator. I took a wild guess here. Which you need to key in the biolock to someone else. Yes, she agreed. The biolock is not just a genetic scanner. It's where someone can clone a sample of my tissue and hijack the ship. It works on several layers of identity confirmation. Brain scanning, personalized bioelectric signature, and even mass. All of this goes into the biolock. It's so sensitive, in fact, that if certain values change too dramatically between scanning and the actual user can get locked out until the calibrator can confirm the updated figures. As long as I attend to my shuttle every few days and allow it to update my particular biological signature, it should not be considered a problem. However, however, I finished, you can't add a new user. Correct, she admitted. Can you turn off the biolock? Jack asked. That was actually a good question. Yes, Wilson said, but not here. It's a security feature and disabling it would require specialized equipment as well as skilled technicians. Rather obvious when she put it like that. It was like asking the door on a bank vault could be removed. Yes, technically, but if it was easy, that defeated the purpose. So there's no way for us to set it up so anyone else to fly your shuttle, I summarized. But we don't know if someone else is using you to spy on us and may even try to hijack your mind. Why am I not filled with confidence? Wilson seemed to consider this. There may be one way to proceed, she said, but I cannot guarantee its success. I sighed in exasperation. Wilson, I said, things are pretty bad as it is. I had Dyer search the other entrances and can't find one. It looks like this is the only opening left over. So either we figure out a way to get your ship to do this, or we're never going to be able to reach the land of Ferry in our lifetimes. And this destination is important to you. Yes, I said, more so than ever. I've got new information on that, again, I can't discuss with you. She did that strange agitation dance, but spoke normally. Her mouth didn't even do that lip smack that I associated with nervousness. The symbiote, if you recall, works by the means of a relay system, she said quickly. It is essentially an organic communicator, one that links the host to a large network of sophisticated translation technology. This is good for when you want to facilitate conversations. However, at times when one wishes to have privacy, some steps have been taken to prevent others from listening in. I blinked. You mean the conflux has a way of jamming the signal, I asked. Yes, she agreed. Its range is very limited, and it is a subsystem on my shuttle that is too badly damaged and it will not work at all. But I believe I can get it operational. But, the professor interjected, if you do that, how will we be able to communicate with you? The dancing grew more vigorous. Ah, oh, so that's why she was upset. It wasn't that she had no confidence that the jamming technology wouldn't work. She didn't like the idea of being isolated and unable to communicate with those around her for months at a time. She wasn't worried. She was scared. Okay, think Jason. What would be a real leader do? He'd delegate. Wilson, I said, go back to your shuttle and get the jammer working. I'm going to update the others on what else I've learned. After that, I'm going to send the professor. I glanced to Madakai to give her a significant look. Out to meet you there. She's going to work on a system of hand signals that we can use some basic communications. You turn off the jammer when she arrives and you two work on the details together. Yes, the professor said, perking up. That's actually a good idea, Jason. In fact, since we have a little time before the ship will be ready, I believe that we can come up with enough of a vocabulary to hold some simple conversations. Balson's nervous dance slowed. Hand signals, she asked. You believe we can communicate effectively without using oral or written words? Of course, the professor assured her. We've done it for deaf people on Earth for years. They were unable to hear your words, and so you created a new language for them, Balson asked. And this works. Extremely well, the professor said, and then a shot a questioning look. 
How does your pupil deal with deafness? A we clone in new hearing organs if possible, she said. If it's not, there is our prosthetics that can relay information to and from the symbiote, encoding sounds or flashing lights, for example. I was only just beginning to grasp how much of a crutch the symbiote really was for the conflux. It had solved so many communications difficulties that the first instinct was to use it to solve the communication problems. She had panic when her one-size-fits-all tool was taken out of her first lost. Although I had a little contact with the conflux, I had always taken Volson as being a reasonably intelligent member of the galactic population. But even this mild degree of creative problem solving seemed to leave her flabbergasted. The conflux society wasn't just stagnant, it had crystallized. Volson parted ways with us and headed off into the direction of the ship. Okay, I said after confirming that she was out of earshot. I had a long conversation with Summer. Summer, I write Jason Reese's name on the walls with blood. Glow, Heather asked skeptically. I nodded. She's the one who fooled me on some of this, I said, but it didn't sound like it was her who was talking. In fact, the stranger said that the insanity comes from when they are fighting for control of a brain. Lee snorted. Well, sounds like the abjugators have a leg up on him there. Probably, I agreed, but I think the reason he's taking over Summer is because she's psychic. He's established a psychic bond and he's not letting go. Jack's skull deepened. No symbiote, she translated, just her own brain hardware. Right, I said, and that's what bothers me. Based on what the puppet masters are saying, I think he's in fairy and he's trying to get us there. What if the psychic bond gets stronger the closer we get? Jack asked. You see my concern, I said. He's driven the girl half out of her mind as it is. What will happen if she gets closer? Lee shook his problem. That's not the problem, he told me. The big problem is the rest of the crew. The others we're taking with us. How many of them are infected with the symbiote? I swore under my breath and then thought about it. Summer, uh, the puppet master that is, said that not all humans can be controlled by abjugators. I said, just ones who have a particular gene that the abjugators had the chimera insert. It sounded like there weren't many of them out there, but still, we have to keep an eye on the crew. We don't know who has the gene and who does not. The professor seemed to think about it. The fastest transportation available on this world is airship, she commented. So even if the abjugators took over a host and had him or her fly out to top speed in the direction that we're going, kiss everyone in sight and continue spreading ahead of us, then we'd still be able to outrun the wave of infections with a few hops. That's reassuring, I said. It's worrying, she corrected me. If the abjugators want to stop us, then they'd have to do so before we leave. She was right. It was worrying. Unless it was sung by the Beastie Boys, sabotage is not a word you want to hear. Jack, I said, you're the security officer. Try to figure out some way of monitoring the construction. She spun on a hill and was off like a dash. She didn't even acknowledge my order. I wasn't sure if that was because she was mad at me or she realized how completely screwed we were and didn't want to waste even a microsecond. I'll choose to believe the latter. I had enough problems to think about. Valson doesn't sleep, I remembered. She'll be at the shuttle anyway. Work out some way for her to warn us if she sees something while you're giving her your language lessons. Madakai realized I was speaking to her. She seemed to consider that a dismissal and was jogging off after Jack. Maybe I had dismissed her. Everyone seemed to be looking for me for answers. I hated being the leader. Heather and Lee were staring at me. What did I want them to do? With your permission, Lee spoke up, I'd like to get the sense of how far the symbiote is spread, question the kin about whom they may have given or sold it to, and figure out where it might be going. I nodded. Good idea, I said, and then pointed at Heather. But take her with you. Me? Heather squeaked. But why should I? Because, I said. You've at least tried to make some headway with the local language. If someone understands Lee, then we've got our answer if they're infected. But I need someone to help him interrogate people who aren't infected. Then you should go, she pointed out. I sound like a brain-damaged toddler when I talk to them. I shook my head. You both need to practice, I said. Besides, I've got someplace else I need to go. Where's that? She asked as she placed her hands on her hips and gave me a stern look. I nodded to figures advancing towards us along the rows of houses. Jail, I think. Unless I can talk my way out of this. 
Lee and Heather both turned to look. Four men with wooden armor and carried ceramic guns. I didn't recognize the uniform so much as the bearing. There was something about a way a cop walks that identified them better than any badge. An hour later, I sat across the desk from the Neanderthal, whose nameplate identified him as Sergeant Teach Hook. I smiled at him as he tried my best to look relaxed. Your outfit is rather distinctive, Mr. Reese, he muttered as me as he flipped through a stack of papers. If you flee a crime scene, you would be do better to dress blend in. Other than the fact that they were the same species, Hook shared little resemblance to Reynolds. Where the Reynolds was lean and solid, Hook was fat and flabby, his slopping forehead only enhanced by the fact that his hairline was rapidly receding and where hair did not cover his splotchy skin was exposed. Desk jockey, I realized. Crime scene? I asked and then finged enlightenment. Oh, you mean the fire? He paused in his reading to shoot me a withering look over the top of his eyeglasses. Come to think of it, he was the first Spherian that I had met who used them. The fire, he said yes, that one too, but I was more concerned with the other crime. Ah, I said as I tried to look sheepish. I didn't think anyone saw me. Ah! He said, smiling, now we get to the truth of it. Yes, I said as I did my best to look guilty, which is how I really felt, so it wasn't that hard. I didn't realize that I was no loitering area. He set the papers down. I see, he said. The fire was put out not long ago. Do you know what we found inside? Ashes, I asked. Do you know who we found inside, he asked this time. I tried to look surprised. Someone was in there, I asked. I thought I heard something and broke my way in, but the smoke was too thick to see anything, so I left. I see, he said, and that dried stuff on your arms. Would you care to explain what that might be? I was trying to recall the word for strawberry jam when a new voice interrupted. It's blood, Sergeant, Hal answered as he strode into the room looking furious. One of my workers was injured earlier today with this young man helped tend to his wounds. I sent him to town to fetch a physician when the fire broke out and he tried to play a hero. He sighed and shot me a look of disappointment. You're lucky that Sanja wasn't that badly hurt after all, he told me. I just gaped at him. What the hell was going on? You're going to tell me that he just happened to be going by when the fire broke out and the reason that he was seen fleeing the area was because he didn't flee, Al snapped. He came back to tell me. And the reason he did that was because... He's a stranger to our town, Al said with a dismissive wave. He didn't know about the fireballs. He ran back to the only people he knew in town to ask what to do. I blinked. So this was just confusion and inexperience, Hook asked skeptically. He's just a newcomer and knew nothing about the bodies we found in there. Bodies, I asked. He glared at me. Two cut to shreds, he said. The others die by being stabbed by some weapon I don't recognize, but I put a really small hole in them. And you found the weapon? I'll ask. What? Hook asked. No, not yet. We're still searching. At this boy, he asked, pointing at me. He was seen fleeing with a weapon in his hand. No, I thought, because the weapons were built into the hands. Still, I saw the sergeant look uncomfortable. This is an official query, he said. And I don't think... This isn't the first time I'm forced to come down here, Al said sternly. Every time you run into a crime that you can't easily solve, you seem to start looking for newcomers in town. Or the kin, both of which were near the airfield. I talked to a solicitor about it last time. She was most intrigued. I could send her for you now, if you like. I heard that she has some questions for you. Hook's face darkened that he didn't break eye contact with Al, but the words spoke to be seemed to me my benefit. You are dismissed for the time being, Jason Reese, he said, but I may have more, um, questions for you later. Oh, I'll be in town for a while, I said, and Al knows how to get in touch with me if you need to talk to me. I stood up and followed Al out of the room before the sergeant could change his mind. Al, I hissed as we exited the squat stone building that formed the police headquarters. What was that all about? He gave me a shocked expression. You're kin now, he reminded me. What did you think this whole ceremony was about? Come on, that little girl is probably wearing a groove in my airfield with a pacing. Little girl, I asked, and then I caught up with him. Jack sent you, I asked. He shot me a sidelong look. 
She saw you getting arrested, he said. Ran to me first thing, which is what you should have done to begin with. Don't you know that I'm an old man? My knees hurt bad enough without having to march down here and come down here to get you out of jail. He grunted in annoyance and began hobbling a gate along the street. The gate that seemed to be mostly for my benefit as he walked much more spryly when I had seen him in the airfield before. Of course, it may have been four eyes watching us as the police station behind us. Despite all of this and the looming hazard of abjugators, I still felt a smile tugging at my lips. Jack had sent him. For some odd reason, this one small act brightened my mood. Much like when I knew that she was angry with me, it made everything else seem much darker. Why was that? Lee said that she had a crush on me, and while it was flattering, I certainly didn't reciprocate the idea. I was almost old enough to be her father. Well, if I had gotten an early enough start in someone I didn't mind in the acne, but that was beside the point. Why did it bother me so much then? Why did a single act of kindness bring me so much happiness now? The police station was centrally located in Newtown. As such, the walk back to the airfield was not a short one. As we walked, Al either forgot himself or, possibly, was no longer concerned about spying eyes as his gait became more and more even and soon I was had to step up my pace to keep up with him. At times he nearly lost me as he turned around corners or melted into the crowd and I was forced to run after him. It was during one of these moments that I was blindly running along the cobblestone alleyway trying to figure out which way we went when I finally received my answer. My friends wouldn't abandon me like this, I muttered to myself. Those words nearly caused me to fall flat on my face. Friends, when had I stopped thinking about the others as my crew or my fellow Earth humans and started thinking of them as my friends? What more, did they think the same for me? I thought of many talks and private moments that I had with all of them. It seemed... Yes, I was certain of it. They called me Captain, but I sensed that it was more than just that. Jack hadn't asked for help when she saw that I was in trouble. She went to head of Ken and called the, the big guns. Was that an act of comparable security officer or a friend who, though maybe a bit mad at me, still cared more than she should? The more I thought about it, the more it felt right. We weren't just misfits thrown together trying to save the human race. We were more than that. We were friends. They're my crew and they're my friends, I said aloud. They're also your family, Al chided me as he stepped up from behind me. How many times do I have to tell you that you're all adopted into the kin? He panted for breath and then, without warning, slapped me across the back of the head. That's for taking off like a damn fool, he said. You passed me about half a block ago. If you hadn't stopped to think about why your crew hadn't left you for dead yet, though I'm sure you deserve it, you blundering idiot, then I might not have ever caught up with you. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder and to the right. The airfield's that way, he told me. Try not to be such an idiot this time. Also, next time you get a little nutty, try knitting. There's less for me to clean up afterwards. With that, he stomped in the direction of the airfield. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 40, written by Sebi Loki Surprisingly, the next two months, or Parza, moved fairly swiftly. I was still worried about the sabotage, and somehow or another, Al got word of this. His solution for the fairly straightforward. If I was so concerned about the quality of the build of my airship, I could help with the construction. So I did. Cutting, trimming, plastering, cabling, and threading silk. You name it, I probably did it. For the first week or two, I probably was almost as much of a threat as any sabotage. Fortunately, Al had enough sense to pair me up with jobs with a master craftsman in the tribe. They would show me how to correct my mistakes when they could or correct the mistakes themselves when they could not. I learned more Spherian profanity in those two weeks as a master craftsman and did my work most people would hear in a dozen lifetimes. Nobody can square like an expert having to fix some work of a ham-fisted amateur. Which is not to say that my help was entirely unwelcome. When they discovered that my armor could boost my strength and endurance as well as normal limits that I found myself in near constant demand. 
As the ship got larger and more of the rigging came into existence, they had to rely on cranes and other steam-powered heavy machinery. Like most Syrian technology, the machinery was bulky and overbuilt, as it was largely made out of wood and ceramics. The crane, for example, had a 10-foot boom, and the base was 30 feet long with the stone blocks piled on the back to keep the boom from overbalancing. Despite this, the maximum weight the crane could lift was around half a ton. Any more than that and the reinforced trunk would be formed the boom might split. My armor allowed me to carry heavy items into tight spots where it was difficult to fit larger equipment. As construction neared completion, I was called into action so many times to help out in the tight and tricky spot that I actually had to recruit Heather and Lee to help out. Which is not to say that any of the others were just sitting around while I was hammering away at support beams in our new airship. Lee and Jack appointed themselves security detail and they maintained a 24-hour vigilance on there. They had everything in shifts, eating, sleeping, and hitting the facilities when their armor's waste systems were maximum capacity. At any point, one or both of them were nearby as the ship took shape. Many a day, I showed up first light and find Lee and Jack already patrolling the area. When the latter shut and I found myself ready to call it a day, I'd turn around and find the same person still standing guard, watching everything. It was comforting and unnerving at the same time. I didn't like the idea of them pushing themselves that hard. I wanted to order someone else to join them, but when you got right down to it, I was the only person who had enough free time to lend them a helping hand, and I was swamped myself. The professor spent most of her first week doing as I suggested and constructed a foundation of simple sign language with Volson, except it didn't end there. They practiced every day and worked on expressing progressively more and more complex and abstract ideas, until she was comfortable that our pilot, science officer, potential assassin, could express ideas from a simple, Oh, hey, a fire-breathing snail that farts mustard gas has developed a surface-to-air missile and is intent on bringing us down. Does anyone have a barrel of salt that we could toss over the side? Once the professor reached that threshold, she did the obvious thing that should have occurred to all of us. She took off and learned more about the various languages and cultures in the sphere that we might encounter. The professor spent most of the next few months tracking down any or all exotic strangers who passed through the area. If they spoke another language, she begged them to talk to her until they had a basic understanding. By the end of the first month, she had mastered seven new languages and was conversational in about another ten. That sounds impressive until you realize the languages weren't quite as diverse as the earthen languages. Unlike earth languages, which develop uniquely and in isolated areas, the sphere started off all sharing a common language. On the other hand, it was all a lot bigger and there was a lot of places to get lost so there were quite a few variations on the basic chimeric language. But when you got down to it, a lot of them could be summed up with chimeric with a fuddy accent. Additionally, the sphere had airships for several thousand years by this point. Trade and tourism had allowed similar sounding languages to blend and evolve in similar ways. Some of these languages were so similar, in fact, that the native speaker in one language could pass for a native speaker of a completely different language, depending on the allergy report. Most languages she encountered varied very little from the language spoken in Newton. In fact, the professor later found out that no one could quite agree on what the name of the language spoken in Newton really was. Some claimed it to be High Obia, others claimed it to be Kraftmain. Part of the argument she learned was that the oasis of Ob and Kralfma had been in a state of near perpetual conflict for the better part of a thousand years. Their hatred for one another was so great that they absolutely refused to admit that they spoke the same language. So each insisted their language was separate from the other. In truth, there was less variation between the two languages than there was between Australian English and American English. Most people just called the language the trader tongue and tried to keep politics out of it. Trader tongue, Kreftmain, and Obia were essentially the same language. There was also Middle Finist, which had the same oral language but a different alphabet, except it wasn't that different. 
Some of the whorls they rotated slightly, so the alphabet of one looked just as like a sloppy penmanship of another. Further complicating the matter, there was another language out there called Box, which was borrowed alphabet from the Finist, but spoke the dialect of the Pru Homold. Which of the Pru Homold? Well, in the Oasis of Ob, there was this religious war that took place around 5,000 years ago, involving the line of succession of the priest king. The house of Pru separated off and hid out in the mountains and created their own separate kingdom. About a thousand years later, the kids from the kingdom got tired of riding goats to work and decided to come down the mountains and mingle with the lowland Obians. Over the years, more and more loan words were crept into Obia, until the point there was very little difference between the two. The Pru Hamol designation has kept historical reasons, and because they were about a hundred different words that don't exist in other languages. Just to add to the confusion, Although they used the finest alphabet, they spell things a bit differently. So, poor penmanship and lousy spelling, and you have Pru Hamald, which is almost indistinguishable from trade tongue. In the end, Professor had to resort to clumping the languages together into families just to prevent herself from being forced to learn the same language twice. She clumped them together by names and by history and made notes of where each one branched off from the other. Surprisingly, the professor ended up being one of the few people to attempt such an ambitious feat. Before the first parza was up, she was actually performing lectures at a nearby college to teach the professors their her methods, which is a roundabout way of saying the professor was way too busy to help out with something as mundane as shipbuilding. As for Heather, well, she made the professor seem like an aimless layabout in comparison. That woman must have been freebasing double expressos during that time. I think it started off as just a manifestation of a latent anxiety. While we were all sorting out the various roles, she volunteered to go to the local library and research whatever maps they had of our projected route. It sounded like a good idea to me and I gave her my blessing. For the next two six days, she was at the library the moment that they opened their doors and had to be kicked out that night so the staff could lock the doors. She didn't read the maps, she absorbed them, and then she began fixing them. The problem with most maps is that they are two-dimensional, and unless your name is A square and you live in a flat land, they would world was the bothersome third dimension. This leads to unfortunate problems in distortion and how much was acceptable before a map was unreadable. Some maps try to compensate by the third dimension by using projections. The idea of a projection is more or less exactly as it sounds. If the earth was a translucent and you stuck a light bulb in the center of it, the image cast on the walls of the room would be your map. The near equator distortion isn't that bad, but the further away from the middle you get, the worse the distortion. However, for the sphere, the projections don't work. They live on the inside of their world, therefore the maps were distorted on contortions rather than projections. The sphere curves less than the Earth does. If you could flatten the Earth into a solid disk and drop it inside where the edges of the disk touched would barely be higher up from where the middle of the disk hovered over the curve, it may as well be laying flat. That's how slight the curve was. On one, on one hand, this meant two-dimensional drawings could be more accurate. On the other hand, that also meant that there was a lot more area and had to be covered. The Spherians compensated by this by skipping over the wasted space. A typical Spherian map emphasized the important stuff while omitting the bits that they felt irrelevant. Two cities might be drawn right next to each other. Between them was a cryptic number that could be anything from 1 to 500. That was how many days by airship separated the two places. However, the cartographer never seemed to take the time to specify what they meant exactly. If the number was 10, for example, did that mean 10 full days at maximum speed, or 9.5 at cruising speeds and stops overnight? The maps never said. She also found that what the maps did exist may not be oriented in the same direction. There was no north, south, east or west inside the sphere. No stars to navigate by, no solar movements. There were no fixed points of reference and, as such, cartography was disjointed at art at best. Most navigation, she found out, was based upon triangulation with some distant point. 
One thing the sphere did offer was a very long and unobstructed line of sight. So, for example, if there was an especially tall mountain 6,000 miles away, it may actually be quite visible from a telescope. It might require a telescope, but that was hardly an issue. As long as a fixed point was established someplace in the distance, the pilot could navigate by calculating his or her angle away. Sort of choose your own North Star approach to navigation. It worked reasonably well, and most pilots and, as a consequence, map makers just picked a random fixed point that was too far away for someone to reasonably be expected to reach in a single lifetime. So a map may say, oriented by the tall peak on Crifter's range, while never specifying if they meant the tall peak or the tallest peak despite the fact that there may be well over a hundred miles between the two mountains. For most purposes, that was good enough. Heather wanted to improve on the system. No worse, she needed to improve on the system. Her first step was to create a universal standard for a reference point, a north if you will. To accomplish that, she borrowed the idea of the North Star. Even though the sphere did not have stars, it did have lights that occurred at night. Mostly the distant lights of cities, but there were natural light sources as well. By consulting a reference book she found at the library, she determined that the brightest object in the night sky was the port city of Akpar's lighthouse. The lighthouse was rumored to sit atop a craggy mountain that towered half a league above the city below. Why rumored? Well, mostly because no one alive had ever been there. The place was ridiculously distant. However, that didn't keep people from coming up with a good story. Heather didn't care. She had a fixed reference point, Akbar's light. Now, she had to find a way to orient it. The ships on Earth use something called a gyro compass. It's supposedly superior to a regular compass as it points to the true north, rather than magnetic north and isn't swayed by things like being surrounded by a rather hefty bit of metal that might or might not pick up electrical charge while rolling along the sea. While the metal wasn't a concern on the sphere, the lack of magnetic field was. Heather complained about this to the kin and mentioned the gyro compass. She had no idea how it worked other than the fact that it probably involved a gyroscope. A kinsman named Harrison heard her out and came up with a rather unique solution. Harrison's compass didn't use a gyroscope, and used two of them, one in the front of the airship and one at the back. Each one was filled with a reservoir of water with a tiny chunk of pyron inside. It was essentially a modified hero's engine. The steam would build up and the jet out of the vents to set the wheel spinning. A pump system from below would replenish the water as it boiled out. The two gyroscopes were set on platters that were allowed to rotate. Connector rods had been run between the two spindles on each platter and was connected to turn the gauge and the instrument panel of the airship. The idea was that both gyroscopes were pointed to their top, as aimed at Akbar as the platters were locked in while the steam built up the spin. Once the wheels were spinning in a good clip, the platters were unlocked. The gyroscope would keep pointing in the same direction. By walking out the angle of each compass deviated from the other, the ship could determine how far off the true line. Harrison called the clunky unit a wayfinder. The entire unit was bulky, pumps, tubes, counterweights and rods and pulleys. It took hours to install one in an airship and they added significant amount of weight, just due to the need to keep such a large reservoir of water. Despite this, the kin had barely received an order for four units before the prototype had even finished. The Wayfinder wasn't that good of a system, but it was far ahead of any other method out there. By using the prototype Wayfinder, Heather managed to start creating scale maps of the sphere. Scribes were eager to help with her creating these maps, and there were an army of apparent volunteers who helped ink these maps into existence. I say apparent, because we soon found out the scribes were actually copying the maps behind the scenes and selling bootleg heather maps. These maps were soon the preferred maps of airship pilots, and before the parser was over, there was actually a fairly strong market for the genuine heather maps. They commanded such a high price that a cottage industry of clever forgeries appeared. The scribes actually had to resort to using watermarks on their maps to prove their authenticity. 
Sadly, despite all the effort that we had no intention of using a wayfinder nor carrying heather maps on our newly minted ship, Wilson Shuttle's own navigation equipment would outperform the best sphere could offer, and our armor's own maps and omni compasses would provide some redundancies. Heather mostly wanted the maps to scan into her helmet and use the armors on mapping software to render the best estimate of what we might encounter. Even with all of her work, she barely added a single percent of the terrain that we could cover. There was just too much land and not enough information. Still, she tried her best to learn about any hidden surprises that we might encounter along the way. Revolutionizing the field of navigation would be enough for any normal human being. Heather's anxiety wouldn't let her rest there, though. She also appointed herself as the role quartermaster and helped with figuring out supply lists for our ship. She met with grocers and merchants and negotiated a fair deal. By the beginning of the second parser, her command of the traded tongue exceeded my own, especially in regards to the areas of finance and profanity. Still, she wouldn't rest. She insisted that the kin teach her how to pilot an airship. Ordinarily, that might be a difficult request to accommodate. The kin built airships, they didn't pilot them. Fortunately, by then the demand for the genuine heather map was so strong that there were many airship captains in the area more than willing to give her a private lessons in exchange for a discount on a map. Later on, one of the Nordetic kin's bookkeepers admitted to me that between Heather's map, professor's language lectures, and Volson's engineering techniques, the tribe was already showing a more profitable year than the past three put together. If we had been made full members of the tribe, they would have ended up owing us money after constructing the airship. How's that for economics for you? As for the non-Earth members of my ragtag crew, I had no idea what became of them. Shortly after, we established ourselves in Rymore and Reynolds had gathered the other armor-wearing members of the piled into a small ruddy and taken off for parts unknown. Al assured me that their absence would assist in the planned trip and was oddly cagey about how or what they were doing. He just told me to wait for the report. So I waited, and I built a ship. Despite Jan's mocking, the outer hull really wasn't going to be made out of cloth. Well... That's not quite true. It started out as a canvas stretched taut. Afterwards, it was coated with a pitch-like substance they called kraal. When it eventually set, the kraal formed a resin that was solid as a rock and extremely fire-resistant. The outer hull was stretched out into an aerodynamic taper wing shape that would help keep the wind and heat away from the inner hull. The gap of dead air space would provide an insulation between the two hulls to keep the passengers inside from cooking. A similar design would cover the gas bag as well as except that this would be continuous but rather a series of interlocking plates. When deflated, the plates would come together and form a protective barrier. When the gas bag was fully inflated, however, the plates would separate slightly and allow for expansion. Not that comforting when you realize that it left gas bags that they used for the sphere as hydrogen. We would be quite literally speeding through the atmosphere with a few hundred feet of flammable gas heating up above us. Fortunately, the time we left the atmosphere should help cool it. Or so I hoped. The inner hull was where the ship's actual strength came from. If the outside was shaped like a kayak, the inside was shaped like a dinghy. Ironwood ribs formed the basic shape, each was locked into place with a series of brackets, silk webbing, and hammered pegs. By the time it was done, each joint was stronger than if it had been nailed. Glue was then slathered in place and hardened it to keep it stable. After the layer of lighter wood was placed over the ribs and then covered in plaster. Before it was complete, Hull shot the inner hull with a pistol. The wooden bullet was bounced back off without so much as scratching the surface. The ship was going to be sleek. It was going to be strong. It was also going to be extremely heavy. The more I thought about this weight, the more it concerned me. Wilson's shuttle was damaged, and the craft was going to weigh all well in excess of the original weight of a shuttle would originally have been. I decided one night to voice, okay, hand, my concern to her. I approached the construction site well after the lattice closed. It had been two full pauses since we had begun work and the final ship was now starting to become a reality rather than just a doodle on a piece of parchment. 
It was two levels tall, engines with a shuttle took on the lower deck. The upper deck was for living quarters and a control room. Cargo would be stored just behind the living quarters in the upper reaches. Already I could see the bone white two story dinghy shape with its bat wing struts to hold the outer hull eventually. I walked up into the door that led inside. Jack stood silently by the door. She nodded at me, passing, but never took her eyes off the shadow surrounding us. I pushed past her and stepped inside. The shuttle door was open and spilled brilliant light around the interior of the ship. I had become so accustomed to the firelight over the past few weeks that a sight of an artificial light was nearly blinding. Wilson saw me approaching and waved her arms at me. Hello, she said. The professor had spent several evenings drilling this new sign language into our thick skulls. I was about to see if our hard work had paid off. Hello, I replied. I am here, worried, heavy ship. She did not dance, and from what I could see through her hazmat ship, her lips did not flap. All was calm. Wait fine, she replied. Ship, push, big, need gas, fine. She thought of the weight wouldn't be an issue. Scared? I asked her. No, she replied. Thought about it. Friend need? I asked. Damn it! Was there a word for lonely? She swayed on her side to side. It was the first time I'd ever seen this particular bit of body language. Amusement, I realized. It was an alien smile. No, she answered. Want go? See big world. I signed agreement. Jason, Jack shouted and poked her head inside. She looked at both scared and excited. You need to come quick. What's wrong? I asked. A small ruddy is back, she said. We need to get out there right now. What? Reynolds and Rhymer need me for something. Yes, she said, to help with the bucket brigade. The small ruddy is on fire. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode. And I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.